the race winner with Project Valorous and Emil Vingbo finishing in 32nd. West Compton from Racing CLZ and Moran has finished in the top 35 with Blue Rose Racing Team just getting ahead of Impulse and SOP Esports Racing at the end there. A German Sim Racing finished in 39th but a Crema Racing Esports who did hang on to 40th place. That was ahead of SMP Racing Esports, and now we get to the cars one lap down. Uh, United Sim Team, XPD R Racing, Pono Racing, Dirtled Automotive, ATR Racing Esports, and scre Screen to Speed all finished one lap down. STR Esports were two, and then those who didn't finish. Obsidian Racing and Brabham Esports were in the pit lane for quite some time in that one, as were WSR Esports, Book Kicker, Dub. W2E Pro GP, the other grid and go car, and Race Clutch, all of whom finished many laps down. Well, what a 35 laps that was. 45 minutes of racing in race 8 of VCO Infinity. And eventually we got our action towards the end. Sven Hasso was the undisputed winner of that one, really. It wasn't down to racecraft, really, or anything like that. It was pure speed. Yeah, and I mean, even Steinbraten was the first driver that we've had so far in this particular Infinity event to take pole and the fastest lap, but he wasn't quite able to take the win, which just shows how well uh, raced Haster did that, picking up the position with the mistake uh, from Steinbraten and bringing it home as well. Didn't really look at risk uh, or in the final 20 laps or 20 minutes or so. So full credit to him and, and well done on their first win because it's great for the team certainly is. Uh, we'll be moving over now to part two of our YouTube stream. So if you are watching us there, then make sure you are uh, ready to switch over because uh, it may do it anyway. But if not, then uh, just do it yourself and uh, join us in part two. Another eight races coming up in that one as we work our way towards the end of the third edition of VCO Infinity. While that's all going on, we're going to take a quick break. We'll see you on the other side for race nine.
Welcome back to VCO Infinity, where we're one third of the way through. Race 9 is coming your way here on the VCO Esports YouTube channel and wherever else you're watching us here this evening. It's myself, you and O'Leary Tarathaka, taking you through the uh, midnight hours, not even midnight hours, after midnight, uh, after hours indeed, of the VCO Infinity event. The third time we have run this uh, great idea that we've uh, come up with in 2022. It's time, Dara, to go back to Daytona and go Xfinity racing, but not maybe in the way you would expect it. Yeah, I mean, a little bit different to what you'd normally have at Daytona with these Xfinity cars, but I think a lot of teams will be eyeing this race particularly uh, to pick up a few points. Of course, we had the Xfinity race at Monza, and quite a few teams have picked up uh, their best results so far. William T Sports, of course, uh, picking up the win. You've got the likes of uh, Hera Esport, who picked up a, a top five. They haven't been able to replicate that since. Um, Benzo Racing picked up a top ten. Again, they haven't replicated that since. So I think a few teams are going to be looking at this race, eyeing up the opportunities, uh, and even if it isn't exactly what you'd normally have uh, at Daytona in these Xfinity cars, I think a few guys are going to be looking at this to try and pick up some big points. Don't forget that after winning at Monza, Parker White back up with a top five at Daytona in the GT3s, which we've just seen. Of course, we've seen Sven Haase at win and Grid and Go become the fifth different team to win today. That gives us seven new winners in the first eight races. That's only replicated by the first edition of this race uh, or this idea when, of course, everyone was new. This is the new standings, though. Just three points now separate Team Redline and the Apex Racing Team. The other red line are 13 points back with Coanda. 14 back. Once again, Dara, maybe we're seeing a top four emerge, but even the fight for fifth is a pretty interesting one. BS Competition have worked their way back up after not starting at the last Xfinity race or race four of the day. They're now sixth, just 11 points behind Coanda for fifth. Yeah, and I think it just uh, it shows how this point system lends itself uh, generally to just uh, rewarding consistency, of course, with just a point per position, no real winner's bonus uh, at all to speak of. The, the Kawanda Esports team and people, the 91 car, they've only had one podium uh, in the first eight races, but yet they're still up in P3 in the championship uh, and right in that hunt. So it just shows that you don't necessarily need those headline results uh, every single race. As long as you're picking up top tens, you're going to be right in there. That's what we're seeing from the red lines, uh, Apex Racing Team and Kawanda Esports. Uh, and if a couple of the teams further back can pick up some big results, they can try and pick up that consistency as well. Yep, it's uh, very nice looking for us as a neutral in terms of uh, the excitement as we uh, go on with VCO Infinity and head our way through into the uh, middle third, if you like. We're under the lights at Daytona and it's going to be a little bit easier for everyone to see uh, than it was at uh, Road Atlanta or Algarve, let's say, because the lights will be illuminated. I think the favourites, again, are going to be Parker White and Bobby Zelensky uh, here. And once again, they are on the grid for Williams Esports and Kowanda Esports, respectively. But as you're about to see in the grid, it is not those two on the front row. Maybe a little bit of a surprise waiting for you when we see this grid in a few moments' time at a very important moment in the day. Luke McKeon has pulled out all the stops for Apex Racing Team, who will be on pole position ahead of the championship leaders Team Redline in second. Then it's Parker White and Bobby Zelensky with Was Cooking and BS Competition on the third row together. Then already we get back to half a second away. Ricardo Castelledo from seventh is ahead of Fernando and Tony Busquets. Then it's Luca Alpa and Josh Thompson who round out the top ten. Lewis Woods and Hersey Glack just missed out. They're finishing twelfth with Pikes from Beach at uh, Pike from Beach Racing. Timo Toika in thirteenth. Apex Racing Academy and Leo Garibaldi is in fourteenth. But Oscar Mangan for Altus. Then it's Wave Italy Racing Team and Paolo Espes who has won in the past in this series. Telstrad Automotive and Precision share row nine. Bravo Sports and Impulse Racing are on row 10 ahead of Olympus and Drago, who just missed out on a top 20. Project Valorous and Grid and Go all the way down, unfortunately, in 24th after backing up their race win last time. Jonas Banner for Falcon is 1.2 seconds back in 25th ahead of Esteban Rodriguez. Then it's Liam Rudinger and Robin, uh, uh, Robin Noborg. It is Tom Hooper and Stephen McDonald who round out the top 30, followed by CRZ Central and Kramer Racing Esports. Then Mavano Corsa for Sp uh, Samuel. Michaels and Bruce de Carvalho. German Sim Racing a 35th with Massimo Locatello and then it's worst competition racing alongside them. Absolute Motorsport and Screen to Speed are on row 19 with BS Competition way down in 39th. XBD uh, 
racing alongside them. Juan Manuel Gomez is alongside the Blue Rose team in 42nd with uh, SDR Esports and United Sim Team on row 22. The other grid and go car, 45th for Steam Ledger. Uh, and Akos uh, Zentinski is the only other driver to have set a time. Race Clutch, Eclipse Mode at Simsports, Mardness, Altitude, DLRs, SMP, uh, Rincon and SOP. The only teams, or the other teams, I should say, not to have set times in Dart Race 9. So that is your grid. And for whatever reason, uh, a lot of them not able to. It's a short qualifying format, which really puts a, a premium on those who can just get on the circuit and go. And clearly, Luke McKeown is one of those. While he's never won a VCO Infinity race, he got very close at Daytona in the GT Freeze. Maybe it's time for him to go a couple better in the Xfinity car. Yeah, and I think um, th there's a couple of names up there that I think will please some people. I know Lewis McGlade will be pleased to see Cooper Webster up in P2, but Parker White, um, of course, he'll be hoping uh, to pick up uh, a second win in this Xfinity car, just as we saw Gustavo Ariel pick up the first two wins in the uh, Indy car uh, at Daytona and at Phillip Island. So he's going to hope to repeat the feat, but he's going to do it from P3, and there's quite a few cars just in behind that I think are going to have a bit of a look for the lead. Let's see, what are we expecting down here in towards turn number one? Are these guys going to be calm as we saw at Monza or is it going to be a bit more chaos now that they know Monza went quite well? Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, one for these guys just to see um, if they can, you know, replicate a, a result, particularly uh, for the Williams Racing Esports car, uh, team. Uh, but we'll have to see if we can get the launch. And he does launch very early from Luke McKeown as we get race nine of the VCO Infinity for 2024 underway. Already three wide as we look to the outside with the old tyre now in towards turn number one. It will be Luke McKeown who leads the field. Good reaction from Parker White who gets up to second place. At least Cooper Webster hangs on to third ahead of Bobby Zelensky, the NASCAR driver who is up to fourth place. It's uh, Sindre Setsats for what's cooking now in fifth place as well. It's side by side between Ricardo Castro Leda and Yo Tyen as they go into the International Horseshoe for the first time. Do they all make it out the other side? Okay, the answer to that at the front is yes. But in the background, no, there was at least one spinner coming around on the exit of the International Horseshoe. But at the start, Cooper Webster was caught napping uh, off the line and it just allowed uh, a very, very nice launch from Parker White to put himself straight up into P2. But as they run their way now through the second of the two horseshoes, they're still two, three wide at the back of the field, but relatively all right because most of the drivers have got through. And they have out onto the banking for the first time. Who's in the draft? Who is uh, looking good? on the exit of the opening, uh, what would you call it, infield section, I suppose they call it here at Daytona. Out onto the high banks now. We have had some problems uh, further back, as you say, here at Dara, but nobody in the pit lane just yet. Uh, unfortunately, CRZ Simsport have gone around early on here, and uh, maybe a couple of others as well. Team Fordzilla, very possibly, on the infield for the first time. Into the Le Mans chicane, as it's called, or the bus stop, if you like, if you want to be a bit retro. And Luke McKeon will lead the field around. Then it'll be Parker White as we settle in to the race here at Daytona. Is it going to be one of those races where tyre saving is key and there'll be pit stops to deal with as well? You would expect so, given the fact that they all pitted at Monza, but you do never know. And that was one of the strengths of Parker White. He was really able to look after his tyres better than anybody else. Yeah, and he'll be looking to replicate the feet, of course, less harsh acceleration zones uh, here at Daytona than at Monza but still quite a lot of straights where you're going to guzzle up quite a bit of fuel outside line here uh, for Zelensky on Cooper Webster at the International Hall if he can dance his way around the outside here uh, Cooper Webster trying to hold on to the position of course lost the P2 off the line and hoping not to fall even further back early on but Parker White he looks like he's trying to dance around in the wingmans of Luke McKeon uh, early on and it's not going to be the most comfortable experience for a lot of these guys as they almost bump their way through the second of the two horseshoes. Bumping each other uh, through indeed. Livikin was under a bit of pressure indeed on the way in towards the International Horseshoe there, I've got to say. But uh, managed to get away without losing the lead. Parker White now under pressure of his own, but that was very much the case as they came out onto the banking for the first time as well. Clearly he is uh, strong through the bus stop and maybe into turn one as well, as it's a real transition there as you come from the banking in towards turn one. And you'd imagine the NASCAR specialists like Parker White and Bobby Zelensky will have a bit of an advantage, but we said that at Monza and they weren't exactly dominating the field. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that uh, we've got to keep an eye on because um, you never really know exactly how these Infinity races are going to pan out. Of course, there was that question mark uh, all the way through the race about pit stops, particularly uh, towards the end of the race. I know you were disappointed. Um, uh, <laughs> even we weren't able to see uh, <laughs> if the strategy worked out. But it just it remains to be seen, really. It just keeps you on your toes uh, how this is going to pan out. Different ideas probably could work here. Uh, and tire safe and fuel safe, and that could all come in into effect but this early on trying to position yourself properly uh, i know for a fact that if um if parker white doesn't get to the front he might just try to stay in the slipstream of luke mckeon early on maybe just save a bit of fuel that way uh, jordan johnson uh, of apex by the way in the youtube chat at the moment saying that luke pesk uh, <laughs> luke pesk <laughs> so like his second name luke won pesk here a couple of months ago maybe that translates as we see uh, some replays we'll get to that comment in a few moments time if we look at some spins there's augustin bernier of uh, de la Traz automotive who's gone around and spun into the grass this is uh, albert alvarez ah looked like he was fed into the wall there was he or did he break too late on his own not entirely sure but that's how uh, they've ended up so far back this is crz oh who were uh, hit into the wall there and unfortunately a few have clipped them on their way past it was a good start at the front but i'm afraid to say not quite the same at the back one man well gomez was the one who got caught up in it yeah, Team Fulcilla. Oh, and you could just see at the end of that replay, there were cars diving around that car uh, just to make sure that they weren't hitting it uh, as they will enter the banking for the first time. Further back, though, we're looking at some uh, fighting uh, in the field. Pike from Beach Racing, of course, winning the last race here at Daytona. Uh, GT3 cars, obviously, very different to what we've got uh, in these NASCAR Infinity, but they'll, you know, they'll hope to pick up the form uh, and keep it going. But it doesn't seem like we're seeing too many breaks in the field like we saw at Road Atlanta in the GT3s, but that's really to be expected, isn't it? Because, of course, with such a long part of the track being straight, and you can uh, use that slipstream uh, to your advantage, we're seeing people stay relatively close together. Ah, uh, Jens Vanna for Falcon's gone around. Not sure whether he was helped on his way, but he was certainly trying to get the traction down, and it did not work on that occasion. Uh, out over the line again. I'll, I'll get back to Jordan Johnson's comment now. Uh, he is from Apex. He said, Luke won Pesk here a couple of months ago. Uh, well, yes, I, I understand that Daytona might be a good track for him, but uh, surely the Porsche Cup car doesn't translate that well to the Xfinity car. Maybe I'm wrong, but it feels to me as if it's a very different prospect indeed. Oz, that is too deep on the brakes from Wave Italy Racing Team. The 51 car, excuse me, it's Pike from Beach who have gone right. It was side by side with Wave Italy Racing Team. Timo Toika, the one who's gone into the grass, but uh, considering he did get in the grass, he's uh, got away with that quite well. He has got away with it quite well, only losing a couple of positions, really, and just staying um, relatively in front uh, of... I, it's difficult, isn't it, Brody? Because you do lose a few positions, and you maybe lose a bit of uh, of the train, and especially with the car so close, you know, it's, it's not the best situation, and it doesn't necessarily help your confidence. Um, but at the same time, you haven't lost that much in the grand scheme of things. We've seen drivers go straight on... Um, into the barriers on the opening lap so um it's difficult but of course early on 38 minutes to go there's still time for recovery you know the same could happen to cars in front but i think the main issue there is it's not really going to help your confidence going through this race it may well not do as we get into the bus stop chicane decidedly darker in the room of bobby zelensky now who i can still see a little bit of light coming through or maybe it's uh, outside lighting to be fair it's uh, just coming through the uh, shutters they, they're not shutters, are they? Whatever they're called. And uh, he's... I don't really know. But uh, he's <laughs> working his way through in fourth position for the moment. In uh, the slipstream of Cooper Webster down in towards turn number one. Breaks later. Just transitions off the banking a little bit better, really. And that's maybe the difference between a fully-fledged NASCAR driver compared to... The other sim racers who are just adapting to this car a little bit compared to some of the others. There's a couple of different lines are being taken into the International Horseshoe up ahead. Luke McKeon going a bit narrower on the way in. As Oscar Mangan and Josh Thompson battle side by side for 12 position. Oscar Mangan works his way through for Altus there. And the other red line car, I'm afraid, not matching the form of their teammates here in this race. 
Uh, yes, but I think the the good thing for Redline is Cooper Webster is in that number 70 car, which is currently the lead uh, of the two red lines. But there is this fight between Mangan and Glack as they make their way through the second horseshoe. No. And, uh, Josh Thompson is going to gain the positions because the cars came together. Uh, the Williams Ac uh, Esports Academy team there, uh, one of the two cars involved. And once you get connected in, in that way with the two cars, you just have both the passenger into the grass. And they've uh, caught each other off there, I'm afraid, and they lose uh, quite hefty positions as a result. And out onto the banking again, nearly 10 minutes into this race, at least they are still going. That's more than can be said for a few further back. Eclipse Sim Sports and Mavano Corsa look to already be out of this race. German Sim Racing and Maniti Racing are joining those in the pit lane. That's a further six who have been in pit lane already so far this race. And expecting and maybe seeing uh, some pit stops a little bit later on here, by the way, in this ninth race of the day. We certainly did back at Monza when we first used the Xfinity cars in VCO Infinity history down in towards turn one again for Luke McKeown, who leads Edda Parker White, then Cooper Webster, then Bobby Zelensky. The front four very much running together strictly in a line no side by side between them instead it's the teammates of Zelensky uh, and uh, it's Ricardo Castro Ledo who's the one dropping down the order he's back to 10th yeah, and one of the teams that benefited there in the end was uh, the, the Team PGZ, who picked up their best result in the other uh, NASCAR race so far. A little bit wide um, from, I think that was the Team Redline car further back. It looked uh, a little bit off uh, with the angle. But no, it was Shera Esport uh, making their way past the city. I mentioned Shera earlier on and that they were enjoying the NASCARs uh, at, in, um, at uh, Monza, not Imola, uh, at Monza, and they're enjoying them again. But Obsidian going side by side through the second horseshoe all the while. They're losing that gap to PGZ, who were hoping to pick up their best result of the evening so far around the outside goes obsidian can they make this one work no it, it is the short answer and they might come under a bit of pressure from kawanda again yeah they might well do because when you're on the outside like that your run is a bit ruined out there what happened to ledo well that was a very different line and speed taken to at the bs competition car which still runs sixth not really sure he can blame anyone but himself for that one i'm afraid and he drops back to a, a real lively group, actually, from eighth place on back, as we were just watching a few moments ago. Certainly more lively than these guys, as they uh, continue to not fight, although Parker White is probably the closest he's been for a little while here. And we saw this in, in Monza as well. He just uh, hung back for the first 10 minutes or so, and then really unleashed. Of course, he was unleashing from the lead last time, which made his job a bit easier. And in the end, he just drove away from the rest of the field. However... He's going to have to do some overtaking uh, if he wants to unleash some of his speed in this race. Yeah, I mean, Luke, uh, Luke McEwen just seems to be at the lead of this train, but they don't really seem too keen to make moves at the moment. Maybe Parker White is happy just to sit in and wait um, and pick up some of that slipstream, save a bit of fuel and just see how it goes further on, maybe confident in his pace um, and basically just seeing how this one unfolds. Still a long, long way to go. We're not even a third of the way through this race here uh, for race 9 of 24. As Lewis McGlady would say, we're nearly 924ths through this event as we uh, as there's lots of battling through the field. But I do think for some of these guys, particularly Parker White, it's a bit of a waiting game for the time being. That is uh, Dominic Hoffman getting passed by uh, Paolo Espes uh, there in the uh, top 10, uh, top 15 even. Uh, Paolo Espes down in 13th place for the Wave Italy racing team. He won... In VCO Infinity 1, by the way, did Paolo Espes for uh, Obsidian. So he is one of those drivers able to win for two teams if he can do so today. This is all met very messy as they came onto the banking uh, quite a while ago. The car you're following there is the German sim racing car that was down pit lane. I mentioned earlier on that's for Simo Locatello driving that one for the moment. Uh, a real mess as they made their way onto the banking. Yeah, it wasn't the prettiest of sights, was it, as uh, cars all over the road. But in the end, everyone uh, either getting to the pit lane or, uh, well, or not really taking any for the part of a couple of drivers. You could just see uh, on the bottom left there, out of this race. And they do include um, Eclipse, Simsports and Mavano Core. So they've not had the best of races early on. But at least, you know, uh, you've got a bit of time to talk as a team. Maybe um, talk about how you're going to approach the upcoming races with 32 minutes of this race still to go. But still moves being moved through the field and PGZ. Uh, 
good. They're still going well, fighting away with uh, with Jarl Tyne. Yep, uh, although Tyne's back through again into sixth place. I wonder whether it was one of those ones where uh, you dive down the inside at turn one and immediately get done on the cutback. We'll wait and see. As uh, down the outside goes Dominic Hoffman trying to pass Ricardo Castroledo, who after that slight half spin has only been heading backwards. I wonder whether the tyres are really holding him back. We're seeing around 1.2 seconds of drop off after 15 minutes here. That's notably less than at Monza. And as you commented earlier, Dar, it's less traction zones around it although not by, by very many it is and i wonder whether that is playing into a role here and will it have a role in the amount of pit stops and whether we'll see a stop at all yeah it, it's possible but i think as well you've got to remember that um the, the tires do take quite a bit of wear around quite a lot of the long corners at uh, this track maybe the rear is not as much taking the hit but you think around turn one getting onto the banking um and going through the le mans chicane it's difficult for these cars uh, or for the tires really to stick underneath that monza we saw uh, acceleration zones you, you look at turn two you look at turn five where um they're quite heavy in terms of how much power you're putting onto the car you've got less of those long corners like we saw at parabolica so i think in a way daytona there are those different challenges for those tires and for the fuel because um we are seeing a lot more slip streaming a lot more drafting and a lot more kind of just waiting and seeing what's going to happen uh, than we did at Monza but for the time being uh, the Apex Racing team leading the way with Luke McEwen but it does just seem that Parker White is taking that strategy of kind of waiting and saving yeah I think he is because he was close enough in my mind to have a go into turn one there especially with how late he can be on the brakes if he wants to be looks up the inside again just showing the nose more than having an attempt to move here as I'll just get down the inside of Brabham here for 15th. That's Oscar Mangan on David Toff back in the pack. And the Altus car goes through in that uh, group from sixth place on backwards. We were watching a little bit earlier on. Again, it's a front five who are working their way clear again. Parker White added his name to the list of winners in VCO Infinity history a few races ago, of course, looking to uh, do the double and win again for Williams Esports, but none of the others in this front group have won before. Uh, McEwen, uh, Webster or Zelensky all waiting for their chances to win. There is uh, McEwen in the Apex Racing facility, which I've now visited as of about last week, in the middle of, uh, well, the UK, really. Middle of nowhere, I was going to say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not quite in the middle of nowhere. It's in Corby, as we all know. And it's... Uh, bit darker than I remember, but there you are. It's just because uh, Nick is facing the wrong way, uh, I suppose, in his sim rig, right in the corner of their uh, setup with the uh, five main or, or most regular drivers for Apex. I believe he's the only one racing from Corby today, although I'll put a question mark next to that one. He may not be uh, here tonight. Just past quarter past two, where he is in the UK. As he works his way up towards the line. Just under 29 minutes to go, and it's... Uh, Holding pattern again here for the second race in a row. Yeah, I mean, to your defence, Corby Northampton Shire is kind of one of those areas where you don't really know where to describe it as. It's not East Anglia. It's kind of the East Midlands, but it's not the North. It's not. The, it's just in the middle. You're right in the way it's, it is really in the middle of nowhere uh, in, in terms of the UK. But uh, he looks relatively calm. Parker White on the bottom right did look incredibly um, just, just collected. He almost looked bored there, just kind of waiting around, seeing what was going on, but clearly in control uh, and knowing exactly what the plan was. Um, for his race as we near half distance here but they make their way through you can definitely sense that parker white feels like he's got the pace but he just doesn't want to use it yet and maybe give an advantage to luke McE uh, McEwen at this stage uh, of the evening keeper webster dropping back that a little bit more and bobby zelensky uh, trying to attach himself there but yeah, I mean, at the front, we're just kind of waiting uh, just to see if it kicks off. Hopefully, we'll see the kind of moves that we saw uh, at Road Atlanta last time out. But um, uh, even if we're short of moves here in this race, we're definitely not going to be short of moves when we make our way back to Road Atlanta for those Super Formula lights. Yeah, we'll be uh, back again over in America f very shortly. Uh, I don't like to use the word or phrase middle of nowhere, by the way, because it's used very interchangeably, I find, with the East Midlands which is uh, where I'm from. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to uh, indulge in that. As Parker White gets very close indeed uh, to the driver situated in that uh, in that region. Parker White 
at looking for a way through as the Apex Racing Team try and close the gap to Redline. Just one point is the margin. There it is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, meanwhile, uh, McEwen's going to be looking behind him as Cooper Webster comes in early. Now, this is interesting. Four and a half minutes to halfway, but Cooper Webster decides he wants a bit of an undercut, so he's in already. Yeah, this this is interesting now. So does um, does he come out in front? What is the how's this going to play out effectively? Is he trying to think that maybe he can get to the end with um, with fuel where his tyres starting to die? We're not too sure um, generally what the plan for the pit stop is, and I think that's kind of why these races in the NASCAR are quite enjoyable because there's any number of reasons that you could stop early, you could stop late, uh, but we will wait and see. He will come out um, in a relatively relatively empty part of the uh, of the racetrack not too much traffic uh, to get in the way that being said uh, might come out just behind uh, a couple of these cars got to be careful actually might come out side by side and indeed um, i think just about will so um it, it's an interesting um moment i think in this race because if Coop to Webster can try and pull off an undercut uh, will that lead to a knock-on effect or will it not really bother the others at the front side by side back in this group and it's uh just wonderful battling from seventh place uh, on backwards. Two of the top four in the championship are involved here, by the way. Excuse me, one of the top four. It's the other red line car, although that's up to eighth place now. Far clear of these guys. This is the Otis Brabham battle. It's Mangan versus Toth again, with Grid and Go recovering really well after a slightly below par qualifying for Cody Deef. He is back on it again now, side by side into the bus stop chicane as Toff tries to get past Mangan. He's not going to be able to do that. He's niggling, going to be run over there by Cody Defu, go through to 15th. Yeah, and he's just improving all the time, isn't it? That number one car, but Bravo Esports not having the best of uh, of time into the last couple of races. Here's the lead, though. Still no move. Uh, and Whoa. we still wait as Luke McEwen goes, but he's deep, and that is the change for the lead now. Well, Parker White has entirely got into the head of Luke McEwen there, and that was easy in the end. They're not moved clearly by Cooper Webster's early stop, but McEwen certainly was by looking in his mirrors there. Yeah, I mean, it was a difficult uh, moment, I think, because McEwen was really just trying to maybe defend the inside line there or just trying to place his car where Parker White couldn't get but in the end was driving too much on the mirrors uh, and allowed the Williams Esports driver to get through and look at that gap already a second a full second that has been pulled by Parker White which just shows that he has got the pace uh, in this race and he was waiting and it may just be a matter of time for others to come through here you go Coander Esports uh, down the inside Ricardo Castro Ledo trying to find his way past Paolo Espes and he'll be on the outside I'm afraid for the very next corner which is not going to be ideal really as they work their way onto the banking. Oscar Mangan working his way maybe to the inside for three wide. That would be quite brave. Instead, it would just follow the prevailing driver. And I think that is always going to be the one on the inside line when you're doing the road course. You're never really at quite the speed or packed up enough to make the outside work at Daytona as they do when they run the oval. Well, Mangan's going to work his way alongside Ricardo Castroledo as a result. Uh, will he work his way all the way through with the two orange cars? It will be yes. Uh, he will work his way through. And Ricardo Castroledo will be back to 13th again as we now approach halfway. Who of the front drivers are going to blink? I would imagine Luke McKeown will be in here. Uh, no, he's not, but Bobby Zelensky is, and the top two will continue on for one more lap. Yeah, maybe a little bit longer as well. We are starting to see quite a few drivers, but there's three that we can see uh, on pit road now. But as Bobby Zelensky uh, gets into his grid box, gets onto his marks, has a couple of seconds where he can just relax. You can see the bit of the slouch uh, whilst waiting in that pit box. But once you're back out into the racetrack, it's going to be uh, mode go, really, because where do they come out in relation um, to the uh, Cooper Webster, which put in a couple of laps earlier? Let's see uh, as they make their way out of the pit lane. Uh, Zelensky on his way out and the, and the thing oh there's Webster wow that is a big game for Cooper Webster and he might even be in the lead of the race very shortly Parker White is going quicker than Luke McEwen here he was really starting to fall apart on that lap he lost a second and a half to the Williams Esports driver however White is still 1.7 seconds off of his best Cooper Webster right now is in the uh, high 45s that was his best lap of the race so far and 1.8 seconds quicker than Parker White I think Team Redline are going to be leading at the end 
end of this pit stop cycle. They likely will, but the problem for Cooper Webster is the race likely to come back to those guys that pit later because uh, Cooper Webster may start to struggle a little bit at the end of this race. Um, just depending on how the tyres end up suiting, of course, fresher rubber uh, will be going on to, you'd expect, the Williams Esports and... Um, the Apex Racing Team cars, but will it be enough? I mean, you'd expect them to have the pace, but Coop Web uh, Webster, such a big undercut. Uh, is it going to be enough? But I think Parker White finally coming into the pit lane. Do you get it slowed up in time? You would have thought so. Doesn't seem too panicked about that at all. McEwen will follow. And uh, we've got a number of other drivers, 11 still ahead of Cooper Webster here, who have yet to stop down the pit boxes they go. In fact, is that even true? Uh, yes, it is, actually. The uh, Impulse Racing cars and all those above have even uh, stayed out so far as well. A few more will continue on. In fact, quite a few more. But uh, the key thing here is Cooper Webster getting ahead of Parker White and Luke McEwen. And you, you imagine he will be able to do that. There goes Parker White, but there goes Cooper Webster already. That is the margin. That's what he's got to hang on to in the remaining 21 minutes. Yeah, it's a massive advantage for him at this stage of the race. And Parker White will have to pull out all the subs. You can just about see that speck Zelensky. of blue in the background emerging out of the pit lane. But yeah, you're right. Zelensky uh, ha has got his way through as well. So lots of work now for Cooper Webs uh, for Cooper Webster to do defending-wise, but also of uh, Parker White to do attacking. Now, is anybody going to go to the end from up here? Well, we didn't see it. Uh, in the first race, Yana Kok really ruined my dreams with that, I've got to say. But now it's a different circuit, different prospects. As Derek Toff's off the road, mm. that's a bit of a questionable rejoin. And uh, the two behind would probably have flashed their lights if they had any. Fortunately, they don't. And David Toff will get away without that. But not sure how he ended up off in the grass there. He was part of that huge group who were fighting in the lower end of the top 10 and the just outside of those positions as well. In the first part of the race, it's all seemingly spread apart now, though, in that region of the order. Uh, sort of still during this pit stop cycle, to be fair. We're still waiting for six uh, teams to come in. Yeah, Brother Meatsports really not having the cleanest couple of races. Of course, there was contact um, at Road Adla Atlanta last time out, and there's a little bit more contact, or maybe even soft contact, just a couple of errors here. Uh, on to Pit Road, we will see, I think, the rest of the cars probably come. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, no one staying out, and that's the WSR Esports butt kicker team. They'll go one more, but they will be the only one to go one more. Uh, will Rocket Simsport uh, come in? They will indeed. So it is the... Uh, to be a sorry sports book kicker car staying out that little bit longer. Esteban Rodriguez, who lost at 1.9 seconds to Cooper Webster on that last lap, although Webster is already seven tenths off his best lap here as we go side by side in towards turn number one. Oscar Mangan looking to make it free wide into turn one here. It's a big move down the inside from him, and he'll make up a lot of places in the uh, pit stop lane as well, although that's why he's made up so many. He's broken far, far too late. Yeah, that, it, it, that's not the track. That's not where you're meant to go. I think it's kind of cut off quite a lot of the infield, but that you're not really allowed to do that. So uh, losing quite a few positions there. Oh. On that one inside line for Ledo, trying to make that move. And in behind there, we're very deep uh, on the brakes into the International Horseshoe. Two wide as they will emerge three wide. So some fantastic fighting as we emerge from this pit stop phase. But Ledo not going to give this one up around the outside through the dog leg. Is he going to have to submit? I think he is, but still fighting it out. Yeah, I think that was Jersey Glack, who was the one in the background, by the way, at the International Horseshoe, who was uh, so uh, aggressively down the inside. But Ricardo Castroledo does indeed find his way through. And they'll all finally get single file as they work their way onto the banking again. But uh, what racing we're seeing here in the midfield, shame somewhat is not replicated by those who are fighting for the lead, although that may well change very shortly. But this is uh, fantastic stuff. And not everybody in here has... Pitted. We've got the SMP Racing Esports car of Vasilev Galtsev just up in front of these guys. He is uh, literally in front of uh, Ricardo Castroledo here. Uh, and we really slow them all down into the bus stop now. Yeah, 
it's almost like a snail's pace for some of these guys. It'll feel like as they make their way through the bus stop. The 888 of Gultsev now uh, is going to come under a lot of pressure. Espan Rodriguez finally pits from the lead. But yeah, look at this. One, two, three coming through on the banking. Uh, and Gultsev just dropping down the order. But Faledo now, um, he, he waited to make that move, but he can't really wait to push on now because he's got a lot of time to gain if he wants to get up towards the likes of Antoli. But he's also going to have to be looking in his mirrors with the draft. Down in towards turn one for the uh, Drager racing car of Dominic Hoffman again. And Liam Brunninger is going to have to settle for 14th place as they make their way through the S's again with 17 minutes to go. Meanwhile, the leaders have got just one second separating the top three. Cooper Webster's early pit stop ploy is now coming back to bite him as he knew that it would. And the fast times are beginning to come in. Not only from Bobby Zelensky, who did a 45-9 on that last lap, but Cooper, uh, excuse me, uh, but Parker White, who did a 45-1 on that last lap. 1.8 seconds quicker than the leader. Yeah, they're all kind of uh, constantinering up together in that regard. Uh, you can just see, I mean, the gap was six tenths between the top two and then a further six tenths back to the William Esports car. And again, it's now four tenths and four tenths. Um, so they're closing at a similar rate um, is um, Kowalewski, um, uh, sorry, Zelensky and Park White at this stage of the evening. But uh, it's just going to be a case of how do they get through? I think Cooper White's lost a little bit of time as we're watching some finding on the banking. But Cooper White may be making a mistake somewhere because he's dropped back another second. Uh, he has. We'll pick that up in a few moments' time as we go into the uh, chicane with these guys just outside the top 15, right where Oscar Mangan is in the battle for... Uh, well, it's 17th place pretty much, just on backwards, but it's all one line, we can call it, from pretty much 12th. Side by side a bit further back with the SP car that still hasn't come in. David Toth going to be the latest one to try and work his way through for Brabham. And he will do on the inside line here. There he goes, down through into turn one. Project Valorous, AG Stravato. Uh, AJ Stravato, excuse me, trying to work his way through as we're side by side for sixth place as well. I think PGZ just got past uh, Sundre Setsas, but well, your time is going to do the same now in the red BS competition car. And so that's uh, two moves and what's cooking racing adventures are down to seventh. They are down to seventh, but it is still a good result um, for that 969 car uh, at this stage of the race. I mean, they've, they've been struggling um, somewhat in terms of picking up points. They've not had a top 10 so far this evening. So still on for a very good result for the team. Same uh, can be said for PGZ. Same can be said for uh, Shara Esports. So a few of the teams that we haven't really been seeing um, near the front so far in this race doing well, oh, sorry, in this event, doing Doing well in the NASCAR races um, and you know if you can pick up some extra points there and even if you lose a couple here and there in the other races if you're looking for the NASCAR races knowing that you could pick up some extra points it gives you that little bit of a boost of confidence um, even for the other drivers in the team but even a good recovery from Brudingo Esports having said that uh, getting overtaken by Obsidian there um, uh, and actually, I think having an issue, um, and I cannot believe I've said that at the perfect time. Uh, here we go with the lead as well. Cooper Webster's under pressure from uh, Bobby Zelensky in towards turn number one. As here we go, inside for Webster, defends very well. Uh, Bobby Zelensky gets to the inside, but no, blocked by Cooper Webster. Great driving. And now we've got the front four covered by a second and a half. Parker White right here as well just behind Bobby Zelensky for the final quarter of an hour of this race we may well have a leading fight on our hands yeah all four of these guys really in the hunt I mean Luke McCune maybe just have the pace of Parker White but still has the tires uh, of Parker White same age um, of course Bobby Zelensky a lap before Cooper Webster a lap before that if not two um, as we're going to see a replay of what exactly oh, no. did happen and there's the tap in towards the uh, in towards the Le Mans chicane and that is not the that's it's not the way you want to end your evening, really. No, it's uh, Cody Deef recovering from that qualifying that he was uh, recovering well from, actually. But not, I'm afraid, a good moment into the bus stop she came uh, for him. Meanwhile, Bobby Zelensky will be on the defensive from Parker White here. Will this give the margin to Cooper Webster just to get away here in the race lead? 
This is the issue. I mean, let, let's see if Parker Wake. Oh, I thought he was going to try the move around the outside down into the Le Mans chicane, but thinks better of it. All the while, Lip McEwen is gain, gaining uh, ever uh, closer to these guys. And he, you could just see there, allowed to get quite a nice run through that chicane. Maybe it might give him a bit of impetus to try and uh, catch the three down into turn one, but looks a little bit too far back for that this time around. But Cooper Webster, he has got a monumental task on his hands if he's to keep these two drivers behind him. And we may see the move as early as turn one as the slipstream continues to take effect. It's like a tow rope. You're just gaining, gaining, gaining. But look at Parker White as well. Here he goes. Parker White looking to put off Bobby Zelensky this time. It worked with Luke McEwen earlier on. He's looking to do it to the e NASCAR driver, and he does. Sweep through on the inside. And Williams Esports are into second position, picking up valuable points in BCO Infinity. Parker White leading that charge, looking for his second race win of the evening. And Bobby Zelensky will be uh, feeling a little bit dumbfounded as to how he's been tricked there uh, by Parker White. Luke McEwen will be looking for the position too. Now, Cooper Webster has got an even bigger mountain to climb, or if you can say, bigger mountain to defend from if you like, because Parker White is right behind him now. And it was an absolutely gorgeous move, wasn't it, uh, from Parker White to make it to the inside line. Just about had enough room uh, and got on the power early enough to pick up the position, uh, but did put off... Um, the Kawanda Esports driver, I mean, if he can make it three from three in his group of four, uh, then he wouldn't be too disappointed. But he's got to make sure uh, that if he is to get through on Cooper Webster, he doesn't lose too much time and doesn't make a mistake. They've made that gap now back out to Kawanda Esports and to Apex Racing in behind. Eight tenths is that gap. You don't really want to throw it away, but I think... Um, I think very much that uh, Parker White is going to be eyeing up turn one to make this move stick on Cooper Webster. Oh, McEwen had a go there on Zelensky, and they've pretty much stared each other into the abyss now. It's going to be about these two. I think Parker White so close already to Cooper Webster. If the red line driver can hang on here, it would be a defence for the centuries. Here goes Parker White to the outside through NASCAR turn four. He's almost too close. He hasn't quite got that slingshot maybe that he needs in towards turn one proper. They get into the try over it's a, a tie at the line almost as McEwen goes through on Zelensky who goes down to the apron Parker White goes very wide into turn one looking for the switchback Cooper Webster knew it was coming he blocks him off entirely what about into the international horseshoe as Webster just squirms under the 650 horsepower of these cars now Parker White goes to the outside line Webster's gonna box him out to the outside and hang on again this really has been some defensive masterclass driving here from Cooper Webster uh, uh, the last few laps here because everything really has been thrown now by um, by the Williams Esports driver for Parker White. He is trying everything, going left, going right, trying that wide line to get the run into the International Horseshoe. And look at that, maybe getting checked up as well through the second horseshoe. And Luke McEwen is right on the back of this as well. I mean, if there is any mistake from Parker White, Luke's going to take advantage of that. Uh, there was a mistake from uh, Luke, I'm afraid. McEwen just going wide there at the uh, corner onto the banking. And I'm afraid he's going to have to uh, work on that again before he uh, uh, tries to make any kind of move on Parker White, I'm afraid. But this is uh, turning into a VCO Infinity race for the ages. Race 9 of the 2024 edition turning into a classic right now. Cooper Webster hanging on on older tyres here for Team Redline in an unfamiliar car just ahead of an e-NASCAR driver who will surely be used to uh, this style of racing a little bit more. He'll know all the tips and tricks to try and get past Webster. He's on newer tyres as well, of course. And all of a sudden, he's starting to struggle to make this move work. Over the line again, it's another five laps for Cooper Webster to hang on. A mountain for him to climb, even still, at this late stage in the race. He'll stay to the inside again here. He'll block Parker White. What about into the International Horseshoe? This is where it all kicked off last time. White's got a good exit. He's not quite alongside this time, but Webster doesn't need that. He'll defend anyhow into the International Horseshoe, but he'll keep his lead again. Yeah, and I think Parker White's going to be ever... Uh, ever more frustrated with what he's seeing in front of him, trying to pick a line, but not really succeeding in making the move stick. Of course, 
he does seem to have the pace. He does seem to clearly uh, have the car underneath him to pull away if he can make the move. But Cooper Webster really parking it in all the places that he needs to to ensure that, you know, uh, Parker White doesn't have that opportunity to make, uh, make his way up onto what would be the top step of the podium. Luke McEwen, who despite that mistake at this point of the lap last time around, is back into this hunt for the top three. And Cooper Webster, I mean, if he can hang on to the end, this would be an incredible drive for the Team Redline driver. Of course, Cooper Webster uh, driving over on the other side of the world compared to us, and so it is at the right time of day uh, for once. Can't imagine that's been the case very much during the uh, Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup uh, season. There he is. You can see the light uh, on his face cam there as he wrestles this machine through the bus stop chicane. It's Cooper Webster followed by Parker White and Luke McEwen looking for a VCO Infinity race win. Parker White looking for a second to add to uh, the one he gained only five hours ago. Followed by a top five at this venue. Looks like he's going to repeat that in the Xfinity car, but in what position is he going to be? More weaving around from Webster here as White stays high. He'll be looking for the inside at turn two. Will he or will it be the outside? He's not tried this before. He breaks later. Cooper Webster's been good at defending the inside off of turn one, but what about the outside? He's equally as up to the challenge. What a drive so far from Cooper Webster. And now he's even forced Parker White to go on the defensive from Luke McEwen looking for second. Yeah, I mean, at, at this stage of the race, Parker White is trying absolutely everything he can, and time is really running out. I mean, uh, he was very, very calm in the opening stages, through the opening stint, knowing that he probably had the pace on McEwen. But now, you know, that race win isn't as easy as it looked like it was going to be, because Cooper Webster is defending like an absolute tank at the moment. He is parking it in all the right places, uh, and it's not really possible for Parker White to find a way through, pick his way through just yet. And with only six minutes to go, you're really looking at only a few more laps, particularly down at turn one. You can just see the pace that Parker White has got. He just can't find the way through at the moment, and that's going to start to frustrate him, I'm sure. Yeah, three laps to go, as you say, when we get to the line in a few moments' time. For now, we're at the other point in the circuit through NASCAR turn one and two. Bobby Zelensky, not a feature in this race now, I'm afraid. He pitted one lap earlier than the other two. He gained a bit out of, out of that and was second briefly, but... Has dropped to fourth in the group, and it looks like that's where the Commander Esports driver is going to finish. Another uh, Xfinity stock car race without a win now for Bobby Zelensky in BCO Infinity this year. Looks like the uh, non-specialist drivers have really taken it to the uh, ENAS car drivers, and that's great to see, and especially from the big teams. Redline and Apex right up there fighting for an Infinity title by the looks of things at the moment. Can Apex get ahead and just reduce that margin or will Redline extend it as Cooper Webster tries to hang on here? He's looking for the outside line. Oh, White right there tried to fool him almost by looking like he was going for the outside, then ducked to the inside. He couldn't do that either. And we could see Cooper Webster break a little bit more when he realised that it was possible for Barker White to maybe try and get to the inside line just to make sure that he covered it off so that there was no hope um, of the Williams driver trying to find his way up the inside. He is, um, he is at, he's a roadblock at the moment, Cooper Webster. There is nothing that Parker White can do to get his car through. All the while, Luke McEwen's going to be thinking, come on, mate, let's get, let's get this position. Let's try and get a 1-2, at least I, I know they're different teams, but on the same strategy, they're really going to be feeling the same things in it or similar things in their cars uh, and we'll both know that they're quicker than the team redline car in front and particularly for the apex racing team um they will want to see redline lose as many points as possible uh, and will be getting a little bit frustrated i'm sure that uh, uh, the fact that cooper webster despite being on what people may have thought was the wrong strategy no one else pitted at the same time as him seems to be working out the best I wonder what this does for the other races that we've got coming up in the Xfinity car here. We're at Phillip Island for race 14 a bit later on. We'll be at the Algarve for race 18 and race 22 will be at Road Atlanta. We're using all five locations in this car. So what does that do in terms of when you make your pit stop in those other races that we're going to see in this uh, NASCAR Xfinity Cup car? Uh, not Cup car, NASCAR Xfinity Series car, I should say, not to confuse the two. Into towards turn one they go again. 
three and a half minutes remaining means that there'll be two laps when they go over the line here. Cooper Webster weaves around again, almost showing Parker White the inside. Bit of a dangerous thought, that one, because he might well take it if you're not careful. Cooper Webster does instead. It's going to be White on the outside. Webster will make sure that he stays there, and he does so well to defend. Luke McEwen just goes on through, says thank you very much. I'll take second place and give this one a go as we try and unseat Cooper Webster from the lead. And I think there's only going to be two more laps to go here because I, I think it might be relatively close on the line, but I don't know if they're going to be able to get uh, another uh, lap and a half done, really, before we hit zero as we see more side by side fighting uh, as Ledo picks up another position for P14. But Luke McEwen now, the impetus is on him to try and make this move. He's not got long to try it, but he's got to do something because he's not got long uh, to try and make a move and make it stick. Maybe down at turn one can maybe try something that Parker White hasn't tried. But Cooper Webster, what? defense from him so far. Parker White's going to be so frustrated looking at a possible win. Now staring at a P3. This is quite astonishing. One of the best VCO Infinity races we've seen for quite some time. Maybe this edition, maybe ever. A wonderful defence from Cooper Webster, who's trying to hang on to a famous win. Oscar Mangan, meanwhile, in the bottom right-hand side of your screen, just gets past Ricardo Castro Ledo. That's the 14th place. I'll just move up again. Now, what is the exit of the bus stop chicane going to be like for Luke McEwen here? He's got a better run through the first part, but it's the runoff we're interested in, and it's not bad. He'll be there by turn one. Yeah, I mean, he gained a, a few thousands uh, just on the exit, and he will continue to gain uh, as that tow rope just shortens uh, on the run all the way down towards turn one. He's going to be gaining, gaining, gaining. We've got to be careful of Parker White in behind. He's got to be aware of the Williams Esports driver as they run their way down towards turn one, taking a very harsh inside line. Barney waves the white flag, but there's no move to be made for Luke McEwen at turn one. And that is the best opportunity on the circuit, arguably. Can he just wait for this final bus stop chicane to maybe get the run to the line? It's not quite the same in this car as it is in the others. And Luke McEwen knows that. He's looking for a move at the International Horseshoe. It's not going to work out here either. It's about getting the drive off here now. And maybe a run towards the West Horseshoe. He's just under three temps back. There he is in the middle of those three. Uh, you can see it's Parker White on the very right-hand side. Cooper Webster on the left. McEwen gets it slightly wrong. Now he's on the defensive from White. Does this allow Cooper Webster? to win here. I'll have to see because I, I don't think that Luke McEwen's got enough really to try and reclaim this time that he's lost uh, to Cooper Webster. Half a second now that gap out to the lead and Cooper Webster really just this acceleration zone. Just got to make sure he doesn't make a big mistake in that bus stop chicane uh, or Le Mans chicane, whatever floats your boat. Uh, and he has got this race win sewn up. Parker White, he's now going to be fighting with Luke McEwen as really the lead's gone. It's absolutely astonishing. Cooper Webster might well have just taken this as Parker White knows it. He's going for the second position and very nearly takes Luke McEwen off in the process. Mouth wide as he concentrates into the bus stop chicane for the final time. Cooper Webster trying to do the same as well. Surely they're not going to push each other to a victory. Cooper Webster knows it already. He's already celebrating as he works his way through NASCAR 3 and 4. He'll really be hoping that uh, he, he wins from this point on. And breathes a sigh of relief now as well. The gap four points if things stay as they are McEwen not happy because Cooper Webster is going to be a VCO Infinity race winner and what a drive from him Team Redline will be thanking him for that because it's a wonder strategy that has got them another race win in 2024 yeah, and the, the racing isn't done yet. Sub will across the line with the other uh, Team Redline car. Can they just pip across the line? No, Drago Racing just about taking P10, but what a result in the end for Cooper Webster. We didn't think that that strategy was going to work. Maybe the car was going to die off at the end. Uh, no one uh, else pitted with him, at least in the front 20. Uh, but in the end, it was the right call from Cooper Webster to get that undercut, and he held on some fantastic defence. He was an absolute unit and a tank through most of the lap, and Luke McEwen and Park White threw everything at him, but nothing came up. Yeah, eight different winners in the first nine races, which is a tied record, by the way, including the very first edition when everybody was a first-time winner. A remarkable addition we've had so far of VCO Infinity in a remarkable race here at Daytona. Race nine delivers as we see the final few drivers make their way towards the line. SMP Esports just about hanging on there uh, for what will be uh, 35th, just ahead of Massimo Locatello.
of German Sim Racing, who I think went to the end, actually, from his pit stop a few laps in. Uh, but what a race that was. Cooper Webster for Team Redline taking another win in VCO Infinity 2024. That's their fifth of the day and their 18th overall. Luke McEwen couldn't quite get there in the end. He got past Parker White, who'll be maybe disappointed with third. Bobby Zelensky certainly will be with fourth. Jörg Tyne gets ahead of the second group to be fifth for BS competition, ahead of uh, Team PZZ and Was Cooking Racing Adventures, who he was battling with. Luke Rauper for Share Esport finishes a lonely eighth with uh, Leo Garaboli for Apex Racing Academy and Drago Racing rounding up the top 10. This is part of the huge group we saw in the mid-pack. Josh Thompson works his way to 11th ahead of Wave Italy Racing Team. Then it is uh, Timo Toika of Pike from Beach Racing. Oscar Mangan got past Ricardo Castroledo later on there and Jerzy Glack to finish 14th and a 15th and 16th. Then it was Esteban Gut uh, <laughs> Gutierrez. Wow, that's a <laughs> throwback for you. Uh, Esteban Rodriguez finishes in 17th place even. AJ Stravato finishes 30 seconds behind in 18th for Project Valorous. Precision Racing, Esports and Impulse Racing round out the top 20. It's David Toth for Brabham Esports next to Obsidian Racing, Altitude Esports and Dennis Grabowski finishes 23rd at Telestras Automotive and the other BS competition car in 25th. Race Clutch finish uh, just behind that with Cody Deef recovering to 27th, I'm afraid after their incident into the bus stop. W2 E Pro GP finished 28th ahead of Moore and SM Squad and Olympus Esports who round out the top 30. The final cards within a minute were Falcon Sim Racing Team and Kramer Racing Esports. Then you get to ATRS, who held off GridandGo.com Esports and Steam Ledger. And um, Fadislav Galtsev, who held off Massimo Locatello, as we saw, go over the line. It was United Sim Team in 37th, out of Maniti Racing, XPD Racing, and Blue Rose Team in 40th. 41st was Parnell Racing, ahead of us, Absolute Motorsport Azalif, SOP Esports Racing, finished 43rd, ahead of Rincon Racing and STR Esports. Then you get to those who were one lap down, DLR Simlab, Team Fordzilla and Screen to Speed, Dream Team Accelerated by Marla. Then you get to those who didn't finish, Rocket Simsport and West Competition Racing, who rounded out top 50, followed by Visual Esports, CRZ Simsport, Mavano Corsa and Eclipse Simsports who rounded out the 54 who raced in race nine. Well, what a fantastic race that was. Cooper Webster hangs on. A, a remarkable defense, really, Jara. I can't say I was expecting that. No, I mean, when he pitted early, I thought, yes, he'd get that undercut, and then the others with their superior pace would pull through. But what a fence from Cooper Webster to eventually keep that win. I mean, definitely a contender uh, for driver of the day, just because I don't think anybody really expected him to hold on in the way he did, just showing the fact that none of the other teams decided to pit with him, showing that it maybe wasn't the ideal strategy from the off. But in the end, he defended absolutely stupendously and comes away with another win for Team Redline. Yeah, their fifth of the day. I wonder what this means for the rest of the day, though. There's still three more Xfinity races to go. I wonder whether in some of those races we'll start to see some slightly earlier pit stops, maybe playing on that strategy a little bit to try and get that undercut, which I guess at a point makes it almost worthless. If everybody pits early, then there's no undercut. Yeah, again, uh, some of the other cracks, I mean, you're looking at um, particularly something like Portimao. I mean, it might be difficult um, to maintain, especially if your tyres like going off towards the end, of course, with uh, many more traction zones at somewhere like Portimao, it's going to be more difficult uh, to try that kind of strategy. But I think Daytona kind of suited, um, even if you didn't have too much pace through the infield, if you could just get a good enough exit, put the drivers off on towards the uh, oval, you had a good enough run all the way down towards turn one. Now, only one point was gained in the end. After all that, Cooper Webster gains at one point to his championship lead, uh, or Team Redline's championship lead anyway, which he's part of, of course, head of the Apex Racing Team, who are second. Four points separate them now as they go into race 10. I wonder what that does for the morale, because it is a great win for Webster. It really was. But in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? There'll be question marks over that. So I wonder what the sort of dynamic will be going into the 10th race, which is, of course, the Super Formula Lights at Road Atlanta coming up now. Yeah, but then again, you've got to think about how with every position being a point, I mean, that could give you an extra, well, because it's what, a two-point swing? That's not much, obviously, but it means that if if we come down to the wire when we get to the MX-5s at Daytona, and we very much, uh, very well may do that, um, a position or two could make all the difference. And um, for Team Redline, that could be what they point to and say, that's how we won the title.
Yeah, I can't wait for that finale, by the way. It's going to be so interesting to see because it's just so unpredictable. I wonder what we can predict from this next race, though. Super Formula Lights at Road Atlanta. It's going to be one of those tracks where you're going to have to avoid bumps and curves, where uh, there'll be a lot of at Road Atlanta. It's going to be a, a, a case of survival somewhat, working your way through the opening laps and then seeing how we get on. I personally hope that we don't see quite the same race as we did in the GT Freeze here, where there was a lot of waiting until we got into the proper action in that final quarter of an hour. Yeah, well, um, Friday Night Primetime, where we've had these Super Formula Lights, we've seen them race around Road America, and even though they're only about 24 cars in a 15-minute or 20-minute long race, there was lots and lots of action, so I don't think we're going to be short of things to talk about uh, as the sun has started to rise. But, I mean, these Super Formula Lights really do lend themselves to close racing and, and, and tighter tracks like somewhere like uh, Road Atlanta. Turn 10, the chicane down there, we could be seeing quite a few moves, but don't rule out anything at Turn 6, Turn 7, uh, and really at Turn 1 as well. Now, this is in qualifying, by the way, just less than four minutes to go, and it's really not a very long session at all for them to get themselves a proper lap time in and uh, set themselves up for a good start to the race. As you can see, and as you mentioned, Darrell, it's sun rising. Very much not the case over in Europe at the moment, but uh, we are getting into the uh, daytime again for VCO Infinity. Myself and Darrell will be stepping aside after this next uh, race to give way to... Arjuna Kogipati returns again alongside Brees Gardner this time around, so look forward to hearing from them to take us to halfway. But uh, now I think it's time to take a bit of a lap. It's uh, the end. Oh, well, I'll say that. We just have. It's the end of a lap here for Movano uh, as they make their way over the line. Scott Michaels will be racing and uh, he works his way over the line. 15-3 uh, last lap, but that's going to be uh, not one that gets him onto the board. Let's have a look at, uh, at what standings are on the board already. And of course, uh, that is the point standings. Team Redline leading by four points ahead of the Apex Racing Team. Coanda now 17 back. The other red line, 23 back. Uh, then we've got Coanda just uh, flailing a little bit further behind in the points uh, in fifth place followed by BS Competition, etc, etc, further behind. Still about those front four, still maybe about the front two. Four points separate them for now, but not a lot has changed actually in our time here. It's been similarly close throughout. And if it can stay that way all the way through, it is those kind of results like we were talking about with Cooper Webster. It's the one or two point swing um, over Apex Racing Team that might see Team Redline pull through. Um, because, I mean, we are, what, over a third of the way through now. Nine uh, races completed, 15 to go. And, you know, four points is a very, very narrow gap. It's one mistake, really. Um, especially if we get to the MX-5s. I know we've mentioned it a lot, but it, it, it rings true. If we have a tight field, we saw it at Phillip Island. If we have a tight field and you make one mistake you drop back four or five positions that could be championship over so uh, it's great to see it being so close uh, all the way through the field and it's uh, very easy to do that at Phillip Island shall we say the next time we'll be seeing that track will be for race 14 at uh, 7 a.m. in the UK and 8 a.m. in Europe and uh, uh, that can't be correct can it uh, maybe it's a bit after that <laughs> uh, excuse, yeah 7 a.m. sorry uh, in, oh no, I said that the first time, didn't I? Yeah, sorry. I, I'm losing my marble slightly here. It's quite late. Nearly 3 a.m. Um, here in uh, in Europe. But anyway, just over a minute left in qualifying. Everybody has pretty much set their times. Uh, I can tell you that it might not be good viewing for uh, the Apex Racing Team as we uh, look at things right now. I don't think Daniel Suisabo has been able to get a time onto the board here at Road Atlanta. This could be a big, big race as far as VCO Infinity is concerned. There is the 99 car. Stuck on pit lane, no time set. I think if there is any car um, around this Road Atlanta circuit that you can try and race yourself further from the back, it's going to be the Super Formula Lights car. Uh, the MX-5 is, of course, close racing, but a little bit wider, a little bit chunkier. Um, these Super Formula Lights, they are quite um, nippy in the corners. They are very much stuck to the ground and can really race well side by side. We've seen it already uh, in this VCO Infinity event, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a tall order, I think, for the MX Racing team, but they definitely have the drivers to do it. Yeah, they do. I mean, they're not the only ones. Uh, to my counting, 20 teams have not set times there. Suggests it's been very difficult indeed to get this car hooked up for a lap at Road Atlanta. So that's worth noting. 
as we get towards the end of this qualifying session. And as soon as we do, we'll be able to show you the starting grid for race 10 of VCO Infinity in 2024. And this will be great viewing for those of you with uh, Team Redline uh, fandom, I suppose. Uh, Chris Lullum will be the pole sitter ahead of Nicholas Bow, but it's Sam Quater in third. The red line cars lining up together will be uh, searching for wins here. Kyo Thiago Marteau will be fourth for Williams Esports Academy ahead of Luca Wunsch, and then Josh Ladd of Williams Esports. It will be Albin Spetz for Visceral next set of Carlos Fenayosa back again for the second race in three. German Sim Racing and PS Competition round at the top ten. WSR Esports Bookkicker are next set of GridandGo.com Esports looking to replicate their previous Road Atlanta win. Michael Romanidis leads the Coanda charge from 13th out of Drago Racing. It's Squash Cooking Racing Adventures in 15th and a share at Esports. Wave Italy Racing Team and ATRS round at row nine. Inside the top 20, it's Philip Schiff and Carlos Revere. Uh, Carlos? Oscar Revere. Can't read. Uh, Jano Dahau is 21st ahead of uh, Ville Ilivivinen. It is Matt Camelio in 23rd ahead of Niccolo Ven uh, Venditti. And then 25th, Martin Siratek for Pike from Beach Racing. Just over a second back is Juan Valero for Obsidian. Uh, then it's Bradham Esports and CLZ Sport next, followed by Morinus and Apex Racing Academy to round out the top 30. My, uh, Ryan Littlemore is in uh, 31st ahead of the Olympus Esports car. It's SMP Racing and DLR, the final drivers to set times. Then those who didn't, Grid and Go and PDZ are sharing row 18 despite not seeing a time. Daniel Civis Sabo from 37th has got a big, big job to do. Head of United Sim Team, Delta's Automotive and Rocket Sim Sport to round at the top 40. It's Race Clutch and Mavano Corsa who will share the next row. That's row 21. 43rd will be Impulse Racing ahead of uh, Samavatan Esports, uh, Samavatan Racing Esports, Eclipse Sim Sports and Precision Racing Esports are next ahead of Kramer Racing and XPD Racing. Then the final ones, it will be uh, Pano Racing, Team 4 Zilla, Altitude Esports, W2 E Pro GP and screen, t uh, screen to Speed Dream Team accelerated by Marla to round out the 53 who will start this time round. It seems that there's a slightly alternating number of teams participating, but that's all okay. These are the two teams who can really take advantage here. Team Redline with an unrivaled opportunity to take charge of VCO Infinity in race 10. And they're really going to be having to hope that the, the likes of Apex Racing Team are struggle to make their way. I mean, just look at the amount of cars side by side. They're over the hill. There's 53 of them of these Super Formula Lights cars. There's going to be a lot of action in this race. Apex Racing Team hoping to stay out of all of the trouble. But Team Redline hoping to get away at the front early on and really, really hammer their foot down in this championship. Here we go. Chris Lullum weaving around quite viciously to try and get the... Uh, Heat in the tyres as he looks to replicate his Algarve victory from a few hours ago. He takes the field to green here at Road Atlanta in the Super Formula Lights. I'm afraid to say there's already carnage in the background and cars off into the grass. The uh, screen to speed car has got off the road and spun on its own, I think, at the final corner as well. But it's the leaders who have gotten single file. Uh, Lullum leads Koita, Bo, Vunks and Lad to round out the top five as the leaders get single file. I'm afraid to say it's not so single file and clean for those behind. Yeah, it's what we expected really at the start here with a lot of these drivers. Uh, cars absolutely all over this Road Atlanta circuit uh, as they make their way now. The leaders down through six and seven. They've got away relatively all right, but there was someone going oh, off there. No. And a big off. I think there's multiple uh, goings on at this stage of the race. But for the guys at the front, they've managed to avoid it all. Yeah, they have. Apex were involved in that, as you may have noticed. The uh, Apex racing team, I'm afraid, are down the order as far as they're concerned. Uh, Daniel Sivisavo, 42nd, as they currently run, while the red line drivers lead one and two. This is a huge, huge chance for Team Redline to take charge of VCO Infinity, especially in the car driven at the moment by Sam Quater. Came into today, or this race anyway, leading the charge ahead of the rest of them by four points. Look at that. It's all going on at the final chicane there. Car bouncing in the air and all sorts. Already got two in the pit lane as well, by the way, but what a chance for Redline as they bounce over the curbs and down the hill for the second time in this race. 
Yeah, I think carnage is, is, is the technical term uh, that we'd use for that opening lap. There was absolute, there were cars everywhere, all over the road. There was an incident at turn one, turn three, through the S's at turn six, down this straight as well uh, that we're looking at. There were cars all over the road, and it's not too surprising. There was fighting in behind as well, but a lot of drivers in the pits. We're looking at at least 10, if not more, in pit lane as Vasquez picks up the position. Oh, Still more speed. Very bad spot in the track. Will everybody avoid? I'm not too sure that they will. And so far they have. He doesn't know when. Oh, finally! Ooh. Smash at turn six, I'm afraid. As the uh, 46 car gets uh, gets hit. Josh Ladd, meanwhile, goes through on uh, Nicola, uh, excuse me, Luca Vuce in the Falcon Sim Racing car. That's a pass for fourth place as Williams Esports look to really take charge of this race as well because Kira Thiago Marteau is no mug in these kind of cars. He's very, very strong in a, a lower end open wheeler and he's showing the academy car sometimes to be better than the actual main team, the community car, as Zach called it, for reasons that I really can't fathom. But he's sick for now and Marto will be in the top five shortly, I would imagine, but they're in danger of letting the front three get away already. Yeah, it's a difficult situation to be in. Josh Ladd is really starting to see those guys eek further away. I mean, even the background. Um, these cars just seem difficult to control, don't they? A lot of these guys not really looking like they're too comfortable in the Super Formula Lights cars. Of course, they are relatively new uh, to the iRacing platform. They've not been on here that long. So maybe something that some of these guys are not as experienced in. But as you mentioned, the likes of Marteau, uh, great in all of these uh, lower Formula cars. So... Um, lower open wheeler cars. We'll have to see if he can maintain that kind of uh, form by making his way through on Luca Vunch. And he very well may do that into the turn entry cane inside line. That's the position done, uh, signed and no. sealed. But actually, still fighting it through is the full consideration today. Yeah, he just kept alongside enough and uh, got back through as a result. Visceral will uh, follow through as well. This is Albin Spetz down the inside now of Marteau. He's getting freight trained. Here goes Phil Dinesz, two-time race winner in Infinity history. Can't make his way through. What's going on here up ahead, though? That's a lapped car off to the side of the road. But uh, not sure how they've ended up out there, to be entirely honest with you. Uh, so the battle for fifth will continue. And we will start to look at what's gone on on the opening lap. Daniel Sibisavo up into the air, and he was the one who went first. And I'm amazed he hasn't had to come down to pit lane for any of that. Yeah, that, that's it. I, that's frankly incredible if he's managed to bounce his way over about three cars there, uh, but not have to come onto the pit lane to, to, to mend any of that, because that was a, a very big hit. I mean, there were some bigger hits in behind. I mean, we saw, of course, um, as we can see it again, yeah, just bouncing up really on those wheels, wasn't it? And then get ap gets absolutely launched. Um, <laughs> I think spectacular is the technical term for that. I don't know how else we can describe it, really. Yeah, spectacular is good for me. Marteau gets down the inside, then in towards uh, fifth position briefly, but no, again, the freight training him down the inside. He seems to find himself in these positions quite often, or at least he has done in uh, the t last two laps, and around goes out Albin Spitz. Well, he's been turned around by Luca Munch there, I'm afraid, through the final corner. He won't be pleased at all. It's free wide, meanwhile, as Phil Dinez goes down the inside. BS competition have two in the top five. Yeah, and three positions gained, if you think about it, on that one straight with the Visual Esports car spinning around. Um, the Williams Esports Academy and Falcon Esports losing out there. So fantastic little um, main, well, um, pit straight there uh, for the BS competition cars. You can see it again, Alvin Spets getting turned around, but pirouetting nicely. Oh, that would have been a heart in mouth moment for the drivers in behind, seeing a car veer in towards the racing line once again. But, I mean, we are early uh, in this race. We're, what, six minutes into this race, uh, and we still and we only have 30 cars within half a minute of the lead here. Yeah, quite remarkable. Uh, admittedly, the Apex Racing Team, I think, are one of those 30 cars, so that's quite amazing as well, unless they've stopped without me noticing. No, no, they're st oh, they have stopped, excuse me. They have been in 34th place now for them. They took their fast repair. Uh, only 30 cars, I believe, haven't taken their fast repair so far. So that says a lot about this race so far. But just how much damage can Redline do in the front of the field here at race 10? As Luca Vunks drops back. I'm not sure whether he's got damage from any of what's been on there. He did hit someone in the rear, which may have given him front wing damage, I suppose. But... I wouldn't have thought it's affecting him quite as much as it is right now. Fanny Oster and Vasquez both go through very easily there.
it's also about a second and a half, hasn't he? You can see those two in front of um, Denaire and Marteau. Um, but he, I mean, he's not lost a great deal of time. He's just lost a little bit of, um, I, I don't know, maybe just a little bit of confidence. Last, that was De, uh, De Brava uh, going uh, off, well, off the track and getting collected. Uh, I believe that was on lap one. But um, it, we saw that worst incident down at turn six where it was just a waiting game to see if anybody hit. Uh, no, but back to the point about um, Luca Vunt. I don't know if he's actually Whoa. got any kind of problems. That was the air woman. Uh, that was the very much air woman that we just about caught the end of live, I think. Yeah, I just saw, when I was looking at the screen, just saw a cop bouncing in the gravel. Thought, what's going on here? Well, there's your answer. <laughs> Luca Vunt has definitely got damage, I think. Right, Michael Romanidis goes through this time into ninth position. And uh, I would imagine... Uh, uh, queuing up next will be the German sim racing car of uh, Nick Schulter Wissermann. It, look at that. Yes, it tell will be glad this is not real life because that was a scary moment. As, and that dr driver of the car in the background as well will be glad it's not real life too because that was uh, quite a violent accident down in the gravel truck. Unfortunately, as we've said earlier, it's put a lot of cars in the pit lane. Uh, lots already a lap down. Only 47 still on the lead lap. Pano Racing, unfortunately, already out. It's somewhat remarkable that there's only one team actually out after all of that. If I don't see a still of what we've just seen of that car bouncing over the top uh, on Twitter, by the time I wake up, somebody is not doing their job because <laughs> that, that is very much a, a still that I think goes a long way um, to, to explaining how manic this uh, VCO Infinity has been so far. We're only in race 10 um, uh, of this one, but there's still lots of action still to go. I think you were right about Luka Vinch having a bit of damage, but at the same time, he's not really lost out too much on this line lap because he's running the back of Michael Romanidis and he's just sticking in behind but I mean we're still in this kind of saving race we're only 10 we're not even 10 minutes in but it already feels like we're halfway through with the amount of uh, attrition that we've had so far yeah it's uh, it was saying to our junior earlier on don't you feel like when we start a 24-hour race so late in the evening like this in Europe anyway it makes it feel like a longer race because you've been awake for so much longer before it actually starts than you would uh, during another one and so even now, we're getting off quite late, but still 14 hours to go. It feels like this race is going on forever in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I myself have done a couple of charity 24 hours that I've organised myself, and I always make sure they start relatively in the morning for my time. So this <laughs> does feel very odd for me. Oh, was oh, that Lorenzo. the Lorenzo? Oh, Ponder. no. Yeah, it's Lorenzo, fellow commentator uh, oh. here um, for us as well, and that is not what he would have wanted at turn one. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, <laughs> sorry, you, you've got to laugh, really, haven't you? Um, friend of the show, <laughs> off, the, uh, off the road, and uh, I'm afraid that's not a good moment for Lorenzo Bonda, but I'm glad he's caught it. Um, he's, he said to us a few days ago that he'd just be chilling and trying to um, get out the way of everybody. Well, not get out of the way of everybody, but at least stay out of trouble. Well, I'm afraid objective one has, <laughs> has, gone, has gone unchecked there for Lorenzo who's uh, made contact. Well, at least he's still in the race. That's uh, more than can be said for some early on here in race 10. Just 10 minutes gone now. 35 to go, and Team Redline are dominating. There's not much more that they actually can do from this point, really. If they can finish one and two, then that's all great, and, and you know, that they'll be very pleased with that. However, in terms of the points that they gain on notably the 91 Coanda car which is currently running in ninth place and I think more importantly the uh, number 99 Apex Racing Team car is not really up to them at this stage the Apex Racing Team are looking to find their way through some cars and Daniel Sivisabo is now at to 34th at least but look at him here 36 points off the championship lead this is a huge huge race in the context of this event I think the point to be made here is even if he is 36 points off the lead, uh, Redline can't gain any points uh, in those live points standings. They will stay on 517 and 495, give or take a point if they swap positions. What can happen for the Apex Racing team is they can make moves. Of course, it's not looking great at the moment. They have to use their fast repair. They're quite a long way back in the field, but with every position they make, they get one point closer. And they know that Redline can't extend that gap. So they've effectively got a solid target in front of them, and it can only really 
you'd say, get better from here. I mean, obviously, something could go wrong for Apex Racing Team again, but they'd hope that they can only, from this point onwards, gain the points in this race on Redline. Well, you say that, but it's two and a half seconds up to the car in front of them, another two and a half seconds up to 30 seconds, then seven and a half to uh, 31st, uh, another second and a half to 30, if you get the idea. It's not exactly like they can bang through overtakes, lap after lap after lap after lap. It's going to be overtake, then catch for a bit, then overtake. And so I personally don't think they're going to score more than 30 points in this race, and that's a real problem for them. You know, Mr. Mr. Doom and Gloom, Ewan O'Leary over here, <laughs> Apex Racing Team. <laughs> you're not going to get a T-shirt from them anytime soon, Ewan, uh, with that no. kind of positivity. But, you know, you're probably right, to be fair, that uh, they've got a little bit of an uphill oh. uh, task. Uh, but give them, th they've got half an hour. They've got, they've got time. Uh, being uh, overly positive, maybe. We'll, uh, we'll wait and see. Oh, that's awkward. Into uh, the final chicane. What was going on there? It's not the DLR car, maybe. It was uh, going for a big slide. And Danny Hugendorm, uh, if it was, now side by side with uh, Jacob Reed. He's trying to go through in the Dazda Automotive car down the inside. And that will be a, a, a nice pass for 19th position over the top of the hill. This is where the action really is in the field. And this is the kind of group that Apex really want to catch up to, but they've got a, a, a real problem in terms of catching up to these kind of guys because they're over 20 seconds behind. Although Ooh. that might make it easier. The DLR car goes for a spin at turn five. Uh, pirouettes love uh, wonderfully though actually and gets out of it uh, relatively unscathed but uh, is this kind of fighting that's going to allow the likes of apex racing team back into these kind of battles i mean they've got um I, they have got kind of, there, there is half an hour to go if these guys fight like they have been the last couple of laps i mean you're going to be seeing more than a, a, probably a second a lap being gained by the Apex Racing team if they can keep up the pace. As, I mean, we're still seeing side-by-side -side action down the hill in towards the turn 10 chicane. So the hope is still there. Um, uh, of course, they've obviously got no pace car to, to hope for if, if anything like that was to unfold. So they've really just got to do it on track and hope maybe um, things go awry in front of them. But there is that kind of... Um, there, there, there are chances. There are uh, There is a little bit of hope sprinkled in here for them. Um, but they are going to need quite a lot of luck, I think it's fair to say. I had a question in YouTube uh, whether these are F4 cars or not as we have a look at the replay of Danny uh, Hugendorn. Recovers quite well, as you said. Uh, no, these are not F4 cars. They're Super Formula Lights, which I guess makes them sl a slow version of the Super Formula found over in uh, over in Japan. Pretty uh, understeery car compared to some of the previous ones we've had in lower formula. At least in my own experience, I find sometimes you can get them to understeer quite a lot more than you can get them to spin around. Although that <laughs> evidence of that replay wouldn't necessarily indicate the same. But it's uh, all about good racing, I think, in these cars. And we certainly see a lot of that. We had our first ever wet race in VCO Infinity history uh, seven hours ago now at Algarve in these cars. These cars, of course, do have wet weather available to them, but not during this race. Their second outing in VCO Infinity here this evening. And so we take us through to the 10-hour mark of this event. Just half an hour remaining until that point, and the standings on the uh, right-hand side there say it all, really. In fact, Daniel Sivisavo has even lost another position here. He's gone off on this uh, lap, latest lap, I think, and he's lost a position to his uh, teammate, Guillaume Levesque. Yeah, maybe you were right about me being a little bit over-optimistic for them, but... Uh, it, uh, really, damage control is what they're doing at the moment in this race. Uh, and, and if it was the teammate uh, of the car, the, the academy car, uh, coming through, then they can maybe try and work something out in that regard. But really not looking good um, for Daniel Civi Salzbo uh, at this stage of the race. The two FBS competition cars swapping positions. Um, the uh, That is the number, what's that, the number 89 ahead of the number 90. They're working together quite nicely. We're, we're kind of seeing these, team, these teams kind of find each other. Redline one two ps4 and five and then i mean you could argue apex racing 34 and 35 <laughs> if you uh, want to be cruel about it i suppose that is true the cars separated by a few uh, positions for now there's a smoke here on the run down through the s's does that involve any of the leaders it's right in front of them might involve some lapped traffic we do have plenty of it only 40 remain on the lead lap and that's one of the problems you get around here at road atlanta 
That's one of the things I really see being an issue in the Xfinity car, especially the gap between top and bottom in, the, in that car in the field is quite large. And so lap traffic may well be a real factor in that one, as it is in this uh, race. And we look in one of the highest groups in the field from fourth place on backwards. This is looking back, though, from Nicholas Bow in fifth. And Nicholas Bow uh, right up in the attic of, uh, of whatever building he is in, as he will, I think, get past one of those lapped cars for a second. I thought that was his teammate, but then I remembered they are different coloured cars. Thank you uh, to BS Competition for making our lives that little bit easier. But he looks relatively calm at the moment. They're defending uh, from the Williams Esports Academy of uh, Kyo Tiago Marto. Um, but I, I think at this stage of the race, they're, they're going quite well here, the BS Competition cars, because they can try and work together if they feel like they need to overtake each other. If they can they have that option um and it's kind of stifling the chances of the drivers behind and martin and vasquez might become a little bit uncomfortable if this continues for too much longer yeah bs competition are quite good at making it uh, easy for us to tell them apart and they very helpfully fielded a bs turner car last time we did this at uh, pro symphony i guess if you want to look at technicalities that means that field and Ez won two different races in two different teams uh, previously but i'm not counting that in my uh, in my stats i'm uh, putting bs competition and bs turner in the same uh, in the same one so uh, they can have that uh, Fildenez is a two-time race winner though and gonna do well to make it three here in this one i would imagine chris lullen will probably join him as a double race winner maybe become the second driver in this edition to win two races in the same year now down into the final chicane kio tiago Marto, uh, looks for his way through in this new look Williams Esports Academy car as we head towards the halfway mark of race 10. I mean, Chris Lullum, of course, would join um, his teammate at, at Team Redline, Gustavo Ariel, in winning both of those races. And they've both, uh, they would have won them both in the same car, showing that uh, Redline have got some very good drivers, in particular machinery. Um, and that could be an ominous sign going into the IndyCar races, going into the Super Formula Lights um, races that we have coming up um for the remainder of the event and there are going to be what five more of them because i think the only uh, because of course there are five tracks five cars the only combination that we are missing so we see uh jan volmer's getting spun around there uh the race clutch car oh that's volmer's spinning around the race clutch car i should say um the only combination that we are not having uh out of the 25 possibilities is going to be indy cars at monza so there is that i'm a uh Disappointed about that. Alex Bergstrom gets it slightly wrong for uh, Moradus and just clips off his front wing by looks things as Marteau gets down the inside here for fifth position ahead of BS competition. Now, the, my uh, slight annoyance with these things not lining up quite perfectly is, has been writ large by VTO Infinity because that there's 24 races and if we get have five cars and five tracks, which makes sense, they're both nice round numbers then unfortunately we've got to miss one combination out, as you've just said, and it's IndyCar every year that we miss out. Now, I've always wondered, and I don't know if Arjuna's listening yet, or whether he's uh, still preparing himself for the next four races that he will take you through this evening, um, but I've never quite worked out why we don't just do six of one and four of the other, so that you get to use all of the combinations and everybody's lined up and happy. As in, you, you six of um, you, you six of the same car, or no, no. If there's five and five. Then I, I know if you if if we did six cars and four tracks, or six tracks and four cars. Oh, I see. I problem. see. <laughs> I was confused though. I, I was trying to do the maths in my head and was thinking, well, that's are you talking about? <laughs> I'm not trying six to do different six cars races. and five tracks. Or, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be. Imp I mean, you could shorten the length of the races, but it would be impressive if you could th fit 36 in. Uh, but regardless, um, no, you're right. Maybe that could be. Uh, maybe Arjuna could have a have a ponder about that. Maybe he just. Uh, maybe he couldn't care less. But uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah, well, sure, yeah. I'm sure. I'm he would take on. Is it, is it just me who's annoyed about it? <laughs> it really uh, it really messes with my head that it doesn't quite line up properly and we and we miss one combination. But um, anyway, maybe, maybe that's just me. You can, uh, you can feel free to let me know. Meanwhile, Coanda get down the inside of ATRS and that's 15th place 
for them. Jona de Hau ahead of uh, Alessandro Romanelli, although it's not done. Romanelli back to the inside over the crest of the hill, and that's how he goes side by side through this section of corners without trouble and without contact, and they're still managing it as they get to the uh, basin of the hill as well. It's through, though, for Jano de Hau, and he is now 15th. Yeah, no, very wide as well from Romanelli, and he's lost the position. Um... Um, as well, so he's lost two for the price of one, um, and, and that was, of course, Team PGZ coming through there. So, uh, Jano de Hall showing, the, as you said, you can go side by side through the S's. It's not the easiest feat, but it is easier in these narrower cars, of course, Super Bowler Lights, uh, not the GT3s that we saw before. Uh, and it just shows that you can go side by side a little bit easier when the machinery suits it. As fighting still goes on, easy moves through the final corner. It is eventually. Aaron Vasquez set that one up, though, through the final chicane, and he's now ahead of Kio Thiago Marteau, who was looking at a top five not moments ago, but now all of a sudden looking over his shoulder and back to seventh. That's not Carlos Paniosa right behind in the eighth position. Instead, that's a lap cut. Looks like grid and go to me, but um, could be wrong. As we go on board with the Williams Esports Academy. Does this look like a community car to you? Well... <laughs> just to Zach Sweeney. There you go. That's what he said earlier. Just, to, just in case nobody, uh, just in case uh, somebody missed it. If anybody didn't hear it, Zach Sweeney thinks the Williams Esports Academy car is a community car. Dear me. You're trying to sacrifice him on that sword, aren't you? Ian? <laughs> um, <laughs> we did. He, he will we'll pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he uh, will have to see. <laughs> we'll have to see how that one goes. Uh, Marteau just watching this behind because Vasquez and uh, Boo fighting it around uh, turn to enter again. You can just see it does tighten up there, but it's quite easy to go side by side, especially uh, when these drivers are expecting it. Marteau, you know, he's, he's he's been comfortable enough. He's not fighting as hard enough. He can just scratch his head as he runs his way through the final couple of corners. But the slipstream effect does take one uh, take effect once again, uh, and Vasquez back up the inside. Oh, sorry, Bo back up the inside of Vasquez. Uh, and these two really just do like their swapping positions for fun. They are at the moment. It looked like the Drago racing car was going to try and cut back and uh, go back down the inside on the run up to the uh, the crest of the hill at turns two and three and so on. But that's not happened. And Kio Thiago Marteau continues to watch on from behind. I'm somewhat surprised, actually, as we go through turn five there. The risks they're taking through that corner. So bumpy through there. And the curb on the outside sometimes is really not what you want to be. But away you want to be. And that's certainly not where Kio Thiago Marteau wants to be either. Gets it wrong at turn six. Just well, actually, not to hit the back of Aaron Vasquez in his trip across the grass. Yeah, I was lucky not really to uh, lucky to not cause any more contact there uh, as, as they make their way now down this long, long back straight, just about to dip down the hill for turn ten. Um, but it just does feel like um, Motto is not really being given any breathing room. He's either at the back of a battle or at the front of a battle, and he's getting overtaken here unless he can defend the position, which he does very nicely indeed. Fenazola, uh, Fenaloza, sorry, is is not really able to find a way through, but he will have that slipstream down towards the opening corner using that bit of up and under, which he can use very effectively here at Road Atlanta and have that inside line for turn one if he can pull this one off for P7. It's got a filthy look through the visor but anyway he's through now into seventh place and so the Williams Esports Academy car of a sudden uh, dropping three places from its peak in this race which was a top five but unfortunately the experienced heads around Malto may be prevailing now. I think it's been a great signing for uh, Williams Esports Academy to pick him up and, uh, and hopefully develop him as a driver maybe get him to branch out into some other forms of racing, but he's doing just fine in this sort of lower level open wheel racing for the moment. A real strong driver in that class of car. And he'll only get better as he is paired up with the Williams Esports Academy. Meanwhile, Aaron Vasquez gets in behind Nicholas Bow and makes the bizarre decision not to battle with him. That is strange. Yeah, just sticking them behind, really. Uh, not really forcing the issue too much here, even though um, Drago Racing, you know, they could do with some more points in this race, but maybe there's um, a little bit more at play here. Just, you know, conserving, saving some time. But it did look more than close enough to, to easily go for the move to the inside down at the turn 10. Okay, thought better of it. Sits in behind. Maybe it has a plan uh, that we will watch unfold in the, in the closing 19 minutes of this race. But lap traffic now become a problem for these guys as it will, I think, for everyone over the last 19 minutes. When we look at the timing screens, we have only now got 31 cars on the lead lap, and it's the Apex Racing Academy that's going to be next to go. 
Yeah, I'm afraid to say a lot of uh, cars out of the race, but uh, that they're cleared out the way. At least Lorenzo Bonder is one of them who seems to be out now. And that's uh, a shame for them and a shame for many who are uh, down on the pit lane fray. Albin Spetz has gone off from the top 15. He drops down the order as a result as we continue to follow. Uh, Aaron Basquez working his way towards Nicholas Bowen again stays behind. Don't really know what he's hoping to achieve by doing this, to be honest. I think he could achieve more by making a pass and trying to make a charge at Phil Dines, maybe, for fourth. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not too sure what the strategy is here for Aaron Brasquez. I mean, the, the BS competition cars, they are running fourth and fifth. Of course, there is that gap maybe now going for the move to the inside at turn one. He's waited long enough. He's waited more than long enough to make the move past Nicholas Bow, But he's made it stick now up into P5. Can he pull away? I think that's maybe the question. Was he maybe waiting um, just to see if uh, Bow could kind of pull him along towards Dinesh? Realise he couldn't and then made the move stick. We'll have to uh, see if uh, Nicholas can come back for P5 here or whether Vasquez can try and pull away. But regardless, um, we're seeing cars going wide all over the place. Vasquez now is going to be the driver to really try and push the issue for the top four. He certainly is. I think that's what he could have done and probably should have done maybe a lap ago. But Nicholas Bo can't quite to stay with it for now. I think uh, he'll be disappointed. There's no prototype-style car on the, uh, on the menu this time around. We have the LMP2 for... The first VCO Infinity and at the new BMW hypercar. It not, well, it's not called a hypercar, is it? GTP uh, for the second edition. And unfortunately, that's where uh, Bo's strengths, or one of them anyway, really do lie. And he's not able to use that this year. Instead, turning his hands to the Super Formula Lights, which we've got this time round. Just under 17 minutes to go and Chris Lillam is leading the way uh, for Team Redline, by the way. They've already won a Super Formula Lights race earlier. That was Chris Lillam. He looks like he's on his way to a second race victory here. Looking comfortable for Team Redline and a real dream day for them as well. They've really been under control, haven't they, uh, Red Line? And with this result, Apex Racing Team further back in the order, a long way back in the order, it's really going to cement their position at the top in 1-2. It, it looks very much like it's going to be uh, Team Red Lines in about 16 minutes' time uh, when all is said and done. And Chris Lullum, I mean, he was, uh, he was incredible at Portimao to take that win in the wet conditions. And... He just hasn't looked back uh, here at Road Atlanta. He hasn't even looked back for his teammate. One and a half seconds is that gap. Uh, and despite the fact that Williams Esports are there, I mean, it's it's not a big gap back to Josh Ladd. It's only 2.1 seconds uh, between Lollum and Josh Ladd. It's never, uh, not once, felt like it was at all under pressure uh, from anybody else. And Williams Esports, uh, if, if they are to pull this off at the end of the race, it's going to be a, a bit of a shock, I think it's fair to say. Would you believe that if they were to be able to uh, hang on to this win. They would be 75% of the way to their winning tally in terms of number of race wins from ProSim Infinity back in the uh, autumn of 2022. They won eight races that edition. This will be their sixth out of ten if they can take this one home as well. Chris Lillum looking to also gain some points on uh, their teammates as well who are currently leading the championship. This will bring Redline to one and two as far as the standings go with Goanda struggling to lift themselves from ninth and Daniel Sivisabo not really moving through the field at all. It's looking very good for them now. Sivisabo is still, by the way, four and a half seconds behind 34th right now. It's just been a disaster for Apex and now all of a sudden they've got 37 points to make up. 14 hours to do it, admittedly, but already we're starting to look at the stage where Redline can finish in a position and still make it as champions. You know, with, that's the sort of stage that we're getting here with that kind of margin we're talking about. Yeah, when you're fighting with Team Redline, you cannot afford uh, to have the, the kind of race that the Apex Racing Team are having. I mean, what they are down in... Uh, all the way down p35 at the moment so you, you just can't afford to lose that many points over a singular race it gives that impetus to uh, team redline to the competitors and even um 
by the fact that we will be seeing at this stage of uh, proceedings Kawanda put themselves up into P3 as well. So it, it's disaster really for Apex Racing Team, but they, they have time to piece it back together. 14 races. Uh, if, if they are looking at a 38-point deficit, you know, as long as they finish a couple of spots ahead of Team Redline in every single race, they'll be fine. But that is far more easier said than done. And, and it really relies on Redline not being at their best for the rest of the evening. Or the rest of the day, sorry. Yeah, Josh Ladd might well ruin uh, Sam Quota second place here, by the way. But uh, I, I mentioned a couple of moments ago, they're already getting to a stage where they can uh, finish in a position and stay ahead of Apex. Well, that position, to be fair, is a podium position, which is not exactly easy to hang on to. But uh, you never know. Uh, meanwhile, Sam Quota might have some defending to do now. He's not quite been able to stay with his teammate. Chris Lullum seems to be at one with this Super Formula Lights car. And I think he may be the one to... Uh, sweep maybe the races as Josh Rogers did with the LMP2 very nearly back in uh, VCO Infinity number one could be a similar story in the Super Formula Lights here as well uh, now what can Sam Quater do from here though Williams Esports are really starting to work their way into this event now and with a bit of traffic up ahead maybe they can work their way through into second here yeah, it didn't help Williams eSports e uh, early on in the event where they had, I believe, um, a, a DSQ and then like a P52 or something in, in the second and third races. So immediately they're on the back foot picking up three points in two races was disastrous. But are they going to make the move here for P2 around the outside? Sam Qu um, Quiterts held that all race long, but Josh Lab says, well, I'll pinch that one off you as we go through lap traffic. Thank you very much. And he's now up into P2. That is a point off uh, of the leading red line car. So not the ideal um, loss, but again, it's just a point. But they're coming back again on the run down in towards turn one but Josh Ladd uh, we, we were talking about how Williams Esports are coming back into this um, there is the possibility for them to still be picking up points especially on all the drivers and teams around them because um, th the teams around them didn't have such a bad start to the uh, to the event that was close <laughs> quite did well to uh, hold on to the car there as he got onto the grass and up the curb through turns three and four and up over the crest of the hill there. Weaving around there from Josh Ladd as he tries to break the slipstream to Sam Quater. And he may well have done so. He certainly alleviated any uh, re-overtaking concerns that he will have had on the way towards the final chicane. And again, weaves around to try and break the slipstream here. Just over two seconds to Chris Lullum. 11 and a half minutes to go. It may be a step too far for Josh Ladd, but he might well uh, give this uh, lead a go as well if he can possibly uh, try and close on the other red line car. But I think the risk uh, for Lullum, I think when we were talking about whether he can sweep all these Super Formula Lights races, will be if he doesn't get the qualifying he necessarily wants, this Williams Esports car is still only two seconds back. BS competition, uh, the, the, the team currently in P4 under Phil Dinez, Aaron Vasquez, Nicholas Bow, they aren't really that far behind in the grand scheme of things. A bad qualifying um, for Chris Lullum really could put him in a position where he's struggling to recover through these guys who really have similar pace. And, I mean, the wind still isn't sealed up here because uh, Josh Ladd is starting to gain and that gap now about one and a half seconds. Maybe there is another twist here. Well, maybe that was the twist. Lap traffic again here and Josh Ladd's going to be furious with this as he tries to get his way through. It's a good exit from him out of turn seven. Actually, the best of a bad situation, but uh, the best of a bad situation is still not a good one. And he again pulls out of the way just to break the slipstream as best he possibly can. Weaves a little bit more. He can. Sam quite at the inside, almost in resignation as the red line driver gets back into second again. Yeah, there's nothing really that Josh Ladd can do there with the slipstream uh, that we saw uh, Kai Turt have. But maybe on the run down towards turn one, Josh Ladd can try uh, something. You can see him here taking a wider line through the final corner just to try and push all that momentum you get from diving down the hill in towards his car to try and make that move towards turn one. But he's not going to be able to do it this time around and stuck once again. So maybe that lap traffic possibly, you know, costing Josh Ladd a chance at the win here. Maybe. Although I don't think he had much of a chance anyway, to be honest with you. I think it's a pretty slender hope, but I suppose you never know. Nine and a half minutes remaining in race 10 of VCO Infinity. Chris Lohm still leading the way for Team Redline. And huge news with Apex Racing Team not qualifying, not getting a lap in. Daniel Sivisabo still languishing way down in the field. Still 
36 now. He's even lost another place in the field. Uh, so that margin goes up to 38 with 14 races remaining. Here goes Josh Ladd looking for the inside as Williams are really on recovery charge from a disastrous start. They're not even in the top 10 for the moment, but looking for a top two in this race. Josh Ladd is back into second. He is as they run their way through the final corner. Quite a very, very wide off of the road. Uh, and that won't really uh, lend him any kind of a hand on this run towards turn one. But he's still picking up a nice slipstream. And not think, I don't think he's going to go for it uh, either way. You talked about how Williams are outside of the top ten. But inside the top ten is the William Esports Academy team. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, they are tied for ninth. Uh, and only one point behind eight. So they're riding the battle. And it just shows that there is the pace in the Williams Esports team. And we'll have to see if they can try and pick their way up through the order race by race as we go through uh, what will be another 14 races here. Um, I, I, we're talking about it doesn't quite feel it just feels too long. I mean, I can't believe we're not even halfway through yet. Oh god, I know. It's a very long <laughs> long race indeed. Jacob Reed gets through on Luca Vunks for 15th place uh, by the looks of things. Luca Vunks has uh, got damage I'm suspecting out there on the circuit and that's how he's lost uh, so much time he was not too far he was within sight anyway of the leader earlier on now he's more than 30 seconds behind certainly can't see him anymore in the 10th race of the day uh, so i'm afraid that's uh, not especially good news for the falcon sim racing team on this occasion but it's not been a bad day for them overall so far they were in the top 10 earlier on today and uh, are just outside of it at the moment we're 11th going into this race uh, of visa infinity there is the uh, coanda car that was uh, formerly in fifth place going into this race and still are just about but it's not through their own performance i'm afraid to say not a great race for yana de ho who's now going to find his way past and ryan little more now into 20th position this is a, a, along the valorous car and he does find himself back into the top 20 but not where coanda want to find themselves no, not at all. And I think really it just shows how good this race has been. If you are Team Redline, one and three, or Pete, you're not quite getting the one and two at the moment, but I don't think they're going to be too fussed about that. Um, they've got Coanda really nowhere to be seen. Apex even further away. Um, uh, and, and they're a long way back, and it's just allowing the game oh, for Redline. Yeah. And that, they were four wide there, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Alec Bergstrom is the one who's finding himself in the wall first, and he'll uh, come to a stop. I I don't know what that was all about. Four wide on the back straight there is quite ambitious. I know these cars aren't very big, but this car, this track isn't either. So that was uh, over ambitious, and they all find themselves in some kind of damage, I'm afraid to say. Battle for 20th resumes as Yanta Ho looks to hang on to whatever he can. He's got Ryan Littlemore just in behind for Project Valorous. Then Alexander Davidson in the WSR Esports book kicker car. Then the DLR car of uh, Danny uh, Hugendorn. And they're all going for it into the final chicane. De Hao going to be last hit as through goes the WSR car. Valorous as well. And the Coanda car is in the gravel. Yeah, it looked like the Coanda car just went a little bit too deep there. And there was the contact created through the, the second part of the chicane. So unfortunate for them. Uh, but uh, it just looks so difficult for them. It's just not been a good day if you're not Team Redline. Um, Team Redline have just had the perfect race. Um, in race 10, they've really wrapped up this opening 10 races in, in a perfect manner, really just hammering home every kind of advantage that they had and being paid to a lot of the hopes of the teams that are sitting around them. But Coanda, they're going to be ruining opportunities. Apex, they're going to be ruining it as well, as we're still seeing cars bouncing their way on the exit of turn five and being overtaken here uh, is the Sherry Eastwalk car by German Sim Racing. Uh, yeah, that was into turn six for these guys a bit further back in the field uh, it's getting close again for the lead here slightly 1.4 seconds is that close oh, it's up to 1.7 a little bit again uh, now as we're back outside the top 20 uh, now precision racing esports have joined this uh, group so have str esports joining in but nothing doing down into the final chicane this is a replay of what happened who can we pin this one on if anyone looked like a bit of a racing incident to me that Two cars looked like they were running their line, the line that they should have been doing, the line that 
gave one another room, but unfortunately, one of them ended up in the gravel. Yeah, it didn't really look like anybody was at fault, particularly in that scenario, because uh, going side by side through that corner, of, we've seen it so many times so far in this race, you can do it very easily, and it didn't really seem like any different lines were being taken. Possibly just a little bit of a drift wide. The Kawanda Esports car may be getting a little bit nervous at contact. Rear end stepping out just a touch, but yeah, not really anybody at fault in that collision. Uh, as we, we're still seeing battles here, as I think this is the Precision Racing League car trying to make its uh, Precision Racing team, sorry, uh, trying to make its way through. But this is a nice little train. There's not long left in this race, but still six cars battling away. Yeah, it's quite quite astonishing, really. And this uh, end of the race, to my count, not all of these are involved in the actual battle, and instead some lap traffic. But it's not the case at the front. Uh, DLR and Precision Racing Esports are certainly fighting for places and Precision down the inside and through. Looking to get involved as well is uh, Cameron Martineau of the STR Esports team. Can't do it and in fact goes wide. Now there'll be uh, some cars coming through. Although again, not all of them involved in this battle. Instead, lap traffic in, in, in as well with three minutes to go now in the race. Precision get themselves into 21st in uh, the field. Uh, but it's a four-car battle that we'll enjoy to the end, I think. Uh, not sure how many laps to go, but there goes the leaders over the line. Lullum first, then Josh Ladd and Sam Crater with three laps to go, probably, uh, now that they've crossed the line. Yeah, almost certainly three laps to go in this race because they're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, certainly three more laps to go uh, here at Road Atlanta for the Super Formula Lights cars. It's been a, it's been a hectic old race. I think it's fair to say lots going on and then sometimes lots not going on. Um, but you know, when there was something happening, you knew about it. There was lots of, there have been lots of incidents. There's been uh, side by side action galore, some great moves uh, and some fantastic action right at the front, right in the middle and right at the back of the field. And no exception is this battle between Josh Ladd and Sam. Uh, quite uh, on the run uh, as they run sorry down in towards the turn 10 chicane Josh Ladd a fantastic result for him really if he's able to keep this P2 in the end denying Redline um uh, yeah, red line, a 1-2 result in this race but Sam Quieter is going to give it his all isn't he yeah it's uh, into the final chicane where it's going to have to be but not this time maybe even it's turn one to be fair He's given that a go once or twice so far, including last lap where he had a peak. What about with 90 seconds remaining? Will he do another one? No. I mean, is this a case of waiting all over again here? Just over two seconds to the leader is not something to worry about at this stage. The next lap will be the last lap when they go over the line again. They'll be shown the white flag. Are they positioning themselves maybe uh, for that final time around the circuit? Because it could be crucial, maybe more crucial in these cars than the GT3s. Well, we have seen uh, Sam Kuyta have a, a nice bit of slipstream, haven't we? Down in towards the turn 10 chicane. Maybe he'll go for it this lap. Maybe he doesn't want to give Josh Ladd that opportunity. Josh Ladd actually going. Now, was that tactical? I mean, he's gone deep there. That very well could have been tactical to try and get that slipstream. But at the same time, it feels like he's lost quite a bit of time there. So I'm not too sure if that was intentional. He looks pretty calm um, uh, at the moment, just adjusting his headset. So it doesn't look too flustered uh, by that. Maybe he's done that to position himself for this final lap. It really could have been tactical. 30 seconds remaining. He has got the time in the bank here for one more time around. They all have. Chris Lullum has got a lap of honour ahead of him here in race 10 of VCO Infinity as he uh, tries to become a multi-time race winner. The 14th in VCO Infinity history. Now through turn one for these two. Who's going to come out on top in the battle for second place? Is it going to be the championship leading Team Redline number 70 car or the 11th placed Williams Esports number five? Well, Josh Ladd, I mean, he must have planned this, really, surely, uh, on on the previous lap, going that little bit deep. It definitely didn't look like a mistake, not somewhere you'd make that kind of mistake uh, for the calibre of driver. You can see Sam Kaita trying to do a similar thing, taking a wide line, maybe just trying to get a good exit out of turn seven to get the run down in towards the final chicane. But this is where it comes down to breaking the slipstream quite a bit here. Does Josh Ladd have enough down into the chicane? 
Look at this, waving around for some quite a, almost a smile because he knows what he's doing. Josh Ladd will now go for it at the final chicane, at the final attempt here at Road Atlanta. He's going to come across on Quater, try and narrow off his angle as they both break impossibly late into the turn. Josh Ladd gets through as Chris Lollum ahead of the field is going to take race 10 of VCO Infinity. It's going to be Williams Esports, is it? Yes! They will just deny Team Redline of the 1-2. Josh Ladd very pleased with that. Sam Quater is going to have to please himself with a podium because they will have a huge charity lead after this race. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that Sam uh, Kaiser did everything he could in terms of breaking the toe on that final lap. I don't think I've ever seen more weaving. Uh, but Josh Ladd's still able to find a way through in a fantastic move around the outside uh, to pick up P2 for Williams Esports. And what a boost uh, for them. Really did need this kind of boost for their championship challenge. You know, as you mentioned, they were P11 coming into this race. Uh, but, you know, they're looking at that top 10. There's a nice little group, isn't there, at the back end of the top 10, including the Williams Esports Academy team that they're looking to overtake relatively soon and maybe get themselves for a top 10 finish. Yeah, we'll uh, see. I reckon it's possible for them, to be honest, as they go uh, over the crest and down the hill for those final few drivers. Uh, just... 27 ending up on the lead lap. Quite remarkable, really, when you consider how many in the race. The big story, Daniel Sivisabo finishing a lap down in 35th position for Apex Racing Team despite starting this race just four points off of red line. This was the run to the line. I think there's a lap car involved. Uh, no, it was Phil Dinez getting involved at the end there, wasn't it? Uh, very close between Josh Ladd and Sam Quaita, first of all. That's half a tenth and then another half tenth back to Phil Dinez. All three of them coming over the line as one at the end of race 10. But that is it. Another red line victory. They are on their way to possibly breaking their record for uh, having uh, the most race wins in uh, one infinity. It's another one for 2024 and a 19th for the overall uh, standings for Team Redline. Chris Lullum, the victor at the end of 45 minutes of racing at Road Atlanta. Josh Ladd hangs on ahead of Sam Quaita and Phil Dinez for second. Aaron Vasquez did well to get to fifth for Drago Racing. They just both couldn't ha hold him back. He finishes sixth. Ultra C Sports, Williams Esports Academy, Coanda Esports and Sherry Sport round out the top ten. We're already around half a minute back here with German Sim Racing getting a, a good race into 11th. Walsh Cooking Racing Adventures finished just behind them with uh, Alessandro Romanelli getting ahead of Team PDZ to finish in 13th place. Teletrot Automotive were 15th ahead of Rocket Sim Sports' best result in a while. Falcon Sim Racing Team and Luca Vunks will have to be happy with 17th after getting damaged in that one. Rivano Course, SMP Racing Esports and WSR Esports Book Kicker round out the top 20. Just inside a minute was Precision Racing Esports, DLR held off uh, STR Esports, Impulse Racing, Project Valorous and Wave Italy Racing Team, Obsidian Racing with a final team on the lead lap. Screen to Speed recovered from a spin on the opening lap at the final turn to finish 28th, head of the Apex Racing Academy and Blue Rose Team to run at top 30. Uh, Crit and Go Esports' best place car was 31st and the second car in 33rd. In between them, XBD Racing. Absolute Motorsport Asalif with 34th ahead of the big story here. Apex Racing Team falling to 5th in the standings with a 35th place finish. Uh, just say 5th, 4th place in the standings. Dear me. Uh, it was Rinkham Racing who finished 36th place with Visceral Esports and SOP Esports. The final two teams on the uh, one lap down list. Team Fordzilla were two down as were Altitude rounding out uh, 40th. Pike from Beach Racing were also two down with uh, Crema Racing Esports three down in 40 seconds. Jano de Howe didn't finish in the end. He's 45th along with more than a 17 down and these are really the guys who uh, did not get to the end of the race. Bravo Esports finished 45th in that one just a lap ahead of Eclipse Simsports. I'm afraid uh, Race Bot's own Lorenzo Bonda didn't have a particularly great day. At uh, 47th in that race there. Timo Muller Kangas, who does a lot of driving in these cars, actually finished at 48th. CRZ Simsport and Olympus Esports ran at the top 50. Uh, with the final few teams, Maniti Racing, United Sim Team and Parnell Racing rounding out the 53 who uh, raced those 38 laps at Road Atlanta here today. So that is 10 races down here, Dara. 14 hours still to go. 14 races 
still to go more importantly as well in VCO Infinity. It's been a good start. It's been a good uh, few hours. A couple of Road Atlanta races, uh, a particularly exciting race uh, for the Xfinities at Daytona. But just to round off the Super Formula Lights at Road Atlanta, a comfortable race for Chris Lullum, but a big one as far as the story goes of VCO Infinity in 2024. Yeah, Team Red Line. I mean, we've had a we've had a close championship all the way through the opening uh, nine rounds, but all of a sudden, um, you know, Apex falling by the wayside, Coanda falling by the wayside. Red Line have really taken advantage. First and thir third, they picked up all the points they could. Now one and two in terms of the championship, and other teams have got a lot of catching up to do. I mean. They executed that perfectly in terms of the fact that they got everything out of it. Chris Lullum took the lead off of the line, didn't look back, uh, and was never challenged for it, even though Josh Ladd got P2 for Williams Esports. I don't think Redline are going to be concerned because Williams are quite a ways back after their difficult start to the day. They certainly are, but still so much racing uh, to come. Me and Dara are going to head out of the commentary box very swiftly as Arjuna Kankapati and uh, Rhys Gardner will take you through the next couple of hours of this race. Stay with us, though. On the other side of this break, we'll have right, uh, race 11 coming your way. Lights up, game on, the virtual grid set, VCO, infinity, when the champions are met, 24 races, round the clock thrills, pick five teams, battle with skills to kill, striving for glory, chasing the lead, every team's aiming to take this speed, five cars, five tracks, pure adrenaline scenes, racing through combos in the sim machine, race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop, feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick, each team Against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Through digital bands, under virtual skies, he slapped the challenges, time flies. Session on point tactics, so fine. Every race's goal is to cross that line. 24 combos, the challenge is real. In sim racing battles, only one will seal. Team red lines, the mark, the crown is still. In this relentless pursuit on the virtual wheel. The night wears on, race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop, feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick, each team's dreams so vivid and thick. Race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to VCO Infinity. It's Arjuna Kanki Party, joined alongside by Reese Gardner as we get ready to go racing for what should be a fun race, the Dallara IR18 at uh, Algarve at Portimao. And Reese, this is such a unique concept, and I'll be quite honest in saying that we're 10 races down. I'm quite tired. I can't imagine what it's been like for the drivers, especially since lots of them are in Europe. It's the middle of the night for them. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and what a car track combination to tackle when you're in that state. The Dallara IR18 at Algarve International Circuit. Very difficult track, this one, to say nothing of how difficult the IndyCar is to drive. This is certainly going to be an interesting race. I'm curious how tire compounds will come into play because this, of course, does have multiple compounds that you can use. You're not required to now with 10 races in the books. It is red line one and two, the 70 in front of the 69, Kawanda then third, Apex in fourth. Remember, a position is a point. There is still plenty to play, Reese, with more than half this event still left, left to go. Indeed, Coanda Esports only two points behind Redline there, so a poor result for either of the Redline teams will certainly shake up the top three. BS Competition and Drago Racing also very close, only separated by two points, but I'm interested to see what the uh, back of the top ten is going to look like coming out of this round. BS Competition, Williams Esports Academy, and Altus Esports all within striking distance of each other as we go to the grid, Arjuna. And as mentioned, that Redline one and two, it's more than two tenths that splits them, and then Veyron Barnavel behind. Let's see what they can do in trying to break the uh, separation at the front. Tommy Catala and then Dominic Hoffman fifth and six positions as they'll try and rumble their way as they'll try and rumble their way on forward. And the man with the cap uh, flipped around, Carl Janssen, has Lassie Urinen alongside. And the man with the cap pointed in the right direction, Ian Chinguven, lined up in ninth. Nathan Moore is alongside him to round out your top ten with Jordan Johnson in the Apex Racing Academy car. Pretty decent run in qualifying for him in front of Sam Michaels and then Marcus Nunez and Nicholas Laubisch, 13th and 14th spots. For Impulse Racing, Norbert Leitner's 15th. He's got Maxime Naz in, well, what is a very big green machine here today. Loic Rabier for Team PGZ is alongside the visceral machine of Renzo Uhlenrock. And then as you roll down to the edge of the top 20, Brabham in the blue and white. Love to see them instead of the traditional green and gold that we've seen in the sim racing world alongside the Moradness M squad bookend of your top 20. Pedro Sanchez Albert, what happened to him in qualifying? Bit disappointing, I'm sure. He's got Matty Kaidaso for the Blue Rose team alongside him. Rocket Simsport, Absolute Motorsport Athletes, uh, 23rd and 24th. And we're only getting to around the halfway point of the grid. Thomas Cope and Dominic Olivier, 25th and 26th for Olympus and Precision Racing Esports with the Dutch League Racing Sim Lab crew alongside the Obsidian Racing on row 14. West Competition Racing, 29th. ATR RS 30th and we'll scroll through the rest of the names as they roll around for their formation lap. There's already a big split that we're seeing in terms of times. One thing that we're not seeing much of a split of Reese is all of the drivers basically through the field electing to start on the primary compound of tire slightly harder. And we are just by virtue of the amount of fuel this car can carry going to see pit stops here today. Yeah, indeed we are. Uh, of course, you don't have to use both tyre compounds in the race, but you never know if someone is uh, off the uh, off the pace later on in the event or they've had an issue early on, they might want to bolt on a set of those red-walled alternate compound tyres and get a little extra speed boost for a couple of laps. The, uh, the, the pace uh, difference is only really noticeable for those first couple of laps out of the pit stop. After that, the alternate tyres degrade very quickly so i think the majority of the race we're going to be seeing that primary compound being used yeah, a couple of weeks ago we had on monday nights on race spot tv the i racing indycar open series come here augustin canapino in that Huncos hollinger racing car was part of the field but it was phil kraus that managed to wax them all just on pure pace and uh, he says it was kind of strategy related. No, Phil, it was pace. It was all understanding how the tires were going to work. We're not going to see that split on uh, strategy. The long straights here in some ways as well, I think are going to mean that uh, uses of push to pass restricted to just a couple of points around the track, but pace car will pull off and away. And unlike when we came here with the Super Formula lights, for the first time we had the heavens open and rain joined us for VCO Infinity. It's a lovely morning for these drivers to go racing. And now it's all about the championship as it stands. Look at the top right of your screen. You'll see how the points would play out if they finished as they are. Red line would lead by 20 points from their sister car and then even more of a gap behind. We're ready to go racing though. And the Dallara IR teams punch the throttle and already some drivers are using push to pass before they dive down the hill through the opening corner. It's single file for the top six or so. Flick, uh, flick the cars to the right and bring your momentum on forward. You've got to be careful, though, with the tire still coming up to temperature because as you come up through this crest here, car has the tendency to slightly be unbalanced. Three wide in the heart of the pack, but no such qualms and drama at the front as they get ready to stamp onto the brakes at the end of this back straightaway. 
Slowest corner on the track, this one. Got to slow all the way down to about 75 k's an hour. There's some interesting goings on in the midfield as well. Carl Janssen for William Esports with a terrible exit from the hairpin, having to give up spots to Ryan Barneveld and Aimkan Guven. So extra positions then for BS Competition and Coanda Esports. But have a look at the elevation changes here. So many of the corners around here, you can't see your way through them. And it's very difficult on the first lap. And you do have the, you know, aero screen here in Sim. They debuted a new version of that this weekend on the streets of Long Beach. And as the Symphony of Pistons get very familiar with Delatraz Automotive, it would have been a useful addition there if they had managed to ramp on top of one another, as we have seen over the course of the day so far. We're going to see a breakaway out front. I, I get that feeling, especially since Barneveld, a bit of a cork in the bottle here. And, well, Guven's not having any of it. Slides up the inside, diving out of that final corner, working back towards the strike. Pinto from Ariel. One and two for red line, and Veyron putting the pressure on in the Kowanda number 92. Seeing some problems for Niklas Laubisch and Tommaso Mosca, the Falcon and Absolute Motorsport cars. They are falling down the order. Uh, it feels like there's been some big issues for them. The piece of bodywork flying off the car there obviously are coming together in the final corner. That was right, Barneveld, and he's now missing the fright, uh, right front of the wing, which is going to mean when he comes down to pit lane, add another five or so seconds, and he's going to have a long time getting to that point as well. Look up the inside. Oh, not going to be a chance for Nathan Moore to slide his way on forward, but the 2023 Radical Cup Esports UK champion is going to now go the long way around. It's a brave pace to make a pass happen, but especially with the lack of downforce, you've got to have the confidence that Barnevel is going to give you the room. Not one, but two. Sweep around the outside. Great move there, but the breakaway that I was talking about, Reese, it's four at the front. Janssen gets past Guven. Three seconds now back from those front four breaking away. Yeah, it certainly shows there's a lot of, uh, of worth in preparation for this event. And if you're familiar with the Delara IR18, then you'll certainly have a much better time here. Being led here by Carl Janssen, this is uh, the battle for the top five. Quite the train behind them. Guven, Hoffman, Johnson, Michaels, Nunez, it's going all the way back. And I, at some point, we're going to have to go back and try and figure out what happened through the opening couple of corners because there was plenty of drama. And I'm seeing, I count, at least nine, maybe ten cars on pit lane or have been down on pit lane and have taken their fast repair very early on. A bit wide there from Janssen, maybe taking liberties with track limits, but we've got plenty of those off tracks if you're going to just be pushing lap after lap to try and close down on these four drivers up towards the front. So we started VCO Infinity with the IR18s at Daytona the very first time, despite the fact that the IndyCar and Daytona have been staples in both our previous editions of the race. First time race, we've actually seen that combo together. Yeah, indeed. Uh, IndyCar at Daytona is something that, uh, incidentally, you don't often see in real life either. <laughs> it's uh, it's obviously uh, something that uh, that isn't quite, um, you know, uh, in parallel with the real world, but it's awesome to see, you know, the sheer variety of car and track combinations that these drivers are racing on. You know, these are the top teams in sim racing. Some of them specialize in a certain kind of competition. So something like this really tests the versatility of the drivers out there and uh i'll take full credit for the good combos any combos that you don't like uh, you can blame uh past our junior he was responsible for that here's a look at what happened down through the opening corner they were so almost four wide you can see behind symphony of pistons have already gone around and now as they work through the kink that brings you to the braking zone delatraz automotive i couldn't quite tell if they got hit from behind but that car plenty of damage and i'm sure the suspension on that left rear not good and then you remember we saw just in the aftermath they got contact with the symphony of pistons car so much going on at the back of the pack yeah in a very big field like this the only real safe place to be is at the front here we go then on the way down to the hairpin Love these beautiful sweeping shots as the cars make their way down. Another replay happening here. This is uh, oh, coming through the middle of the circuit. A spin just in front of the pack there. And that's right at the top of the hill as well. The drivers wouldn't have had much warning of that. And that's unfortunately taken out a few more competitors. Ah, so Symphony and Pistons coming through the shot weren't actually involved in any of that. And this is their view as they just, well, oh. bish bash bosh. Yeah, bish bash bosh indeed, and you know, 
it's, it's all well and good if you can look ahead and see what's coming, but the nature of this circuit, just how much up and down is involved in the layout, you often don't get much warning if a car is spun at corner exit. The only warning that you really do get, I guess, is your relative box in the F3, but, you know, it shows you a couple of cars up the road. If you're in a big train, you're not going to see too many. You mentioned that the Falcon Sim Racing car had an issue as well. This is what happened to Nicholas Laubisch, and it's a high speed oh. off as well through. I'll be honest, what is the scariest part of the track to have an incident. He's side by side with the big green machine, but I think he does it to himself, unsettles on the curb and avoids the wall by some miracle. Yeah, he was very lucky to get away with that. And it looks like it was a separate incident that uh, took the other car out of the running as well, but potentially the same kind of issue. Oh, I don't know, that, that looks kind of like contact to me, but uh, yeah, I'm not too sure what the deal was there. It's. Oh, okay, yeah. Lack of front wing. Contact, just slow. He, yeah. he was suffering with so much understeer there that he was never actually going to make the corner at the speed that anyone behind him was. And we'll keep going with the replays. Matty Kaidasoa, Kaidasoa Airlines, has made its way to Portugal. Oh, man, that's that's huge. Oh, that's, ooh. that's intentional. <laughs> Yeah, okay, obviously not having the best of times here. I just wanted to highlight that final corner. Seeing the, the loss of control there, it's very easy to do. Even in cars like this, which are very fast and provide a good deal of downforce, that crest coming over the hill, coming into that sweeping final corner, it's so easy, especially when the tires are still relatively cold, to have the rear end get away from you there. That's something the drivers will have to be working around in these early stages. And, you know, because they've got a fixed setup to contend with as well, they're having to drive around the setup preferences maybe of someone different. They do have the use of ARBs front and rear to slightly help to set the car up a bit more to their balance, but it's relatively limited in terms of adjustment. At the end of the day, Guven bounces off the track, and Dominic Hoffman's going to try and look to the inside, and he makes it happen. What confidence as well from Hoffman to make that move work. Guven's going to be looking in the rearview mirror for the second grid and go machine as well. Yeah, he's not in a great position right here. Ian Kanguven trying to keep everyone behind the grid and go car, rounding up in the braking zone, but it's all about traction on the exit. Let's see what they can do coming into the most difficult part of the circuit, this beautiful section that follows the terrain like glue. Easy does it on the exit, try and maintain forward momentum without getting wheel spin switch yourself over here i absolutely love this section it's so hard to get right as you can see hoffman experiencing a little bit of understeer on the way across the top i think one thing though that i'm kind of watching the the lines that he's taking it's very different to driving a, a formula one car around here right where it has so much downforce indy cars you know uh, relatively spec machines there is the ability to dial uh, dampers in and do development there but it's 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 definitely a little less aero efficient and so maybe the lines being taken sort of reflecting that as well dominic hoffman by the way definitely has moved from what I can see in the background, that looks like a very, very comfortable office slash lounge area that he's now racing from. He doesn't look tired. Reese, it's uh, 8 p.m. for me on the west coast of the U.S., which means that it's probably in uh, Europe going on 5 a.m. What time is it for you over in Australia? It's just gone past uh, 10 past 11 in the morning. Um, I, uh, I, I drove my brother to my mum's house this morning to get some yard work done. And uh, then I went straight back home and got on here. Uh, nice, easy Sunday for me. <laughs> and let's be honest, this is one of those weird endurance races where we kind of talked about 24 hour races are draining in their own way. But when you have 24 individual races in 24 hours, no one's really getting too many chances to take a breather, even though you only have one driver in a race. There's no risk that, for example, they have a power outage and you need to get a substitute driver back in. I feel like there's a tension that comes with all of this that you just want to see 24 race starts and 24 race finishes as well, because we've seen, yes, plenty of chaos on the starts, but some pretty good finishes to boot too. Yeah, indeed we have. And I think, you know, the, the format of VCO Infinity having, you know, 24 races in 24 hours, if, if you're crazy enough to try and do all of them without a break, um, 
your your rhythm is going to be a lot quicker than it is in a big 24-hour endurance event that's you know multiple drivers to a team and what have you you know uh, you'll you'll get into the rhythm of driving um you'll go for two maybe three hours and it, it's generally more chill but in something like this you know, you have to ride that momentum and one bad race can break that rhythm. And that's a scary thing. We, me and you and we're kind of talking about what is a bad race in VCO Infinity where, you know, every point is worth a position. Red line in the championship leading car haven't actually finished outside of the top 10. And that includes when we came here to Algarve with Super Formula Lights, very, very wet conditions. And they got spun through the opening corner when they were fighting three wide for seconds. So, you know, a bad race for them is no lower than 10th. And that's kind of why we're seeing the margins build before we even get to the halfway mark of this championship. We have a few more cars this year, so it's hard to really make direct correlations as to how many points teams have scored in the past, but we're definitely on track right now, Reese, to score more than a thousand, something that we'd never have thought about before. Yeah, indeed. So many cars involved. And, you know, even even with that amount of points on the table, it's those it's those little things that happen in a race that balloon out into big gaps later on. You know, if if Pinto and Ariel at the front of the field have problems, if they lose a few positions, yeah, it'll it'll cost them a few points probably, you know, if they still finish in the top five. But that could make all the difference in the final few races of VCO Infinity. And I can't wait for those final races, given some of the combos that we've got in store for us. Let's cycle back in the pack to Williams Esports Academy. Matthias van Erven uh, just passed Dominic Olivier in that precision racing esports car. Crazy to think Luca Kita's having to work his way through the field has already gained 19 positions, and he has barely cracked his way into the top 20. We ride on board with him. Jinx to the inside and not really fought off as they plunge down into the braking zone. Lock up from in front. Kita can't take advantage. No, not quite. You know, I've seen this demonstrated quite a bit in the Dallara IndyCar. Uh, if you run wide in a corner, and this is the case in many cars, sometimes you can gather it up on the exit, get a straighter run out of the corner on the wider line and still maintain the position. That uh, hairpin here in Algarve is one of those places where that can happen, but he's aggressive now coming into the top of the hill and position is made. Is there any kind of fight back from the car behind? Doesn't look like it. They're going to stay behind into the next braking zone and that was a driver taking a line that you know we were walking watching dominic hoffman and saw him walk wide through that corner no such issues for kita to slow the car down in time has clearly nursed the tires relatively well he's in the middle on the bottom of your screen matthias van Irvin's on that left and dominic olivier for the precision racing esports team is in that bottom right corner he's also gained seven positions so far and it goes back to the conversation that you and I were having about what a bad race is in, you, uh, in VCO Infinity, because let's say you just stay out of trouble, Reese. You don't even have to necessarily qualify that well, but you stay out of trouble, you gain 10, 15, 20 positions. Worst you'll finish is maybe 30th or something, which, end of the day, that sounds pretty bad if you're fighting for a championship, but Redline can afford one of those races and still hold the championship lead right now over the Quanda team behind them. Indeed, and oh, number 76 making the big move right there. Beautifully done up the inside of the hairpin. Yeah, you're right. Um, Redline can afford to uh, back off just a little bit. They can afford to take it easy. Uh, costing a race isn't going to hurt them too much in the short run. But remember, the drivers will be going through a lot of different car track combinations over the course of this event. And if they come to a combination that they're not necessarily strong at, if they end up retiring from one of these races when they've got such a lead, if they have further problems later on, it'll likely put them in trouble. Yes, and uh, we want trouble, just to be clear. We want some drama and giving us a championship fight to the end. Uh, Redline, already two-time VCO Infinity champions, of course, trying to make it three in a row. Damien Hugenschmidt had a uh, 
It's a bit of a smile through that final sector, clearly talking with his teammates, enjoying the racing that's going on right now and down into the opening corner. A bit of a swap around between uh, Maniti Racing, Mavano Corsa as the big green machine of Maxime Naz gets in front of Sam Michaels. Now, that car, the Maniti car, looked very green in our grid picture. It looks a lot more different when the spec map is applied and the lights hitting it in the way that it does on iRacing. Yeah, beautiful car, that. Um, very simple, which is what I like in a racing livery. He's, back, he's up into the top 10 now, is, uh, is Maxime. And uh, it's only one position gained, but considering the pace he's got right now, might be able to get on the back of Marcos Nunez in the Altus car just up ahead of him. That was a slight bit of oversteer potentially for him, though. So remains to be seen if he can keep that momentum up. We are currently 11 laps into the race. There's still plenty of life left in these primary compound tires. But remember, we likely have a pit stop coming up. So will he go for the alternate compound and try and vault himself forward further into the top 10? Have seen fall off of about half a second, six tenths for your race leader. So the fall off's building. It's just not that sudden. There's a very steady drop off that you're getting. And eventually you'll hit a cliff where, a point rather, where there is no cliff. It just stays where it is, basically, until you finish the field. This is what I was kind of talking about, by the way. This, uh, let me get my pen out. This is very green. It's, it's getting hidden by the graphic. This is not so green. Like, th that's yes. the difference with no spec map and spec map. Yeah, such a big difference to be made there when, when the light is hitting the car. And of course, um, it, it will change as time goes on as well. If we were racing at a different time of the day, it'd likely look a couple of shades darker, maybe with more light hitting it. Currently racing at about 10 past eight in the morning in sim time. Uh, so it's pretty early morning conditions for a race like this. And as you can see, the track is very cool. Only 23 Celsius. That means if anyone decides to go onto the alternate compound, then not going to have as tough a time as they would if the track was hot. The thing is as well, right, uh, of all the cars that we're racing, five, two of them have working headlights, so it's not like we really have too many options for proper night races, so most of these races will take place in morning, afternoon, or sort of evening-ish conditions. Haven't seen too many warm track temperatures, though. As we jump back to your race leaders, Elliot Veyron has been dropped now by Diogo Pinto, Gustavo Ariel, the red line pair that continue to run one and two in the championship. And one and two on track, albeit now in reverse order to how they sit in the points. We are 13 minutes in. The fuel tank here, it's about 70 liters. Uh, I forget what that is in gallons because uh, those are the wrong units to use anyway. But... <laughs> You don't really see stints longer than 25, 30 minutes at most at tracks where you aren't necessarily on throttle too much at a barber at a, a mid-Ohio, for example. So we're probably getting pretty close to the point where these drivers are thinking about coming down to the lane. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to that point, and now the debate turns to which tyres you're going to go on. Um, I think if you're standing a chance of gaining positions in the short term, like down here, the, uh, the number 55 entry making his way through. Good stuff there. Uh, textbook pass at the first turn. Um, I think if uh, drivers in this area of the field are trying to gain in the short term, then they would want to jump onto the alternate compound. Of course, uh, damage repair is also going to be a priority because we've got more than a few cars out there only running with half a front wing. Remember, there's one fast repair, but if you want to save it, it's an extra five or so seconds to get that front wing changed. Do love, by the way, Nathan Olsen in the bottom right corner, Thomas Cope on the left in that Olympus eSports car. Disco ball. There's a couple of drivers that uh, have had disco balls in the past. Now, Nate, uh, Nathan Olsen, not the first. Uh, Chris Sievert, who is racing with us here for the Symphony of Pistons team, someone that usually would race over on ACC in the International uh, Intercontinental GT Challenge Esports Championship that they have over there. Uh, very famous uh, for disco balls of their own in that sort of camp as well. This is Drago Racing and Dominic Hoffman who got past Ayn Chang Guven relatively simply and now is going to have to work past uh, the Wheelings Esports number five. Hoffman, someone maybe a little bit more familiar with a prototype car than anything else, but no prototypes in this runaround of VCO Infinity, so instead open wheel will have to do. 
Indeed it will, but it seems like he's having a good time in the 696 at the moment, looking at from the rear of Carl Janssen in the Williams Esports number five. See the pace that Hoffman is starting to bring in. He's gaining in the breaking zones, but on traction, it seems like Carl Janssen still has him. Want to try and gain as much speed through the corners as you can. Algarve is uh, certainly a track where aerodynamic grip is uh, an absolute priority. You can see how they're opening up the corner on occasion as well, just to try and get a better exit as the gaps uh, on lap on lap as Hoffman's just been closing. Now within under half a second or so as they wind back out of that final corner. This is where the draft as well is just going to be so, so brutal in the dirty air that you deal with as well. First, as you work through here, you'll feel it, and now you'll start to get the hole in the air effect that slips you closer to the car in front, but Hoffman doesn't use a push to pass. He's trying to keep some of them in reserve, as most of the drivers have been doing, in fact, for uh, the race, haven't ended up seeing push to passes being used too much. Left side of the screen, you can see the numbers used so far. They're allowed 10 usages over the course of the race. Most barely touch the button. Well, Team PGZ in uh, in 14th place. Meanwhile, Loic Rabier is uh, absolutely burnt through them at the moment. He's going to be in danger in the final stages, I think, as we check once again on the number 99 of Keita, trying now to break into the top 14. This is Rabier in front of him and has a little look at the hairpin, but not much to do there. It's a very close battle. He'd probably want to wait for these two cars ahead of him to, to have a bit of a tussle, get together, and then he can pounce. You can see none of these drivers are damaged just yet, and I say that because the closer you run in groups like this, the easier it is just to make a small mistake and run in to one of the cars in front of you, and that would not be ideal. Onto the brakes once again. Flick it down through the right and work it back towards the line in that final sector. We'll jump back over to a couple of battles through the course of the field because I do think we're not far away from getting into the pit stop cycle. And so there are probably some drivers thinking, you know what, undercut may work. Although if we go longer, the alternates could come into play as we near uh, the halfway mark of this race. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to be seeing a big move from a lot of drivers, particularly in the midfield, to jump on to the alternate compounds. Uh, meanwhile, I'm seeing Nathan Moore for WSR Esports Butt Kicker is in the pit lane. Looks like he's one of the drivers who's potentially going for an early stop here. Question is, is he going to stay on the primaries or is he going to go for the alternates? We'll have a look and see as he goes up on the jacks for Firestone tires being thrown onto the car and it should be basically a full tank of fuel as well given that is exactly half race distance and therefore I'm also going to assume no tire compound change for him and indeed rolls back out yeah. on the primaries he comes out where is he going to feed out clean air I think that's going to be relatively ideal for him Pedro Sanchez Alberts already come down pit lane one lap earlier. Tires up to temperature, up to speed, and around the outside and forward to 26 spot. Yeah, there's no tire warmers in IndyCar, so if uh, if you get an undercut on the drivers in front of you, then you'll gain massively. The temperature difference is huge, and getting the tires up to temperature, especially in these cool morning conditions, is paramount to your success. So halfway through starting to see the pit stops work their way through this is over with the maniti racing driver maxi naz as out of the final corner they will work once again no pit stops for these drivers and in fact no one else diving down that time by more drivers thinking in fact that they should stay out there and make the most of the primary tires they've still got underneath them battle between the grid and go machine of lassie urinen Ian Changuven struggling a little bit with the balance late in the run. He's dropped five seconds now off the back of Dominic Hoffman. And at the top of this long left-hander, using that draft, Urien are not going to be close enough, but shows himself in the mirror, just reminds Guven he's there. Very close coming into the hairpin. Three cars have made their way into the pits, meanwhile. Uh, Dominic Olivier for Precision Racing Esports. Uh, Rabier for PGZ and Demian Hugenschmidt for CRZ uh, have made their way in. And it looks like uh, Hugenschmidt with the quickest pit stop of them. Pedro Sanchez Albert, meanwhile, he pitted uh, two laps ago, is going to move ahead of all of them. And from what I can see, no one going for the alternates at the moment, except for drivers way down the 
field. Niklas Laubisch uh, actually already visited the pits once in this race, is now on the uh, alternate compound. Team Fordzilla's Collie Iglesias has done the whole race on the alternate compound, as has Jacob Reed for Delatraz Automotive. Yeah, some interesting strategies there, and it tells you that unfavorite has pit stop underway for a handful more. It's Red Lines Pinto that comes in. Ariel's going to go one lap longer. Hoffman also extends, and that's interesting. He was hard charging and still apparently saving some fuel, saving some tire, and doesn't want to come down into what is a bit of a pit party right now. Yeah, goodness me, there's so many cars in the lane right now. Uh, it's 10 cars now that have made their way in. Magnus Nielsen for ATRS Esports is going to stay out for a lap longer and get himself into the top five for now. Pit stop complete for Diogo Pinto. Yet again, staying on the primary compound. These drivers don't want to take the gamble of their pace dropping off to the end. And so they come out into clean air. What's that going to mean in terms of undercut versus overcut? Where are the drivers that have already come down pit lane? Well, Pedro Sanchez Albert hasn't even come out anywhere near those uh, mid-pack drivers that right now are rolling off and away. In fact, there he comes. He'll emerge just in front of the likes of Luca Kita in the Apex Racing Team car and be on the back of the Impulse Racing entry of Norbert Leitner with Marcos Nunes and then Maxim Naz. The driver is just in front of him. Gustavo Ariel then, surely he'll be in this time by as he works his way through the long right-hander and towards pit lane. Here we go then. Now, uh, Diogo Pinto will have had an undercut. Ariel almost losing the rear coming into the pit lane. Very easy to get a compression lock in the Indy car uh, as you slow down for the pits. Dominic Hoffman is going to join him in the lane. I would expect Uninen as well. There he goes. Um, now, Mivano, Corsa, ATRS, and Race Clutch should join them in here as well. I wouldn't expect any drivers to be able to make it more than 18 laps here. Um, but we've been surprised before. Now, does this undercut work? Ariel's revving that car and waiting to be released. He's going to basically be deposited directly onto the racing line. It's an interesting pit exit. And where does it leave him? There's the shot of the blend. There comes the red line driver up to speed, but Pinto's a good whole second behind as still with Ariel trying to get his tires up to temperature. He'll get through the hairpin safely and hope that he can fend off a challenge in through the next heavy braking zone. But the red line driver's up front, probably not going to squabble just yet. We've got 18 minutes still left to rumble. Pinto's pit stop was about 9.3 seconds. Ariel's pit stop under eight seconds. That tells me that Pinto might have put a bit more fuel in the car. Um, also a second slower from entry to exit of pit lane. So that tells the story of how the two red line drivers have opted for the strategy in this race. Could also be that Pinto made a couple of mistakes in the pit lane that cost him time. Behind them, Hoffman emerges in front of Dominic Hoffman and Tommy Catala in the grin and go machine. And then Guven slightly further behind, now three and a half seconds as everyone has officially made their final uh, stops down pit lane, unless there's a bit more drama to unfold in terms of wheel to wheel racing. And I'm hoping the red line drivers will hear my plea to give us some action once again. It was IR18s at Daytona to start. These same two drivers did end up fighting just a little bit. The push to passes are coming into play now as well as they work their way onto the main straightaway. Three tenths will split them. Pinto's closing, not closing yet just enough. He'll have to wait and set it up slightly deeper in the lap, but that's a push to pass burned, an opportunity burned as well. Indeed it is. Oh, here we go, up to the inside. Ariel has to give him space through turn one and a little bit of contact between the teammates. Ariel's going to hold on through turn four. There we go. We got some action now and some lapped cars to right. spice things up even more. And behind them, Dominic Hoffman got passed by Carl Janssen. So I think maybe, Reese, that explains why they have been saving the push to passes. They knew it was going to come in invaluable in the closing stages here. I'm going to be very, very curious curious to see how aggressive they end up being now with the push to passes because we've still probably got a good 10 or so laps to go they've only got six or seven usages respectively there's not like it's not like we're in a situation where they can be using it every single lap 
Yeah, it's uh, it's all about deploying the push to pass when you feel it is best, trying to do as best as you can without it in the early stages and then dumping it in the later stages, try and get as much speed as you possibly can. Um, and I tell you what, best place to use it would be coming out of the final corner. You don't want to be carrying too much speed into the fast last turn. It is flat out in these cars, but oh, 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 spinner ahead of the leaders. Oh my Lord. Obsidian Racing's Daniel Araujo with a big adventure there. So we check back in with your leaders as we were watching Dominic Hoffman get in front of Carl Janssen in that Williams Esports car. So Drago racing back up to fourth and without the usage of a push to pass as well. So relatively important that they were able to keep that in their back pocket and will be able to continue pushing. 15 minutes left to go. Next up, open wheel action will continue as we make our way on over. Uh, not in fact, excuse me, it's not open wheel action. We continued the open wheel action here. MX-5s at Road Atlanta coming up next. GT3 back here at Portimao as we finish the first 12 hours and kick off the back half. Before then, Xfinity at Phillip Island. That's the next four races that we have, or three races, including this fourth race that we have to work through this middle portion of VCO Infinity. Quick check as well with the live points, Reese, given that the pit stop cycle's played out. Hoffman's been charging his way on forward, and Drago now up to fifth in the points. Good stuff there for Drago. And uh, looks like still only two points between Altus Esports and team down there in eighth place. So anything that they can get extra in this race will certainly help them further down the line. But uh, yeah, red line still comfortably in the lead. Only by uh, seven points or so from Coanda Esports might be a threat for the top two. We'll have to wait and see. Still 13 minutes remaining of this race. Anything can happen. And so Gustavo Ariel gets the jump through the pit stop sequence. Now it's back in championship order between the red line teammates up towards the front and didn't quite see it on screen. But this is what was happening just in front of the red line contingent, just out of that final corner. So easy for that car to get a little bit unloaded. One car had to take very swift avoiding action and your race leader did as well. Bit of a change of underpants required there for Gustavo Ariel. Yeah, indeed. From, uh, I don't think it would have rattled him too much. You know, these these are the best sim racing drivers in the world for a reason. But you see just how close these cars came. That's the onboard view from Ariel. Thank goodness for all the runoff there at the exit of the final corner. The craziest thing was, you could see from the screen, the dash on Ariel's car. Push to pass was still activated, which implies he didn't lift that much. Kept his foot pinned to the floor. And that's why they are driving and uh, we're up here in the commentary booth because they're willing to be able to take those risks although don't even don't always know if those risks are necessarily warranted when, it talks, when we're talking about some of the chaos and carnage that we've had kind of had at the start of the race back to the edge of the top 20 where WSR Esports butt kicker a bit of a spin for Nathan Moore just after the pit stop sequence has dropped him back into the contention and clutches of Dutch League Racing, uh, Precision Racing Esports race clutch as well. Sean Campbell all the way down here with Demian Hugenschmidt as well. It's a five car fight right now for 18th position. I love seeing this. Oh, that's a mistake there for Hugen Schmidt. Locked up on the way into the hairpin and set himself wide. That's cost him valuable time. And now Sean Campbell ahead in the race clutch 14, chasing down Dominic Olivier. He will have the slipstream, maybe deploying push to pass as well to get by. But it's so difficult to make passes into the first corners. They're so fast. You have to be alongside the car in order to make the pass. But there he goes. Sean Campbell passed before they get to the braking zone. Gets the job done as he decisively slides back to the left as they fly in through the opening corner. And Sean Campbell brings that race clutch car up another position. 24 positions gained so far today. And you may think, oh, that's one of the biggest movers in this particular race. No, Luca Kita is the biggest mover. He's up to 12, 26 positions gained. Goes back to what I was kind of mentioning slightly earlier. You can have bad races. You just don't want to make a habit of it. Yeah, indeed. Consistency is key in any endurance event, and especially in an event like this, where we have 24 races over 24 hours. Luca Kita driving very well right now. In terms of positions gained in this race, up five spots. 
uh, pitted five laps ago, so the tyres are still in optimum condition. And he's looking quick. His, uh, his last lap time was two tenths quicker than Norbert Leitner's ahead. Norbert Leitner in that number 57 for Impulse Racing. That's still have some push to passes in hand. Tower is lighting up like a Christmas tree. Ein Chinguven is going to be in a precarious situation with 10 minutes left to go. He has one push to pass left in the bank. That is scary because so often I end up talking about how it's not just push to pass. It can be push to defend as well, using it at the right time to disrupt the rhythm and flow of the driver behind, or maybe just mitigate and minimize the impact of the driver's push to pass usage behind. Guven's got one left. Grid and Go have four. It's a big, big delta between the, the two teams. Yeah, so that tells us that Ayn Can Guven is going to have to drive massively defensively into the corners, maybe try to unsettle Lassi Urinen behind as we ride on board with Urinen, just seeing how blind a lot of these corner entries are. I mean, as a driver, you're going into the braking zone for corners like this in your first few laps around the track. You're thinking, where's the track going to go? Have I braked at the right point? Am I going to be able to keep the weight on the fronts for maximum turn in? Fortunately, all of these drivers we've been seeing are uh, well-practiced at that and very familiar with this circuit. Let's see what the exit is like then for Urin. And as you said, Arjuna, four push to passes left, and it looks like he's going to be using one of them to get past Gubin here. Now, is he going to be close enough? He's closing. He's about... 10 kilometers an hour quicker and Guven goes to the right but gets absolutely blitz pass but into the braking zone still brave Guven can only do so much as off the track goes the grid and go machine Paul Smith the arbiter of track limits would not appreciate that and I'm sure maybe with race control in mind position handed back Guven back to seventh yeah, it's unfortunately a wasted opportunity there for Lassi Urinen. He had the speed. He was able to uh, turn in, uh, but unfortunately just took too much speed into the first couple of corners. So Guven now with a little bit of a saving throw, but considering the pace that Urinen's got and that he still has three push to passes left, I think it's only a matter of time before we see him get by. We've only got eight minutes, which means for your race leaders who... Already halfway through the lap, in fact, actually. So they are making rapid, rapid progress coming through the final sector now. Trying to calculate how many laps will have left this time by. I think six laps to go. Diego Pinto had one more push to pass than Gustavo Ariel. He uses it now. And well, for a second, I thought Gustavo Ariel was jinking off down to pit lane. So aggressive was the jinking back and forth. But it gives him enough of that... Uh, slipstream being broken that he's not worried about the move into turn one pinto's tried it though into the next hairpin he'll try it once more door slam shot on him though pinto will try and get the power down a little bit better cross aerial all up but the teammates hammer and tongs back and forth you couldn't tell a championship was on the line Absolutely. Defensive again for Ariel coming into the hairpin. Will he be able to get the power up? Slight lock up for Pinto as well. These guys are leaving nothing on the table and there's no team orders at Team Redline, it seems. Fantastic battling here. Is this another chance for Pinto to fire it up oh! the inside? It is and they make contact. Gustavo Ariel spun out of the lead. Rule number one of racing, never hit your teammate. And Diogo Pinto has just turfed Gustavo Ariel out of the way. There will be damage, definitely for Diogo Pinto. We saw him lose a bit of his front wing. Does Gustavo Ariel have rear suspension damage? Has Elliot Veyron showed up on the scene and said, give me a piece of the lead as he's right on the back of the second red line car? Looking at Ariel's car in sim, it doesn't seem like much in the way of visual damage, but I suppose the story will be told in lap times. Push to pass active now for Elliot Veyron, and this could be the chance he needs to get Coanda Esports right into the championship fight. Look at the speed he's got now over Gustavo Ariel, who goes defensive into turn one. They'll be side by side in the braking zone. Ariel's going to hold on just for a bit, but is there going to be another dive up the inside from Veyron? No. Ariel is wise to it, and he covers. Ariel might just also be at this point holding off Veyron and giving Pinto a bit of breathing room as they head through these final stages. Let's go back to the replay, see from up above if we can judge if 
well, there is any responsibility. No. there's. It's just no. that little bit of net go between them. No intention on either part to do anything, and that's why Pinto's front wing actually brings itself back into existence when we saw it fly off in the live pictures. And indeed we did. The battle's still going on here between Lassa Urinen and Ayn Can Goob, and it seems like Urinen has uh, actually made the pass for seventh spot there, but we'll keep our eyes on the battle for second for the time being. Ariel still trying to keep himself in the mix. Five minutes left to go. What does our point situation look like now? Well, the reality is not much different because only one position has changed at the very front. It's Pinto and Ariel that swap around. We'll keep an eye on what's going to end up happening with them back with this battle between the grid and go machine that joined us on short notice. Iron, Can Iron Jan Guven lights up the rear tires there. And you can just tell how much they are working these machines. These are proper driver's cars as well. No power steering, much more reminiscent of a Formula 2 machine than a Formula 1 car. And Guven, one of a handful of drivers now using their final push to passes. As we still got five minutes left to go, he really wants to get to the lead and will really pinch Urinen into the braking zone. Gets <laughs> past as well. This battle's not done though. Absolutely not. Urinen has been very aggressive over these last few laps. He's making life difficult for Ayan Chan Guven. Oh, such a fantastic fight. I'm, I'm loving this race. I've always had a soft spot for IndyCar racing. Commentator series down here in Australia with it. And uh, it's, it's always a fun time. But here at Portimao, my goodness, the racing has been magnificent. There's a reason why. Uh, Indy cars have been a staple of VCO Infinity, uh, mainly because I have a say, and uh, until I don't have a say, <laughs> Indy cars will be a firm, firm presence here. The only thing that we've got to figure out, Ewan was kind of wondering this slightly earlier, but because it's been the staple, we've also only ever had four Indy car races in any VCO Infinity. Daytona was dropped for the first two, Mons is the unfortunate track this time by. Next time, we've just got to make sure that there's a there's a combo, Reese, that's so wild, so unpredictable, that we cannot allow it to be raced, and therefore the Indy car must be used instead. Yeah, indeed. Um, for a wild combination, I'd su I'd suggest uh, Tsukuba 1000, maybe. <sighs> you are uh, you are <laughs> thinking wild, aren't you? By the way, that was a c really close. Uh, entry into shot by Delatraz Automotive, who are one lap down in uh, this fight that we're watching uh, right now. Back over to uh, the fight between Critigo and Kawanda. These two are having fun with one another, that's for sure. Playing with their food is how some might put it. Yeah, it looks like they're just, uh, you know, gloves off. Let's have a good race towards the end. It's only a points difference, and uh, it remains to be seen how much difference it's going to make further down the line. But remember, Ayn Can Guven does not have any push to passes left. Urinen has a couple more in the bank, so he's got to be careful about when he uses them. Thing is, though, from what I've seen from these two, Urinen is going for it at places uh, where you tend not to use push to pass. Um, he's going, you know, into turn one in the middle of the circuit, stuff like that. Um, just remains to be seen where he's going to make that pass and make it stick. Two minutes to go. Leaders coming back around to the start finish line. Two laps left to go for sure then. Ariel's got the pressure still from Veyron to contend with, but he has dealt with it quite well. I don't think that necessarily he's going to be too frustrated by the driver sitting there and waiting. He's got a push to pass in hand to use as well in defense, but does Elliot Veyron do what Diogo Pinto was doing? Make moves in places where Ariel wasn't expecting it and throw the surprise in these penultimate couple of laps. There's a look at both drivers. One, of course, racing from Brazil, so it's probably going on midnight. The other one, I'm pretty sure racing from Europe, so it's four or five in the morning. They look as wide awake as you could expect to be racing this combo. Yeah, uh, adrenaline's a hell of a drug, isn't it? And uh, I can't imagine the adrenaline crash these drivers are going to suffer after VCO Infinity uh, concludes. They're probably going to sleep for a whole day after this. I mean, I'd sleep for a whole day just after competing in this one race. It's been so intense. And we've got more broadcasts tomorrow on RaceBot TV as well. 
It uh, never ends for us behind the scenes. These drivers, though, at least for the time being, there's not too much super serious sim racing going on. It's a bit of a, a lull for them, at least on the road course side of things. The NASCAR still in full swing, as of course, here on iRacing, but an opportunity for them to do something different, unwind a little bit, and... Well, still competitive, don't get us wrong. There's some prize money up for grabs, but we've talked about as a big field, big split in uh, talent and maybe speed as well. It's very much a community event. Final lap begins, white flag in hand. Gustavo Ariel going to force Veyron to make him work if he wants to get the move done. In towards the hairpin, final time. Don't gonna th don't think that Veyron can go the long way around. Ariel's placing his car exactly where it needs to be. Yeah, I was just about to say that, Arjuna. He's he's preemptively defending and doing a great job of it, managing to get a better exit as well. But that's a very late dive around the outside there for Elliot Veyron. He gets into the marbles, though, and spins across the curb. That's another opportunity lost. The only place he can potentially do it is uh, coming into one of the final breaking zones of the lap. But I think Ariel might just be safe. A couple of different fights up and down through the field, but nothing really where drivers are close enough to make desperation uh, desperation sends even. What a race it has been. Bottom corner, Brabham Esports almost run into Team PGZ just with a small lockup of the break. And nearing the halfway mark of this 2024 edition of VCO Infinity, and we are starting to see the favorites slowly stretch their legs. And it was drama between Redline here today, but drama between teammates still resulting in a one and two. It doesn't get much better than that. It's Diogo Pinto that will round the final corner. Yet another win for Redline, yet another win for Pinto, this time in the IR18. Ariel holds off Veyron, meanwhile, for second place. Coanda Esports getting back onto the podium. Uh, Dominic Hoffman for Drago Racing getting into fourth place. Good stuff from him, up two positions from where he started. I'm sure there'll be a little bit of a ding the red line box about that contact between uh, Pinto and Ariel. But regardless, like you say, Arjuna, they still came away with a 1-2 finish perfect result for the team. Yeah, not often you can say that, and we've got fights still going on. Wave Italy, Pike from Beach and Olympus Esports all squabbling with Scherer and a couple more drivers traffic around them as well. Ara Antelope is trying to hunt down Thomas Cope with Damien Owen Harris, who usually wheels a touring car instead of an Indy car. What a difference that must feel like. And then Andre Wolf in the Scherer Esports number 15. Basically, all of these drivers have also saved their push to passes for the end of this race. And so a drag race to the line, but basically academic because Olympus Esports should end up holding on from those behind. But wow, what a combo. And let's be honest, Reese, I think you and I were very much both evangelists for the IndyCar. We'd like to see a little bit more of it. Oh, yeah, indeed. Uh, if, uh, if if I commentated seven IndyCar races a week, I'd be a happy man. This was fantastic. And, well, uh, we're so much looking forward to the iRacing Indy 500 being back. They crash a little bit as they come towards the line, but it is once again Team Redline winners here in VCO Infinity. And we'll grab a look at your race results and confirm exactly how they all stacked up behind because it ended up being close to four seconds the margin between the teammates at the top. And then Veyron put the pressure on Ariel but couldn't be able to crack the door. Dominic Kaufman fought his way forward to fourth. What an impressive drive from him to pass the likes of Carl Janssen, both on track and with strategy. And then Tommy Cattler, the first of the grid and go machines in front of Ian Changuvan, who finds him to sandwich behind the second of the grid and go cars as well. Sam Michaels, uh, ninth in the Movano Corsa entry, and then 28 positions gained for Luca Kita to bring the Apex Racing Team into the top 10. I guess if you can't qualify well, at least you can drive it through the field. Down in 11th, it's uh, Altus Esports and Marcos Nunes with Impulse and then BS Plus Competition, 12th and 13th spot. The big green machine of Maxime Naz is classified down in 14th with PGZ, 15th, and then Brabham, Williams Esports Academy team, uh, uh, Race Clutch, WSR Esports, Butt Kicker, and Dutch League Racing by SimLab, making up the rest of your top 20. Still going to find Dominic Olivier in the Precision Racing Esports car. Uh, 
Apex Racing Academy not far behind, and then Moranis M Squad, Falcon Sim Racing, and then towards those that were involved in the fun fight. Not Altitude Esport, but Olympus Esport, Pike from Beach Racing as well, as Waverly Racing Team, Shera Esport, and the BS Competition Team, Ryan Barnevel dropping down through the order to 30th position. It was 31st for Project Valorous, uh, Rincon Racing 32nd, and then W2E Pro GP, Racebot's own Lorenzo Bonder fights his way forward to 33rd. Absolute Motorsport Aslith in 34th with Paddy Wolf and Was Cooking Racing Adventures scored down in 35th. Visceral, the final car on the lead lap with Kramer Racing Esports, Delatraz Automotive by Majors Garage, West Competition Racing, and United Sim Team, your top 40. Only four more cars, one lap down. That was the SMP Racing, Obsidian Racing, uh, Samantha Tan Esports, uh, ACRS Esports, and then two laps down for the Screen to Speed Dream Team. CRZ, German Sim Racing, Team Fordzilla, SOP, and XBD, the top 50, and then those really involved in trouble. Eclipse Sim Sport, Rocket Sim Sport, Parnell uh, Racing, and the Blue Rose Team. We did see Matty Kaidasoa going Kaidasoa Airlines slightly earlier on. So that was a look at your race results. And now we flip the switch on over to what should be a fascinating race over at Road Atlanta. Reese, the MX-5s are such a fascinating car. We always know they can put on great racing. But I think back to what we saw at Phillip Island, where it's a track where you can race close. It's not necessarily a track where you expect the MX-5s to stay right on top of each other for basically all 45 minutes. Yeah, indeed. But Road Atlanta is a very difficult circuit at the best of times. You've got to use the curbs in order to get the best run around that place. And the MX-5s are known for being a little bit tail happy. So I think we're going to be seeing some big action resulting from drivers making mistakes. Keep an eye out for the run into turn three on lap one. That's where we're going to see the best action. And it's not often that we end up seeing drivers go back to back in races, right? Because theoretically you can, but qualifying is already underway for uh, our 12th race of the 24. And so, you know, you finish one race, you then get to a different car, a different track, and you've got to very quickly get to grips with it. So you're one off, one off. And the drivers that have just finished the race will go off and probably be practicing for their next race race. The drivers that are qualifying right now have been sitting in their cars for 40 minutes, getting dialed in for the specific conditions that they're going racing in for that one lap qualifying qualifying shootout. Indeed they are. Let's see who gets the best of it. I love MX5 racing as much as IndyCar racing. Chaos is guaranteed. Uh, let's, let's just bring it on. So as we get to work with those qualifying times slowly trickling on in, we're still waiting for points to become official from race control. And so we'll get you the updated points as soon as we can, but we're not quite at that stage just yet. Let's talk about Road Atlanta and well, one thing in particular, Reese, that Lewis and myself, we always love to rant about, and that is, well, corner numbers. At Road Atlanta, they make absolutely no sense. Somehow you exit turn seven, go down a straightaway, and the next time you're on the brakes, it's into turn 10A, and then there's turn 10B as well. It, it's just ludicrous is what it is. Yeah, it is. And um, I, I, I don't know if this is um, a, a real fact, but uh, I have heard in the past that uh, the reason the corner names are like that at uh, tracks like Road Atlanta and Road America is because they actually correspond to Marshall's posts, which is a bit of an interesting fact there. Regardless, um, I think it makes sense in, in the run from turn four down to turn five, because like while, while you are negotiating corners, particularly through the S's down at the bottom, of the hill you are straight lining as much as you can so you know it's a bit of a liberal interpretation of what constitutes a turn more or less i you know i tend to be of the opinion that if there is a curve in the road it counts as a turn but some people are like no if if you're not actually turning the wheel through it then it isn't a turn it's it's one of those great debates of racing that will never end well so my kind of logic kind of is if it's a, a if it's a straight where you actually have to focus on the turn so like Hockenheim's, you know, the run towards the hairpin. I don't count that as a corner. Do you count that as a corner? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, it's, a, it's a curved straight. Exactly. That's about it. Th that's where, like, the line is, right? Basically right around there. If it's any more curved and you actually have to deal with some, you know, downforce on your car, 
that's when we start to reach the line. Anyway, we'll move on from what I'm sure is a riveting conversation about corner numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because qualifying's underway. And as mentioned, one shot qualifying. I love the pressure that it puts on the drivers. And we've talked to them before. They enjoy it as well. They feel that pressure. They thrive off it. And in the MX-5s, Shera Esports, Raphael Renhofer, 135-193. Currently, the best time that we have. I say currently because there are a couple of drivers hurrying around and trying to set lap times, including Kawanda Esports, who have just gone to 39th on the board. But you'll never guess who's driving. It's Elliot Veyron. <laughs> immediately jumping straight in. He'll have to get back up to speed pretty shortly here, uh, unless he's just decided that's going to be his one and only lap. It's, um, yeah, actually, it is his one and only lap. My apologies. Uh, forgot the qualifying was only <laughs> one lap. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big change to be made going from a high downforce, high stiffness American open wheeler to uh, basically a rookie sports car in the global Mazda MX-5 Cup. Much softer suspension. Um, you know, it, it tends to be a bit delayed uh, compared to the IndyCar on turn-in, but the MX-5 is such a wonder to drive. The, the chassis, it's so pointy, which is perfect for a circuit like this. 90 seconds left. We're not going to see any improvements because 40 times have been, 45 times have been set, and then everyone else has invalidated their one attempt at qualifying. And so... You've got Grin and Go down there. You've got uh, ATRS Esports down there. Was Cooking Racing Adventures. And then maybe most importantly, I think Race Clutch and Williams Esports. I will have to get confirmation on this, but I would not be shocked to see Williams Esports disqualified from this race because I saw Josh Ladd join with the wrong team. We'll have to see what happens. Uh -oh. It took like five races, Reese, for us to get to a race where there wasn't a team that joined incorrectly. It, it, it took a while to hit our marks. Yeah, I think I think that's just uh, par for the course when it comes to team sim racing events. You know, every time I've uh, called a race in a team endurance event, um, n not less one like this, it's uh, there's always been one or two teams that either join with the wrong number or the wrong team name, and it just messes things up. But you've got to keep it moving forward, especially for VCO Infinity. You're running to a tight schedule here. And uh, I was correct. The decision actually hasn't even gone into the race control sheet, but it does look as though we might end up with a disqualification for Williams, and that continues to bring big drama to the point as they run. This is going to be fascinating. Remember, after this, we've hit the halfway mark. 12 races down, 12 still left to go. Qualifying in the books, and it's the Shera Esports team on pole position. Of course, won the Porsche Esports Endurance Trophy in the... Uh, Nürburgring, digital Nürburgring Landstrack in series, beating out some of the world's best, of course, in a car that is very difficult to tame at a track that might be the most difficult track in the world to get to grips with. Here's how they'll line up. And again, we have a monster field to walk through, so we'll begin early and hope we can catch most of the storylines. Raphael Renhofer and Alter G Esports and James Baumey taking the fight to the big teams, locking out the front row by 39,000, splitting them. Ollie Steinbratten for red lines number 70, then is alongside with Elvis Rankin in the the Kawanda Esports machine. Cody Deeth, the young Australian in the grid and go car, has Pablo Espez alongside him as we get outside of one tenth from the pole time. Seventh for Josh Anderson, eighth for Josh Thompson. Beckham Jasir is ninth in the Williams Esports Academy car, not community car. And then Jaden Ladick for Drago Racing is on the edge of the top ten. Jose Soria, eleventh. Elias Riker, twelfth for the United Sim Team and BS Plus competition. Team PGZ, Lewis McLeod allegedly says they're the best team in the world. They're 13th, hopefully not unlucky here today with Apex Racing Academy and Patrick Thompson for company. Tia Kuzner for Visceral is alongside Javi Ross for Altus with Boris Avando for Precision Racing Esports sharing his row with Antoine Lacherite for WSR Esports butt kicker. Edge of the top 20 for Eclipse Simsport and Maniti Racing with Dale Charles Automotive by Majors Garage, Falcon Sim Racing Team, and then German Sim Racing.de and Team Fordzilla making up the front 12 rows. Still not even getting really to the halfway mark of this field as we hit Mavano Corsa and Rocket Simsport, 25th and 26th, Rincon Racing, and then STR Esports, 27th and 28th, with SMP Racing Esports alongside the Miranda's M Squad on row number 15. Project Valorous, Olympus Esports, 31st and 32nd, with XBD racing obsidian racing and then the apex racing team and wte pro gp some work to do from 35th and 36th 
Dutch League Racing and C uh, CRZ Simsport are 37th and 38th. <laughs> Elliot Veyron goes back-to-back -back races, but back in the field here in the MX-5. He's joined by the Kramer Racing Esports car on the back edge of the top 40. Absolute motor Motorsports Athlete, Symphony of Pistons, Esports, and then as we get through the top 42, West Competition Racing, Pike from Beach, and then Screen to Speed, the final time on the board. It will be Williams Esports 46th. Team Josh Ladd in 47. Not exactly sure exactly how they'll be ordered, but Was Cooking Racing Adventures, Race Clutch, Grid and Go, ATRS, Impulse, and Blue Rose Team will all for sure be in the field. Take a breath, Reese. Get through that field. Yeah. And oh, they're already rolling. I think you should take a breath, Arjuna. You managed to get all of them out just in time. As you were announcing the last cars, the pace truck was pulling away. So get up to speed as soon as you can. And look at how far back the field goes. By the time we go green, they'll only just be making their way through 10B. Shera Esport on pole position, and away we go. Green flag flies at Road Atlanta. And it looks like Shera Esport is going to keep it into turn one, but it's very close for second. Kawanda chasing down Redline on the inside. It's a great jump from Shera as well, but they were so disorganized behind that it's going to mean as we rise up towards turn three that the field's still really compressing back up and drivers building up speed. James Baumi a bit swarmed. Ole Steinbratten already up to second as through the S's single file they'll go with Oh, I'm trying to figure out how many cars within 10 seconds. 45 Mazda MX-5s. It's a glorious sight. <laughs> Halfway mark to be reached at the end of this 45 minutes of racing. Yeah, just say all of them. I think that's my... Oh, oh, there's, there was a problem there for someone coming up through the S's. It looks like DLR Sim Labs, Jean-Paul Seaman. He is uh, unfortunately uh, retired from the race there. Too much damage on that car as they're making their way through turn seven onto the back stretch. This is where the slipstream will come in. Compromised exit for James Bomey in the Altitude Esports car. He's got a draft train right alongside him and he could lose out coming into the last chicane. But look at how close it is for the lead. There's going to be some bump drafting, that's for sure. And Ollie Steinbratten will recognize that they could pull away from those behind if they work together. Oh, they're going to fan out three wide on the run down into turn 10A. Elvis Rankin leads that second pack. Cody Deeth alongside the Altitude Esports car who gets shoved out wide and loses yet another spot. Great qualifying for them but from second to fifth in the space of the opening lap. As down out of the final corner, it's a real plunge as well. More than 90 odd feet of elevation back towards the line Raphael Renhofer will lead and the expectation is going to be you don't need to lead any lap race except the final one yeah slipstream is so important in the MX-5 and if you make a pass early you're just going to be passed back in the slipstream so uh, you don't want to be leading coming onto the final lap you're going to have to fight tooth and nail to keep the position there uh, some big uh, losses down the field uh, not as big as I expected but it looks like uh, the likes of SMP Racing Esports Vasily Zaitsev is uh, down the order a bit down five spots uh, screen to speeds Nina Hahn unfortunately losing four spots on the first lap as well but I'm sure she'll get back up to speed in no time well these drivers at the front settling into the rhythm right now not much jockeying until you go back to 12th and 13th position where the Apex Racing Academy getting in front of Lewis Woods and oh it's all kicking off as Fordzilla's got the back end stepping out on them Abel Torres drops to 28th position the mid-pack where they're all just realizing that one by one they need to start picking their way through the field if they want any chance of working forward what is going on at turn seven though it's a parking lot a traffic jam four and five wide and they're all figuring it out amongst themselves and yeah, we saw Adam Brockway from Moradness M Squad spun there. He might have been involved in the incident that brought all of this together. I mean, it really is pack racing in the MX-5s. This is what you see at Daytona and Talladega and NASCAR, but it's on the road courses. Justin Rem in the grid and go car is going to protect the inside. Move from the inside by Timu Toika. Oh no! Oh dear! Big crash! Rem gets spun around. It looks like we already saw some cars spun around there. Absolute chaos! Back towards the front because, well, Kawanda lead. Elvis Rankin not handing, hanging around. Not only Steinbratten behind him. Raphael Renhofer has dropped to third. This is an intense race and suddenly the breakaways built up. These drivers recognize they're going to be seeing traffic and they're 
going to be plenty of replays, I'm sure, for us to work our way through one by one. But I think full focus needs to be kept in many ways towards this leading pack because at any moment, a moment of chaos, Reese could see the field split apart. Yeah, and we've already seen that happen a couple of times, haven't we? One incident can uh, cost a whole pack a few seconds, and that's the difference between sticking on to the lead pack and falling down the order. They're now all in a train. It's a bit like the freight trains I see down here in Australia, as there's probably a change for the locomotive up at the front of the train here. Elvis Rankin is going to have to make way for Oli Steinbraten. Team Red line up the inside and trying to take advantage of Shera Esports' Raphael Renhofer. Thing to remember is we will see the bump draft. You'll see the front end of these MX-5s get beaten in plenty, but don't get worried. They're not getting slowed down aerodynamically. That's not really important in these cars. They are fighting out of that final corner, which John alongside Cody Deeth, Josh Anderson, and then Beckham Jassir alongside behind them as well. But a big send, a big jing from Pablo Espez back to the inside as he puts the pressure onto the Altitude Esports driver. There's so much going on, all just one by one again, trying to make sure they're up towards the front of the field. This is a start, though, of a look at some replays. And that car was already going around, and it got a little shove just for good measure. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunate there for the uh, Dutch League Racing Simlab car. Further issues coming down through the S's for these cars here. Just a little tap to the rear right corner and around he went, but escapes damage for the time being. Meanwhile, this was at turn six. Oh, God. Well, that was whilst cooking racing adventures. Definitely not cooking anything Michelin star up oh, there. No. And wow, it's just clumsy is what it was. And race control's been very, very busy today. I have no doubt it's going to continue. These drivers then tangled with one another down at the chicane, but there was more drama in front of them as well. Uh, so let's pick up what happened to Antoine Lacherite on the outside here, who he just gets a little bit of a shove, a hip check, if you will. And then as the rest of the field comes on through, <laughs> that's what we ended up seeing yep indeed you know, spun across the racing line in the middle of a chicane where there's really only one line through that's uh, all that can happen meanwhile look at this three wide coming into the final corner and that's for third position on the road pablo espes managing to get himself to the front of that pack but then josh thompson will be Glad for a bit of slipstream here coming into turn one. He's going to try up the inside of Renhofer, who, remember, started on pole position for this race. He won't be too happy that he's falling down a little bit, but still in the fight. How many cars in this train? It goes back to 18th position right now. Have to be very, very careful. They don't end up fighting and letting anyone behind end up closing that margin. On the left side, by the way, it will cycle between the team names and the driver names. So you'll be able to figure out who is in what car at what point in time. We ride on board with Pablo Espez, who's tucked behind Ole Steinbraten. And look at those camera shots. Uh, now, I'm not saying they are separated at birth, identical twins, but, you know, one's <laughs> got a bit more curly hair. Glasses are quite similar, but uh, they could pass for brothers. I reckon they could. Maybe there'll be a bit of brotherly love between them in their efforts to make their way uh, to the finish in one piece. Have a look at the slipstream, though, for Pablo Espez. He can't actually go for the move up the inside. Steinbraten's going to go for it here on Elvis Rankin. And, oh, bit of a surprise there from Renhofer. He's going to try and get a move done here for third and possibly second. Just controls the rear end through the chicane. He's sent wide on the exit, though. That's going to lose him a couple more spots. These MX-5s are so nimble, and you can make these last-minute lunges, especially into what are longer braking zones, occasionally around the lap. We've got a, a mix of the short ones and the longer ones. Now, Espez recognizes he can't afford to hang around too much, went aggressive. He's going to have to defend from Thompson around the outside, though. That's a great just foresight from Thompson to recognize a chance would be there. Long way around up through turn three. It's not going to work for him, though. He does slide into fourth. Four positions gained so far today. And look at the fighting even further back. The Apex Racing Academy car at the front of a two-by-two -two train. Losing time on the entry to turn five. 
Patrick Thompson, though, manages to get the inside through turn five, uses the curb on the exit for maximum uh, run out of the corner. That's going to leave Lewis Woods, Luca Wunsch, Harvey Ross, all of these drivers in this pack fighting into turn six. A little bit of a breakaway now from Patrick Thompson. He'll be hoping to latch on to the top nine and try and move his way forward. And as you see this, look from up above, that corner tighter than 90 degrees. You just want to get on the power as early in as possible. The corner that leads to it, slightly cambered in, gives you a little bit of confidence to carry your entry speed and that momentum that these MX-5s are known for. They're going to go two by two at the front. Surely, though, Pablo Espez not going to pull out of line. Instead, gives a shot to the bumper of Steinbratten and pushes him forward to the lead in, the, in through the chicane. Thompson and Renhoff are fighting wheel to wheel once again. And Drago Racing and Jaden Ladick at the front of that queue behind. That's got to be very careful, Reese. They don't lose track of those drivers in front. Yeah, it's all well and good to be fighting in a pack, but you've got to keep an eye on the big picture. How far ahead are the leaders? Is there going to be a second or less to the car in front? Can I get the slipstream down the back stretch? Beckham Yassir currently working his way through here in ninth place. He's on the tail of this, uh, this front pack. He's got very close company, Elias Rijkaard. Josh Anderson, who uh, I know from uh, many Australian leagues, races Aussie racing cars in real life and was actually uh, the champion of that series. So there's a lot to play for here amongst many skilled drivers from all walks of life. Joining the party is Luca Wunsch. She takes to the grass to try and get this position here. But Patrick Thompson not allowing him onto the circuit. They make contact coming into turn six. And they managed to work themselves out just in time. That was a great little battle sequence. And it's not really cost them too much time either in the gaps to those up front. Back onto the back straightaway they run. Only 10 minutes burned in this 45-minute race. They are long races as well, uh, as much as they are sprints. You have to very much pace yourself and not necessarily the tires and fuel. Just make sure that you've got energy to give and to fight with at the very end of the race. The fight up front, though, that was Pablo Espez trying to get up the inside of Elvis Rankin, who's now down to third. Kawanda find themselves slightly boxed out in this situation, but it's just chopping and changing. You only need to lead one lap again, just to reiterate, and that's the run to the checkered flag. And in the real world, Reese, they have been side by side here in MX-5 Racing at the stripe. They have indeed. We're expecting more of the same here in the virtual world. It was a good move there by Pablo Espes. He uh, cut out of the draft early to get that move done. Elvis Rankin almost followed him. The leaders were almost three wide coming into 10A and 10B, but Rankin, I think, wisely backing out of that and realizing we've still got a long way to go in this race. A long, long race indeed with no pit stops again. That's the one fun thing about these cars in particular is they just have enough fuel to get us the, the 45 minute race length. It's uh, really only the, the Indy car and the Xfinity machines where we've been seeing the pit stops so far today. And when you do tend to have pit stops in these time limited races, sometimes you fall into that trap, don't you? Where just, just oh, it's a great camera shot. Uh, camera would be totally destroyed in the real world. Uh, but you, you reach this point where everyone's just saving fuel, trying to make the pit stop as short as possible. And so it's nice, Reese, to basically tell the drivers, no, pedal to the metal, just go for it. Yeah, that, and that's why we love MX-5 racing so much. You know, it's just flat out all the way to the end. Here we go then, bump draft uh, for Pablo Espes from Elvis Rankin, who's going to try and slot back in by the time they get to the apex. He certainly does. This is some really good racing. You know, um, like I said earlier, it's similar to the kind of racing you see on ovals. You'll have drivers lifting off in the draft. Yes, but it's not to save fuel. It's to just keep themselves in that position make sure that they maintain the draft for the rest of the run and at least they don't have to really deal with damage right i still remember when i saw these cars yeah. uh, at daytona for the first time this year in the real world when i saw the shots on tv of some of the bodywork damage that they have and then i compared them to what i remember seeing weston a workman in particular whose rear boot lid basically was dangling from the rear end for the entirety uh, that looked like something that may not be having too much of a performance impact, but race control eventually will get to a point where they'll tell you, come in and get that fixed. That's not safe for racing. Fortunately, 
where you don't necessarily have that unless you get a mechanical meatball. Look at the live points, though. Does show no changes inside of the top five. Not really getting much, uh, you know, necessarily compressed much either. Kawanda would, you know, get two points closer to the second of the red line cars, one point closer to the leading red line machine. It's more further down race where we're starting to see the chopping and changing from those that haven't been so consistent in the first 12 hours of VCO Infinity. Yeah, I remember seeing Altus Esports um, down in, I believe, 10th, and they're, they're still there, you know, um, currently on live points. It's, uh, yeah, down two. Uh, they were in eighth coming into the IndyCar race at Portimao, so they're going to have to keep themselves in the running here. There's a couple of Altus cars in this field, but they're not fighting at the front. Uh, Got to gotta go a long way down the field to see the first uh, Altus car, uh, Javi Ross, there in P16. And of course, for Altus, big news in that team manager, Simon Feigl, will be stepping down. Going to be interesting to see how the management of the team changes moving forward and how the team is going to continue going from strength to strength. We're not getting too excited, by the way about these fights and changes at the front because, well, it's like when you're at Daytona with uh, yeah. MX-5s, uh, Xfinity cars, Daytona, you know, NASCAR Cup cars, whatever it is. But every part, you're going to get a pass every lap for the lead. You don't have to get excited for every pass at the front either because, again, we're going to see so many of them. It's the move slightly further behind that maybe we should be paying more attention to. The drivers that are able to slowly piece, uh, pick their way and piece their way through the field. You called out Luca Vunch, 12 positions, sorry, 10 positions gained to 12th spot in that Falcon Sim Racing car. Yeah, indeed. Really good run up through the field from Luca. And he's he's playing it perfectly, isn't he? He's sticking in the slipstream. He's, he's keeping himself in the running. And every single time they get to a braking zone, he's usually right there to take advantage and just move up one more position. Just one more a lap, one more a lap, one more a lap. And by the end of the race, if he continues that momentum, he might be on course for a top five or better. The only reason why... I'm getting a bit more nervous now about the action towards the front. It's because we're seeing more side by side almost <laughs> in those podium spots. What once was battling on the edge of the top 10, slowly migrating itself further forward. There'll be two by two on the entry up into the climb at turn one, but it's all in the fight for fifth position momentarily three wide and altitude esports has to back out and james baumey then with a touch of understeer almost runs beckham to seer totally off the road it opens the seas for elias Riker to sail it up the inside along with Jaden ladick only the drago racing car able to make the move work though and down into the s's single file not just yet yeah, not just yet. Fortunately, MX-5s are able to run through this section side by side. You don't often see that. Bit of a bump between Bomi and Ladic. Meanwhile, Ladic gaining some damage to his front left. Uh, as you pointed out, Arjuna, it's not going to have much of an effect in these MX-5s, but still, he'll be rattled. He's still right in the midst of this pack, and they're swarming around him to try and take advantage like sharks around a piece of fish. I think the dangerous thing, right, is that gap that's built up in front of them. They do not want to lose touch of that leading pack. This is a replay for Boris Avando in the Precision Racing Esports car. That's him on the inside. Fordzilla on the outside. And well, what's going to happen here? Oh, they come over the crest and around they go. Oh, and heavy front end contact for Boris Avando. Hard luck for him there. We'll get another view of it to see where the contact actually happened. And ah, uh, this is just the nature of the track, isn't it? You're running side by side through there. The driver running alongside you will want to get online for turn three. It's just a, just a shame that it eventuated in the way it did. But three wide into the last corner. Let's go. It's not the three drivers on screen, but a couple of them are involved in the fight. We've got Luca Vunch, Patrick Thompson, and Mateus Kuzner on screen. And Kuzner just at the front of this shot is actually being able to gap a little bit. Patrick Thompson's alongside Javi Ross. You've got Jose Soria and Lewis Woods behind them too. I mean, again, just a reminder, if you're new to iRacing, the cars that you can choose to start with, get the MX-5s, there's, you know, Toyota GR86s, Formula Vs. This is the kind of racing that you can join and be, you know, part of on iRacing from day one. Indeed, rookie cars, the MX-5s, every single member will get access to them when they purchase a subscription. And I would uh, I would hazard a guess that at least a few of the drivers in this field started iRacing in these very cars. 
I did. I, I, I remember when I only effectively had the Skip Barber and the MX-5, really, when I was starting as the two baseline cars. Uh, those were the days. Now we have so much confirmation, by the way. Only thing I've seen from race control today in this race is that disqualification for Williams Esports outside of that. There's been incidents on track, don't get us wrong. Not much for them really to have gone through just yet. Focus at the front momentarily, about 20 minutes about to be complete. 12 laps about to be done as well. It's Wave Italy racing, Kawanda, Redline, Redline, Scherer and Grid and Go. The breakaway that tried, but the choo-choo train not pulling far enough in front and the guys behind getting their act together and closing that margin down once more. Yeah, you can really see the dichotomy between this chasing pack and the lead pack. The leaders are going side by side into a lot of these corners. They're dicing through every single braking zone, but the drivers from seventh place on back, they've settled down. They are in a line. They're working together to catch back up to them. And you see right there in turn three, side by side between Renhofer and uh, Steingraten has uh, brought them right back into the fold and the entire pack is now together. One thing I've actually kind of thought about is that we should run an MX-5 series where, Reese, the drivers are encouraged to talk over the radio with their competitors so that they can all plan yes. out what they're going to do because that's what MX-5 racing should be about. Indeed. Uh, would uh, actually add uh, quite a bit of a nice team aspect there. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a pretty good idea. Um, maybe uh, maybe run a, a radio channel in the broadcast as well for all of that. That would be interesting. Um, we'd, we probably wouldn't find much time to get our words in in between the drivers yelling at each other. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Get back behind. I'm not sure how much of that would be broadcastable either. But, you know, when you said team... Mm -hmm it made me think of roller derby and you know that kind of stuff where you have you'd have an mx5 that you have to protect and so what's the big pro trucks on i racing those would be like you know your your defender sort of vehicle we could come up with some real esports shenanigans oh you just let my mind oh, yeah. run run wild it's getting to that point of the night as well here on the west coast of the u.s still fighting up front but let's go back in time to look at the replay as well I'm guessing there's going to be some incidents based on the fact that we're almost four wide into the opening corner. Oh, oh. no. I always have such a visceral reaction when uh, cars are put into the wall there. Uh, just a case of three wide, cars coming together and you know, no time to react for any of those drivers. And again, well, almost found the gap in the wall, but uh, Road Atlanta being a very old school circuit, concrete walls surround the circuit. And uh, if something like this happens, then there's not much you can do to recover. Uh, me and Lewis McLeod have been slowly uh collaborating and on the idea of some track maps and uh and some track maps with some decent corner names uh getting rid of the idea of corner numbers uh, my tentative work in progress name for uh, turn number one don't be on the outside it's a great corner name it's very catchy yes yeah exactly i mean it's exactly what it says on the tin isn't it i think uh i think the uh, the run down to turn five could be called uh don't go side by side potentially <laughs> uh you'll be, you'll <laughs> love what i've actually so we, i've left the s's as the s's because that's the one good corner nick you know thing they've done at road atlanta from a track map perspective what i've done is on the exit of turn five or, or you know the well, turn five that's just called curb corner now it's just you know curb yes uh, we come out of the not a straight straight into turn 10 and then turn 11. I fixed that little bit of a, you know, corner number issue that they had there. And then down into the truss fall, back to the line. It's a great sequence of corner names. I love it. Yeah, I like it too. I think uh, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely get behind that. There's plenty of race tracks in the world that could do with some spicy corner names. What would you name the run into turn three here? Uh, I called it the 1X zone. The one egg zone. Yes, yes. I am. No, sorry. Uh, I have to correct myself. I renamed it. It was originally the one egg zone, and then I called it the one X triangle. Ah, yes. Both names work. Yes. I'm happy with that. I don't know where, why it is, but this is one of those tracks where I'll do 30 minutes of driving. I'll look at how many off tracks I have, and I'll be like, wait, how many times did I get an off track at turn three? <laughs> Every single lap, apparently. 
Indeed. Just just go wide in turn three and you won't have to worry about that, but you do lose a lot of speed. I'd, I'd love to know how many incidents these guys are on now. You know, I'm, I'm sure that pretty much everyone in the top 10, even the top 20, has gotten at least one off track at that third turn. It's one of those corners around here where, again, you need to use the curbs. It's the best line through the corner, but the 1X is brutal. Here comes, meanwhile, Pablo Espes to have another go at the lead of the race. Just tapping the brakes there in a straight line. He doesn't want to be in the lead, but second place wouldn't go astray. Yeah, it's, it's so much gamesmanship in these races as well. And it's why this is the stepping stone in many ways. Uh, we were debating the merits of the sports car and open wheel license on iRacing. And the fact that this is a sports car was kind of confusing to Lewis, but this is where people kind of you know step up from this you know they go from karting to road racing sometimes they'll go down the open wheeler track but if you're going road racing in in tin tops this is usually kind of those next steps once you get past the club amateur level racing when you're you know, can go and build a bmw or something and go and run it around in a, a local racing series then you go up to an organized spec championship it's very much a serious endeavor and the mazda scholarship has developed so many interesting drivers as well I get the feeling, though, if you aren't inside of the top 10 in the final 10 minutes of the race, you're not in contention for the win. Not to say everyone's thinking about the win. A position's worth a point. I might be happy to settle for fifth if I was a championship contender here. Yeah, I'd be happy to, especially with the lead that Redline continue to enjoy in the points there. I mean, uh, it's... it's it they, they, in fact, the top red line team could afford to finish outside the top 25 <laughs> and they would still keep the championship lead. But I, I think that they would rather uh, stay safe, stay in the top five, keep their way forward. Speaking of forward, someone's trying to make a move up the inside. It's Oli Steinbraten. Well, he is a part of team red line, isn't he? And got to keep an eye out for that. Cody Deeth, meanwhile. Uh, driving for grid and go he's got quite a bit of racing to work his way through here on the outside of the final turn not always the best place to be but he does have a little bit of slipstream from Steinbraten coming down the front straight and side by side into turn one it looks like they're about five deep there incredible stuff it's Noah's oh! Ark here is off the track oh no Luca James Vunch. Bomey spinning on the inside Luca Vunch oh! as well and it just continues Behind as both of those drivers just get tangled up with others as the rest descend down into the S's. It's become nine up towards the front, a big separation now through the field. Oh man, it just continued behind Arjuna. There was a massive pile up that's taken out about three cars, one of them being Luca Vonch for Falcon Sim Racing Team. There we go, he tries to make his way back onto the circuit, but he gets rear-ended by one of the Coanda cars as soon as he gets back on, and he's just playing ping pong from that point out. That's disastrous for Vonch. Remember how many positions he had gained. And Falcon Sim Racing were looking like contenders in the early stages, hasn't all gone to plan since then 18 minutes left to go and well 51 uh, ended up starting by the way we are dropping teams it would seem as we work through the night we might see some of them returning a little later maybe some of their drivers forgot their wake-up calls as those in europe begin to jump back into the cars 18 minutes to go should mean this time by according to my timing screen 11, maybe 12 laps to go. Three wide out of the final corner. Red line, third and fourth position. Thompson and Steinbratten swapping positions. Oli Steinbratten now getting a little bit uncomfortably dropping back through the field. Yeah, the top pack keeping themselves together. But, you know, as, as we saw from that big crash just a few moments ago, one mistake on the way out of turn one, one rub too far, and that will result in absolute disaster for you and many of the drivers behind you. So that's the impetus here for the, uh, the top drivers in the field to just give each other a little bit of space. Make sure that they don't race each other too hard. Keep it close, but don't overstep the mark. A couple of race control things to be looked at, and I've already seen uh, a penalty come through for the W2E Pro machine. And I see another incident being investigated between Precision Racing Esports Team Fordzilla and German Sim Racing. So have seen RG Bargy Racing 
And our race control team being kept up through the night as well and traffic up the road as a result of some of those incidents. Rankin very, very much trying to break a little bit of that slipstream initially as they work out of turn seven. Pablo Espes now with a bit more of a margin behind, doesn't go for the inside. Instead, Ole Steinbratt, and he would drop behind the Sherry Esports machine of Ra Raphael Renhofer. Wants to get back into the top four. Going to leave himself in a very compromised situation. Pushed out into the grass. Contact oh, no. with the Sherry car. And the championship leaders tangled up, but no major damage. Just down and outside of the top ten. Oh, it almost resulted in further drama for Renhofer. He re-entered the racetrack at uh, right angles to the racing line, and that almost ruined the race of uh, the drivers battling down in 16th and 17th. Once again, it's just a case of contact on the exit of a corner, right? You're shuffled wide, you're trying to get back onto the circuit, but the other drivers aren't willing to give an inch. I, and I... It's, it's, I'm not going to say there's no blame to be placed here, but as soon as... Steinbratten was on the outside and that wide out. I felt something bad was going to happen and Shara Esport didn't really have much choice. It's not like they had much room on the right hand side as the grid and go car took its opportunity. Very opportunistic driving from Cody Deeth, if we're being totally honest there. But one moment is not really going to change too much. But this is where we were saying a bad race for Redline is them finishing just inside of the top 10. This might be the first time today that 70 car is outside of the top 10 positions. Yeah, uh, definitely some great potential for that. The uh, that the, the car of Ole Steinbraten is uh, actually in 13th place right now. Uh, he would have gained some damage, but it doesn't seem like he's lost that much in the way of straight line speed. He doesn't have any slipstream benefit, though, from cars ahead. So it's going to be tough for him to get back into the top 10 from here. And so Josh Thompson takes on the mantle as lead red line driver, but the margin in the live points, you can see that in the top right corner of your screen, would be down to 10 between the red line teammates, and then only a further six back to Kawanda if Rankin were to hold on to the race lead and scoop up the maximum of the 55 points. Josh Thompson looking very animated as he talks onto the radio. I'm wondering what he would be talking about with his teammates with 14 minutes still left to go. Yeah, probably uh, a little bit of consolation for uh, the uh, the driver of the number 70, uh, Oli Steinbraten, and then focusing on how are we going to approach these last 14 minutes of the race. You know, for Josh Thompson, he's currently sitting in third spot behind Wave Italy and Coanda. Um, the best thing for him would be to hang back, just let the race play out, and then pounce on the final lap. But we've seen how opportunistic and aggressive Cody Deeth has been in this race. He could be a factor and uh, could actually throw quite a spanner into those works for Josh Thompson if that's what he's going for. And we do have that second pack as well. Let's just remind you that 14th on back, you want to follow along with them, go to timing.racebot.tv or germansimracing.de. Philip Koenig in front of Rocket Simsport Team PGZ and the rest of the drivers embroiled in that fight. But we're into now what I would assume these drivers feel are the closing stages. Business will pick up, laps will tick away, opportunities to get to the front starting to be minimized. 13 minutes ago, Pablo Espes back on top as down under the Fox Factory Bridge. Did he get loose with a little bit of a shove there? They are very much pushing the limit. I've seen that happen a couple of times. Bit of a slide for a car when they get contact from the rear. Deeth pulling out to have a little look at uh, Thompson there. Regardless, Espes and Rankin seem pretty comfortable here running in the top two. Seemed like Josh Thompson had lost out a bit coming out of 10A and 10B, but all the potential in the world for him to keep himself in the fight for the lead. It doesn't look like they're going to be facing lap, uh, lapped cars uh, for another few laps at least. Boris Ovando, who we saw have that heavy crash earlier, has gotten back out onto the racetrack. He's running all the way down in 41st, and you just saw him in the bottom of the frame there. He was about eight tenths slower last lap, so he's not losing too much time, but at some point he will be draft, and these drivers will enjoy the benefit of it at the very front of the field out of turn seven one more time 21 laps to be complete this time by and it should be eight to go at the line 
How many cars in this lead pack, you wonder? Well, we're down to 12. It's three seconds back to Ollie Steinbratten, who's just popped into the top end of your shot. He could still be a factor if the fighting ends up costing these drivers some time. Not going to fight too hard this time at the front. Instead, it's Fordzilla and Drago for eighth and ninth and a tenth position slightly further back that are really wheeling it. Thompson, though, puts the pressure on Espez, and they won't be three wide this time on corner exit. And instead, two by two, Elvis Rankin, couple of car lengths clear now as he breaks away to the line little free kick for him at the end of lap 21 but he's not going to have any slipstream benefit the drivers behind him will i think rankin might just be able to gain a bit more through this first half of the circuit but the moment they get back to the back straight these guys will have sorted themselves out hopefully and uh, they will catch right back up the draft range in this car around right around one and a half seconds or so so he only got about half the gap that he needed to. And even through a complex like this, these cars are just building speed everywhere, basically. So you can already see that gap bringing itself down as they use all of the track on offer on the very outside. There's the look on board with uh, not Beckham just here. Instead, it's uh, with Matteo Kuzner in the Mistral Esports machine that's tucked in behind the 77 car. And of course, don't forget, the only disqualification from this race due to incorrectly joining the session was the main Williams Esports team. So Williams Esports Academy, in many ways, find themselves flying the flag ninth in the overall championship. You can take a look at the points once again, top right of your screen. Yeah, the, uh, the gap for Team Redline at the front going down after the unfortunate runnings for Ole Steinbraten. So Redline will have to try and recover from that with some good performances in the next few races. But just as I said, down the back straight, the draft for the pack has caught them back up to Elvis Rankin. Fighting a bit further back, Eclipse Simsports, Jamie Christensen. Eclipse Simsports, an Australian team who we've seen competing in many of the Australian leagues over the years. Nice to see them uh, here in VCO Infinity. They'll try and catch up to this pack, but at the moment, it seems like there's just too much of a gap. They'll have to try and make up some time here through the twisties. I think they're relying on Jaden Ladick in many ways to be the bridge to close them back up to Abel Torres in ninth spot as your leaders just continuing to ride as they are. It is 12th of 24 races here in VCO Infinity. Um, a couple more decisions have come down from race control over the course of what has, let's be honest, been a very, very interesting race. Here's a look at those decisions. First up, it's five seconds, as mentioned, for W2 ePro GP. Not the only drivers to get five-second time, uh, time penalties, which get added at the end of the race. German Sim Racing as well. Same thing has ended up happening for Fordzilla. Now, the German Sim Racing penalty and the Fordzilla penalty Actually, for the same incident, Reese, the poor Precision Racing Esports car got hit by both of them basically at the same time. So two independent penalties, poor Precision Racing Esports. What more can they do? Yeah, indeed. It's, uh, it's a real shame, isn't it? Uh, two penalties for the same incident, but just goes to show how close the racing is in these MX-5s that uh, we get incidences like that. Look at the run up the inside from Elias Riker, the PS Plus competition car, making it three wide with Josh Thompson and Cody Deeth, has just gained two spots from that and is now in the top three. It will be five to go, it's maybe six to go, depending on how slow they end up going. Uh, other way around, confusing myself in terms of times. Rise in towards turn three, Espez on the inside. There was a big moment there for Kuzner in the Visceral Esports machine. He drops back in line to eighth position. Rankin holds on at the front, but this is what we were saying with business picking up, Reese. They're running out of chances to make the moves happen. And from this point, like I was saying earlier, if you're not in the top 10, you don't really have a chance of being up there towards the front. Yeah, with 10 minutes to go now, seven and a half. Now is the time that you have to be positioning yourself in the top five, even the top three. And that's exactly what Elias Riker has done running in third place right now. He can keep Pablo Espes and Elvis Rankin in his firing range. And uh, if he can keep Josh Thompson behind him, then it's going to be a great chance at a win here for BS Plus competition. They're edging ever closer to the lapped cars ahead. Still a good gap to Boris Evando and Emil Winbo for Project Valorous. But I think uh, 
mm, it could be right at the end that we see them come together. Espez still holding on to the lead. Riker trying to have a run at second place here. Space is given by Elvis Rankin and falling back again. There goes Cody Deeth. Now it's the 77's turn to run up the inside. Benjamin Beckham Yassir for Williams Esports Academy. Jumping himself up into the top four. Elias Riker just made the wrong decision and now finds himself as the second of the BS cars. It's the red machine. It's worked up a couple more spots. I do feel as though there's three drivers that have really been up there and fighting. Espez, Rankin, and Thompson. Everyone else has been back and forth, not able to assert themselves at the front. And so, do they have a bit more confidence in being willing to make aggressive moves? Will that be the detriment of them? It's one of those situations where they've really got to make the right decisions now because we saw how simple it was. Steinbratten wasn't doing anything wrong, but placed himself on the outside and ended up making that little bit of contact that cost him dearly. From this point, though, every move does count because Riker was fighting for second. Now he's fighting to get back to sixth and one by one work his way through the field. Back out of turn seven, power on just working through that sequential gearbox. Of course, no longer an H pattern for these drivers to have to manually blip their way through as well down the gears too. It's just a slightly more modern race car than the one that debuted on iRacing all those years ago. Gonna see some pushing slightly further behind, but Elvis Rankin has got no help until the Williams Esports Academy car joins him up the inside. New race leader as Kawanda slides its way on forward. Beckham Jasir is gonna try and compromise Joss Thompson, although Cody Neath has made his way up his inside as well. And that's what I was talking about with decisions. Looking forward, now having to look rearwards as well. Yeah, the entire race up to this point was a setup for what we're seeing now. Five minutes remaining on the clock. Espez back up the inside of turn one is going to take the lead back from Elvis Rankin. Josh Thompson now having a run at second. He'll have the inside for turn three. Just enough space for Espez to regain the lead and he gains a tiny bit of breathing room as second and third are still side by side. Thompson was a little bit unsettled on that curb through turn three, but that's where the aggression plays its part. He slams the door shut on Rankin and through turn five, a couple of cars running out into the gravel. Don't know if it cost them too much momentum. Yeah, as long as you're keeping up momentum at the mid corner, you can generally carry it through at exit in the MX-5 unless you find the wall or thereabouts, as we've seen for plenty of drivers here today. Out of turn seven, down the back stretch, it is time once more to see how the benefit of the slipstream works. There's going to be bump drafting, I think. Actually, no, Elvis Rankin pulling out on Josh Thompson. I would have expected him to just stick behind and bump draft him up to the lead. So it's three to go next time by. Does he want to just get a little bit closer to Espez and make the move in the maybe final two laps? You don't want to move too early. Thompson's not making life easy, though. Great look from up above. Rankin holds on. Here comes Cody D to push uh, Thompson out wide as well. Beckham Jasir is going to force the issue and give the uh, virtual coach liveried machine a little bit more speed down and out of the hill. And now another position may be lost for Thompson as the Williams Esports Academy car slides its way on through. All right, three to go. Pablo Espez leading by a mere half a second over the rest of this very angry pack. The intent is rising. The flames are rising in the background. Will we see the bomb eventually explode? I think we're going to be seeing at least one big incident happen in the final couple of laps. Meanwhile, a bit of time lost for uh, the likes of Josh Anderson, uh, currently in sixth and everyone back. But again, they'll have the chance down the back straight to catch back up. I'm amazed at how wide they're running through Curb Corner. It's it's just incredible the amount of, uh, of off-track running you can get through there. But they're going even beyond that into the gravel. They want this so badly. And I guess that is acceptable, right? They've saved up enough off-tracks. Off they feel as though it's not compromising them in speed too much. Again, they're... I'm sure they've been doing some practice. The tracks were announced on Monday and the setups as well. So the teams figured out which driver they wanted to place in each race to get the most from the speed, to get the schedule aligned so people can go and get some rest, get some food, whatever they need to do in between each of the races. But uh, from there, you then just get to the grip, uh, task of getting to grips with what you have underneath you. I am shocked. Coming back to take what will be two to go, 
No moves made into the chicane for your leading pack. And we still haven't caught up to that lap traffic, Reese. This is a really fascinating battle. And Pablo Espez has been caught as we cross the line. Elvis Rankin jinking to his inside. They'll be side by side on the climb through the opening corner with a new race leader. Yeah, now this here for Rankin taking the lead. This is probably a setup for the final lap. He'll expect to be passed by Espes or Deeth. And, oh, speaking of Deeth, getting onto the grass and the curb. He's going to fall now behind Thompson, it seems. Josh Thompson getting the inside there. Um, it's all set up, isn't it? Rankin leads this lap. He might not lead the next one, but then he has a chance to get back into the lead on the final lap. You have to think about alternating from the lead and from following when you're in a pack like this. And it's why, you know, I always love during the Indy 500, the switching back and forth. It comes to an end eventually when one driver realizes, wait, if we keep doing it at this rhythm, I'm the one that's going to end up losing out. And it's one of those yeah. big brain moments where everyone goes, oh, wait, how do I go slow now and let everyone pass me by? Down into the chicane for the penultimate time. Wave Italy pulling to the left-hand side. Kawanda pull to the right. This is all the gamesmanship, though, about being in the right place at the right time. Elvis Rankin is going to be the one that leads us at the white flag. MX5s at Road Atlanta have delivered so far. Halfway through VCO Infinity, who wins the 12th race in 24? We will find out in about 90 seconds time as they come down to the final corner to begin the 29th and final lap of this race. There's Barney doing his job as always. Aggressive dive to the inside from Espes, but he's, I think that's psychological. He's trying to unsettle Elvis Rankin. He's trying to get him down the order so that he doesn't have a chance to fight. And again, if you lead out of turn seven, are you going to be hung out to dry by those behind you? There are three drivers right now, second, third, and fourth, all looking very calm. They won't be so calm when they get onto the power out of turn seven, when they realize if they've done enough or not. Out of turn five, looks pretty mistake free from our top five, still looking at the drivers further back. This is Cody Deeth, I believe, we're looking at uh, from uh, behind Josh Thompson. This is the crucial braking zone here. Nail the exit. Try not to get too much oversteer. Carry the momentum onto the straight. Now this is where the money is made. And how do you time your run with the draft? You saw Espes for a moment slide out and then slide back in. He's got Beckham Jasir, who's going to give him that shove that he was waiting for. And Jasir might not even get his chance to take it three wide on the run down into the chicane. It's been a great race from Pablo Espes to be at the front to control the tempo for so long. He's just got one more corner to hold on. Oh, deep, deep onto the brakes as from behind. Contact and red line take avoiding action, but winning here at Road Atlanta with all the drama behind and some championship implications. Pablo Espes is going to explode with relief as he crosses the line, a winner in VCO Infinity. You can see the intensity of the race on Pablo Espez's face, but then the happiness comes. He's just taken maximum points for Team Redline. My goodness, what a finish. And there was a huge crash behind the leaders when uh, when we came to the line. It looks like Cody Deeth just completely lost it coming over the hill after that contact with Josh Thompson. And that involved a few more cars besides. We've got plenty of, uh, of Bedlam coming up to the finish line here. Yeah, we'll take a look at that replay as well because, you know, full focus on a race winner that deserves his moment in the shine. Let's take a look at what happened behind before we grab a look at the race results and talk us through this race chaos into that chicane. So Cody Deeth went for a very aggressive maneuver here, but he ran too deep. Josh Thompson tried to turn in, but Deeth was there. Spin for the Coanda Sim Sports car. Deeth trying desperately to get back onto the racetrack, but unfortunately gets tagged from behind and sent airborne. And the rest of the field coming over the hill have no idea. Further contact at the bottom of the hill oh. there. That's disaster. And, th okay, uh, we need to watch oh. that again just for the rejoin from Team Fordzilla. So just watch at the top here. Now, Grid and Go had their car broken suspension-wise. Fordzilla's trying to light it up and directly drives into the path of German Sim Racing who get mounted on top of Altitude Esports. I'm sure there's going to be some frustration there. The wrecking continued on the run towards the line, but 
Well, 12 races done, 12 races still left to go, and it is a new race winner here in VCO Infinity in 2024. Congratulations to Pablo Espes and to the Wave Italy Racing Team. We'll grab a look at the race results, and then we'll get ready to wrap up our thoughts from this first half of the 24 hours of action. 89 thousandths between Wave Italy and Williams Esports Academy. Pablo Espes judged that to perfection, while BS Competition, third and fifth for them, sandwiching the Drago Racing Driver of Jaden Ladick. Eclipse Simsport, sixth for them. Great drive through the field along with Visceral, and then the Team Redline entries to eighth and ninth. But again, if it's a bad day for Redline, bad race for Redline, and they're still in the top 10, they're just having all the luck go their way. Elvis Rankin ends up in 10th. He'll be a little bit frustrated with that, I'm sure. And then Shero Esports, Altitude, Rocket, Rincon Racing, Delatraz Automotive, Team PGZ, Maniti, SP, United Sims Team, Jose Soria tangled up in that chaos through the final corner, still classified in front of Cody Deeth. We'll look through the rest of these names, but Reese, my word, two hours with you has absolutely flown on by. And unfortunately, it's now time for you to say goodbye to VCO Infinity. What have you thought, though, about the two races that we've just seen? Because if we had to do that, you know, just two commentators for 24 <laughs> hours, oh, we'd have no voice by the end of it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm already losing my voice, to be honest, Arjuna. The, the amount of action that I've seen in the last two hours, good enough for four hours of regular racing. It's just amazing to see how uh, how, how incredible the, the racing has been, both in IndyCar and in MX-5. The intensity has been so high. You know, some of the best sim drivers in the world all competing for that crown here in VCO Infinity and uh, two different, very different styles of racing as well. Um, I have to say big congratulations to Wave Italy for finally getting one on the board there. They played that game perfectly. And uh, I can't wait to see who eventually comes away with the title here. And every position being a point at the end of the day, right, means that every position really does mean something. And so that's why we'll see plenty of fighting. And we got to see the Indy cars at Algarve. And next up, we're going back to Portimao, but this time with the GT3 machines, which is going to be quite interesting, right? Because it's not an unfamiliar combo. They do race GT3 cars there quite a bit, but it's got that interesting mix of slow, medium, and high-speed corners that really demand a lot from the car. And the drivers are going to then have to get to grips with the fixed setup that they're all dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fixed setups. I mean, um, you know, I'm sure that they'll be able to adapt, though. You know, the, the, these guys are, are competitive and, and racing professionally for a reason, aren't they? I'm sure they'll be able to get used to it, but I'm expecting lots more uh, very intense action. Probably uh, not quite the same as what we saw in the IndyCar race at Portimao, but I think definitely some big sends. They'll be uh, they'll be using the ABS quite a lot, I think, into turn one. I'll be honest in saying, I actually don't know if we're going to get rain. When we came here, or when we went to Portimao with the SF lights, Super Formula lights, the only other car in VCO Infinity which is rain enabled, we did get a lot of rain changing conditions that Alex Dunn and Chris Lullum really mastered and put on a show. But don't go anywhere. 12 races down, 12 still left to go here for VCO Infinity. We'll be right back with the back half of this event. Feel the pulse ride, it's all so quick. Each team screams so vivid and thick. Lights up, game on, the virtual grid set me, CO Infinity, where the champions are at, 24 races, round the clock thrills, 55 teams battle with skills to kill, striving for glory, chasing the lead, every team's aiming to take this speed, five cars, five tracks, pure adrenaline seems, racing through combos in the sim machine, race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop, feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick, each team Against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team screams so vivid and thin. Through digital bands, under virtual skies, he slapped the challenges, time flies. Decisional point tactics so fine. Every race.
Texas goal is to cross that line. 24 combos, the challenge is real. In sim racing battles, only one will seal. Team Red Lines, the mark, the crown is still. In this relentless pursuit on the virtual wheel. The night wears on. Race against the clock, 24 hours. The action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Race against the clock, 24 hours. The action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Lights up, game on, the virtual grid set, VCO, infinity, when the champions are met, 24 races, round the clock thrills, 55 teams battle with skills to kill, striving for glory, chasing the lead, every team's aiming to take this speed, five cars, five tracks, pure adrenaline scenes, racing through combos in the sim machine, race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop, feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick, each team Against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. The digital bands under virtual skies, he's like. Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome back to VCO Infinity. 12 races done, 12 still left to go. And boy, what an event it has been so far. Our Juno Kanki party joined alongside by Justin Prince as we get ready to go. And JP, I still remember that you've seen some of the wildest moments in VCO Infinity. Uh, you were there when we saw the almost crash on pit entry in Monza. I think you were there when we saw the car upside down at Daytona finishing its race as well, right? This event has just been bonkers. And this year, we've been away for a full calendar year. It's been even wilder for some reason. Yeah, I think it's just down to the intensity levels, but also the different combinations. And as well, you're talking about the intensity levels of the field as a whole. Just take, for example, the Dynamics 5 race. You're talking about the mix we've seen, like Pablo Espez, one of the longtime series veterans for that car, battling against one of his old rivals from a half a decade ago while was ranking for the league scene. It was an exciting one. But now it's the matter of just settle in get the points focus on trying to close up up front because it's been intense so far it only gets more intense as the night goes on all right i just want to say as well points are still technically unofficial so we are waiting for them to be finalized and we'll talk about live point updates as soon as we get them in the race itself qualifying by the way really been enjoying this one lap pressure that the drivers have been thrown into there's really not much room for them to make mistakes to make the small slip ups that sometimes you see even at the top level of sim racing and jp small margins in qualifying once again one second splitting 33 of the 50 cars with times on the board and for a racetrack like this it's not a surprise to see the time so close and so tied up at the top but it's going to be interesting to see, though, who's going to be able to try and break things up amongst what we've seen so far for the GT machines and, in turn, what we've seen for those standings in the previous couple of hours, keeping track of how Redline and company have gone. But it's about being able to conquer a racetrack that's newer on the platform as of late, but also it's about trying to make sure you get the passes done right because this is one of the newest tracks on the entire planet from 2008 that's going to have a lot of opportunities in that opening sector that Reese touched upon for Sens. So let's take a look at how they'll line up. And Alex Dunn has been able to master Portugal once again. 142.686 and 55 thousandths quicker than Johnny Vecchio, who gets into the red line Ferrari. Ricardo Rico lines up alongside uh, Pike from Beach Racing and race winner in VCO Infinity already today. Martin Cadillac with Nicholas Lasht and Jesse Jones with Miniti and Falcon Sim Racing on row number three. It's Grid and Go and Altus on row four with Was Cooking Racing Adventures and WSR Esports Buckkicker lining up on the edge of the top 10. Best qualifying effort out of Sean Campbell for the race clutch team so far, at least from memory. He's alongside Sven Haase in that Grid and Go machine. Another driver looking to 
to go and win yet another race. Parker White from 13th has Rasmus Tormanen in the Blue Rose team machine alongside for company with Xander Reed and Pedro Sanchez Albert, 15th and 16th. Got to roll through the grid because they're rolling on their formation lap, uh, lap, excuse me. Team PGZ, Apex Racing Academy, and Guillaume Levesque. Uh, 18th and 19th, Eclipse Simsport and Team Redline. Some work to do for Nassau from 20th with Bobby Zelensky for Kowanda, Ricardo Ferreira for Brabham and then Dutch League Racing and Scherer through your top 24. We'll scroll through the rest of your names right now as we get into the mid and back half of your field. JP, it's a close margin in qualifying, but what we ended up seeing at Portimao with the changing conditions with rain was that dri drivers were very much making mistakes and slipping up. Now that it's dry, not expecting that much level of chaos, but in these GT3 cars as well, was talking about it with Reese. Medium, high speed, and low speed corners. There's a little bit of everything for the drivers to get to grips with. It's a good amount of balance, but remember, fixed setup first of all, so you don't have that plain disadvantage or separation of setup being the main benefactor, but it's more so about the driver skill. Track position, honestly, going to be extremely critical throughout a race like this today. In other words, if you're amongst those outside of the top 15, I'll say it's going to be difficult to be at the top of the pylon by the end of this race. It's going to be a lot of pressure, though, for Nezo. That is shocking for one of the red line cars to be deep in the field. And, you know, he was up towards the front and qualifying here in that SF light race. And it's where we did see the drama where he was spun through turn one, had to fight his way back through the field and put himself into the top 10. We've seen that in the past from the red line drivers. They have that strength of mind that when things don't go their way, they're going to fight back and put themselves back where they need to be. I'm getting nervous right now, JP, but the back half of VCO Infinity, I'm sure the drivers are tired right now. We're 12 hours into a 24-hour affair. But you have to be able to keep the energy levels up, to say the very least. There's already been a lot of uses of the Joker by some of the teams in the next couple hours alone with some of the fatigue levels, but also the tightness of the point battles. This run through Gelb up to the front straightaway is going to be critical in the race. Keep an eye on it as the night goes on. Pace truck is off and away. That is a very, very American pace truck as well. But the engines will build. We're racing once again for race 13 and 24. We've unleashed the Ferrari 296 GT3s here at Circuit Algarve as we made our way to Portugal. Down in towards the opening corner. Plenty of dust being kicked off off the racing line as drivers fan themselves out through the opening corner. And it's going to be onto the brakes heavily into the very, very tight hairpin. It's three wide for fourth position. And a car gets tagged and turned around. It's going to cause chaos and red line get tangled up in it. It was Alexi Nesov that had to take avoiding action. Not sure if there was more. Johnny Vecchio, though, runs behind Alex Dunn. Ricardo Rico, third. Three cars trying to stretch their legs. And just seeing how things were looking before we started off the race and with the amount of elevation changes, not a shock to see the drivers crash in Lagos there with the hard braking section for sector one here. That is absolutely stunning. But what can you say? It's middle of the night. It's time to get very crazy when it comes to the incident. And that's going to shake up a lot of the points possibly by the end of the race. And I think if you are any of these drivers up front, you will be getting told in your ear, don't force the issue now, settle in. There's how the points are looking live in the situation with the last race being factored in. It is still the red line number 70 that leads. Its margin still 10 points over the driver, uh, the sister red line machine that now runs up in second. And with Kawanda somewhat struggling, Xander Reed down uh, in eighth position, the other Kowanda car even further down through the field. I get the sense that this race is going to see a bit of a shakeup in the points once again, especially since more drama. There's Sherry Esports wiggling all over the track. And the timing screen's telling me that Kowanda and Bobby Zelensky off the track and going very, very slowly. There they are. Yet yeah, that is not good because we've just seen the live points before. That was the car that needed to have a good run. For Bobby Solinski, he's going to be absolutely not happy in that cockpit because it's going very bad, knowing there's a chance to build up points, and it's gone everything but that. They've lost points with the chaos. And it's still going on further down through the field. It's the Wave Italy racing team. It's Eclipse Sim Sports who take the toe back to pit lane. Is that them done and dusted? Big Sen being 
thrown by Parker White. Sven Haase, though, takes it three wide. Oh, Sindre sets us on the outside. He gets absolutely bullied, but he's not balking. There'll still be three wide on the run into the right-hander, but Setsource gets chopped off the nose. Parker White loses out to Sven Haase. Oh, I mean, if this is what we're in for for the another, another 12 hours of racing, I think Redline going to waltz away at the front. Well, you're saying that as Apex Racing teams up at the very front of the field, but I'm not surprised to see moves by Sven Hasse right now in the heart of the field like this because he's been someone we've seen try and cook up moves like that, as was cooking also does the same type of move. You got to move. Quite simply, you've got to move if you want a true shot. You can't just ride. You got to move to be able to get up front. For Sven Hasse and company, it's been crazy. So that was the Pikes from Beach team that got turned around. Maniti as well. And then stricken in the middle of the track. I mean, that shot tells you all that you really need to know. Very, very clumsy. Very, very uncomfortable. Let's jump on board with Dominic Olivier in the Precision Racing Esports car. He goes out wide to try and take avoiding action through all of that. But, I mean, what can you really do through that situation? Just so much going on. You've got cars stuck in the sand trap even, so it's like, what do you even do? It's at that point where there was no right choice other than maybe press on the brakes and hope for the best. It was just pick and choose a line, and then you have on top of it just all this carnage. Just where do you go? Remember this where Zelensky and company was? Just got clipped at the last moment, and that's got some ramifications for later. Yeah, you can see him off on the left. I mean, it's just, it looks so innocent as well. Can't really even ne necessarily, you know, piece and place any blame on these opening laps. You know, drivers getting the tires up to temperature. W2 Pro, Fordzilla maybe already starting to get a bit of a tank slapper before they even got to the corner, so... I mean, there's so much going on, and yeah, then there's the aftermath, the cars on the outside. Let's ride on board with Maniti and get a sense for what they ended up seeing. Yeah, they look like already maybe pushing a little bit. Right about here is where Carnage comes. See the crossover in the mirror, and then bam. Just may have got it maybe in terms of the virtual mirror. No idea what was going to happen there, possibly in the cockpit. And then down to turn one, the fast right-hander, Dylan Burst and Wave Italy. Now, is that two separate incidents? Because Wave Italy go around, and Dylan Burst isn't even in shot. Yeah, I'm curious on that maybe. Oh, that's something else I that's think, wrong with that car. Yeah, that has to be from one of the several big ones there. But that form of the incident from the Wave Italy machine, that was more so self-inflicted because, again, downhill into the braking zone as soon as you're down the ovation, if you go too fast and... In that case, try and go inside. You might very likely bounce off just like that with a sharp right-hander like that. Here's a look at your leading drivers. Alex Dunn, Johnny Vecchio, and Ricardo Rico, all separated by just under a second as they build their gap to Jesse Jones, former two-wheel racer in the real world, racing for Falcon Sim Racing under the Door Esports banner, of course, that powers that team. You can see the focus on Alex Dunn's face as they work through that tight right hander up the hill and then plunging down all of that elevation change that continually changes how the car's weight's moving around the surface of the track. Vecchio's keeping your race leader honest as well. He's keeping himself very much, not just within touching distance, but occasionally, JP, closing right back up to the rear wing. You know what I find most intriguing? You have first and third that are basically, I'm pushing as hard as possible. You can tell it through the face. They're on the edge of intensity. Then you have Vecchio's like, oh, this is Sunday drive. I'm just waiting for my right time to go. I'm just going to set it up and wait for later. Vecchio seems like the calmest out of anybody. I know it's because of what you see on the live standings, maybe, but that's kind of a big thing when you can keep your cool in the pack like that. No, exactly, right? When you have that confidence, it can help you. But, oh, dropping Never down mind. the timing screen. And now, oh. Flipping back to the front. Take a sigh of relief, all Redline fans. Johnny Vecchio's internet was going to get a shouting at if it had dropped. We'll focus on the drivers that were watching instead. You can see Jesse Jones in the Falcon Sim Racing shirt. You can see Sean Campbell, smile on his face, Nicolas Cage watching over his shoulder. And then for Yano Cock in the Grin and Go machine, we can see his hat. 
Well, you can also see his biggest fan is just to, to the right of his face, on his side at least. What can you say? Air circulation's important. But you can also see just dialed in, trying to follow the motions. This is a very windy racetrack with those multiple different combinations of circuits. And there's a reason in the open wheel side, fans were elated to see a track like this on the schedule. Because it's one of the more unique ones, not just because of the corners, but because you're basically climbing up and down a mountainside around this racetrack. Um... You're saying if that's that, the better way to phrase it. No, I definitely understand what you're saying, but to, just to clarify the other thing that you said, people are happy with the choice of Portimao, just to be, make sure I understood you correctly? There was during the open wheel side as well. There you go. I, I just wanted to make sure I'll, I'll, you know, make sure I'm happy. Yep. What The Rock would say, uh, what can I say except uh, you're welcome for that choice of track. And uh, yes, Sven Hasa, by the way, he's another one that's got a fan watching over his shoulder. He's got Loke Rabier for Team PGZ in front of him, Parker White behind him, but maybe more significantly, directly behind these drivers, Alexei Nesov in that Team Redline car, back up to 12th already. Eight positions gained through all the chaos. Yeah, not a surprise to see the push forward here from Spin in particular. Look uh, at him, he's, uh, race, he's wearing his racing uh, suit. Yeah, he, yeah, that's very spiffy indeed. Oh, it's not a racing I, suit, never mind. It's just a shirt that looks like it, a racing it, suit. It's still spiffy because, again, that's custom made per se, you can say, when it comes to a uniform like that. But it's just a bunch of those just saying, I've got to go, I've got to push. Remember, Nesov lost a lot of the time. He very much likely would have needed for later on. But look at that pace difference. He's gaining a couple tenths per corner in traffic. That's big for later. The one lap qualifying dropped him back in the field, and he's having to fight his way forward. He's, of course, wearing that Mad Panda Motorsports shirt after he competed with them in a handful of GT3 races, including the 24 Hours of Spa last year. Also, of course, in the world of uh, SRO, where racing teams are encouraged and invited to compete in a virtual sim racing series during each of the real racing weekends for real points he went and added some value as well there he watches in front though as Fen Haasa lunges up the inside of team PGZ and no second doubts there makes the move stick gets up to ninth place really great move just finding this time right now starting to have a little bit of falls coming to point just the touch bit with the fixed set it's to where you just need to be smart on these moves because look at the difference. Right now, if they work together, they can get up to the Quanta car, then leapfrog from there because that opens up the door to Altus, and then it gets interesting if they can close up to six on four. If you're battling back and forth like a wrestling match, it's not going to be helpful. Give credit, though, to the Williams Esports machine, Parker White. He has kind of had an interesting career path. He went from building his open oval skills as a driver in the c fix series making a run of road to pro picking up a team on that side then picking up the road side and then basically becoming better at the road side arguably than he did on the oval side and he won the xfinity race that we had at monza just walking away from the field did see that they all got a free spot because there was maybe for the first time today it's not been a common penalty by any means but Simone Mir Marceno in the Altus Esports 43 drive through penalty, and that is a penalty that must be served in the race itself. There's the time penalties which get added on post race. No, that is a direct penalty, and very much race control saying there was something that warranted that time being spent trundling down pit lane. Focus on your leaders who still three cars, 1.2 seconds up, up between all of them. Now, three odd seconds clear of Jesse Jones in that Falcon Sim Racing car. So, if you are any of these drivers, you know you're not going to make a pit stop in this race, JP. You've got the gap behind. I think at some point we'll start to see the fight. I think you'll start to really see the fight when the thought comes into mind, okay, we're not going to gain the spots unless I find a way around here. I've got to figure out a way to get around fast. For Vecchio, not so urgent because they've already ditched Rico just about here by a second. For Vecchio, I think he's just making sure not to burn up the tires or just at least keep them underneath because you don't want to end up being push, 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 and then you, all of a sudden you drop back because you burned up so much so early. 
These are tires that, you know, they go through so many iterations as well, the GT3 cars on iRacing. There's been times when you can only single stint them, times when you could double, triple, quad stint them, and you know, they're basically always trying to, to figure them out. The one complaint that many have, including yours truly, is tires and fuel always should be done separately in pit stops just to add a little bit more strategy uh, element to, to everything that happens. But uh, it's not how it works in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Our racing's line, the GT3 cars and the GTP and LMP2 cars, of course, up with that rule set. And so tire change is done at the same time as your fuel. And off and away you will go, albeit in the real world, you do have the limited tire sets that keep things just that little bit closer. A little bit further back in the field, Williams Esports Academy, Jersey Glack in front of SP Racing Esports, Delatraz Automotive, and then the Moradness M Squad and BS Competition all fighting here just inside of the top 20. And at this point, this is where you're really going to start to see people say, what's patience? I like positions because you have nothing else to lose at this point. Hence the big send there for the 89 machine. You kind of don't have the benefit of good track position or good positioning to say, I can be a bit more patient. I'm in a good spot. If you want to be in a good spot by the checkered, you need to go. And quite simply, a lot of these drivers are going to be pretty aggressive here to be able to get that done. A lot of slidey slide, though, starting to notice from the SMP machine. Some of these drivers starting to have a bit of a battle almost with the grip. And uh, there is definitely some damage to the left rear of Dmitry Kovanov's machine. And I wonder if that is part of the issue. You can see him and Roman uh, Bokler, who gets the move done in the Delatraz automotive machine, works his way on forward. Love the wraparound perspective that you see for Dmitry Kovanov on the bottom right corner as well with those screens that just give him a little bit more of a warped perspective. He didn't turn himself on the nose of uh, Alessandro Torquio in the Moranis M Squad machine either so had just enough vision to be able to place his car where he needed to albeit losing another spot to Reina Talvar just in front of him. This is all again some strong teams with some work to do. And closing in on Brabham Esports, Ricardo Ferreira a bit of a cork in the bottle. Sindre Setsos tucked up behind Five and a half seconds, the margin up the road. Kind of going back and forth, though. Remember, what's cooking had been up into that 12th position earlier on. Just looking at some of the differences perspective. In one hand, you have, it's nighttime. You're racing in pitch black. Your monitors, you're late. On the other hand, in the case of Sentes, you are basically racing like it's early morning and flexing your racing trophy while doing so. Yep, the champion in the Nürburgring Landstrack and Series. What time would it be? Um, it's probably seven or so for Sindre. Now, Ricardo, I believe, is based in Portugal, so it's probably six in the morning. So it might still be dark there, yeah. but yeah, they are they are definitely ready to see the sun rise. And it, I made the joke slightly earlier that, you know, we saw Bobby Zelensky's webcam in the middle of the day, and JP, it's basically like it's at the middle of the night, because he is one of those drivers that just loves the monitor being his only source of light in the room. I mean, it depends, really, right? You don't want to end up having a distraction behind you or around you that takes you away from the sim. For example, a moonlight, let's say, or a too bright light, anything. For others, well, it's just quite simple. Just focus on the monitor. Let the road be your light. Don't let anything else distract you from that point, even at your laundry basket in the case of Davidson. And Alexander Davidson, I will just say, when it was light earlier in the day, we did see that he had made his bed, had gone yes. to the effort, so props to him for that. You know, you're we're talking about lights here, JP. I, I'll be honest, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old nowadays, especially in the world of sim racing. Why do you need RGB unicorn puke on your headphones? There is no logical reason for it. iRacing has got this functionality with certain keyboards where it will like highlight the, the L RGB LEDs on your keyboard, you know, red, yellow, and green, depending on where you are in the rev range. That seems like a somewhat useful feature. But when it's on your head headphones, no one can see it. It's pointless. I'm just going to say the reason for it is to look cool for yourself. That's, seriously, there's no other reason I can think of. He can't even see aesthetic. himself. I mean, 
It's so other people see you look cool. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry, Alexander. It looks very, very cool. I forgot that we had to say that. Uh, and, and, and I don't know if you've been aware of this, but apparently we can we can be bribed uh, on the broadcast. Uh, we always knew that you could be bribed by shirts, but as Victor Nikolai in the West Competition Racing Machine rejoins alongside Rasmus Tormanen, who's got no front end on that Ferrari whatsoever, um, apparently Team PGZ have managed to convince Lewis or bribed him enough that JP, he is claiming on this broadcast that Team PGZ, the best team in the world. I mean, Team PGZ? Has been a team on the rise, I will say that much, because... How much do they pay you, JP? <laughs> zero dollars and zero cents. No, seriously. What comes to mind is the most recent, success, but like 24 hours at Daytona in the past year or two. They've kind of really gone into the victory lane after being more into the mid-tier towards the higher tier. It's just about... Oh, hold on, trouble. It's in front of them. It's altitude. It's XBD. But they may end up getting out of the corner before the drivers we were just looking at end up filtering on through. There's another driver that's lost the front end on their Ferrari. It does seem to be a relatively common occurrence. That's a send that came out of nowhere. But the Precision Racing Esports car gets it stopped in time. And Dominic Olivier has worked its way through. Let's see if we can take a look at the replay, though, JP. Figure out what happened in that incident down into the braking zone. I'm pretty certain Zelensky may have been around this circumstance again. If I got the cars right. Yeah, just too deep on the brake. Listens it up and parking lot time. Oh, it's probably actually gets quite lucky in that they ended up dropping down low through the corner and not forcing any more chaos through all of that. I do think there was another moment that happened just in the aftermath, and Ivan Hernandez ended up bringing his car back to pit lane, did not think that it could go any further. We've looked at the driver slightly further back for a bit. We've seen plenty of damage. Some cleaner cars up front, though. As Alex Dunn, Vecchio, and Rico still now two seconds splitting them. The gap definitely a little bit larger than it's been for quite a while. Yeah, if anything right now, it's looking like for Dunn, the clean air might be a bit of a factor, but realistically speaking right now, Dunn's just keeping things at bay. This second pack, though, I think it's more so the battle to get a top five with how the pace may be settling in here. This is the point where one of those in that grouping, I believe that's the far right and sixth spot here, is just talking about anything probably except for the race. All while making sure you know he is being supported by Nicolas Cage instead of a fan. <laughs> Nicolas Cage as well, uh, Sean Campbell's biggest fan. Uh, I'm sure would, yes. would, would not approve of some of the antics that sometimes we see from Sean where he'll be in the YouTube chat typing away while he's racing. Now he's just talking, which, you know, at least he's still got his hands on the wheel. So, you know, there's progress in that regard. But uh, multi faceted, multi-talented, and capable of multitasking as well, it would seem, because we do see him jump across cars quite frequently, and it's great to see him here representing the team at Race Clutch in the big show. Xander Reed in front of Sven Haase, who's up four positions so far. Alexei Nesov, though, that's a main championship storyline to keep an eye on. 11 positions gained, and up into ninth, and as the points continue to swing around, I think Alexei Nesov's target now going to be trying to get up into that fight with the Falcon Sim Racing team. I think there's actually a great chance in that because he's been one of the few outside of Sven Hasse who's been able to slice through some of this traffic right now in terms of pace, in terms of comfortability. Four or five seconds is a realistic target in 23 minutes at a track like this, absolutely. Now, for Nezov, it's the matter, can he make some moves or better yet, is he just going to wait and see what happens and fuel up this pack, or is he going to force something to happen? Right now, with the porch of the track he's at, it's the wait patient and see what happens. Just trying to get word, by the way, to a potential interview that we will have with the Wasp Cooking Racing Adventures team manager, Mike Spangler, at some point. Not sure what the executive chef has been working on today, uh, but doing the tower control for the team and hoping that They'll be able to grab another victory as we pass or get right around the halfway mark of this 13th race of 24. Next race on the decks should be a fun one as well because we'll head from Algarve over to Phillip Island. And this time with the Xfinity machines. Uh, JP, that is a combination that I will be honest in saying 
no one really in the real world will ever think about, and probably with good reason. I can't wait to see it in the sim. I think you basically just said, I expect pure carnage. Yes. It should be fun. Uh, I think I expect pure carnage as well, because racing the open wheel cars of any type is pure carnage. Just being able to send it in towards some of those sectors is going to be pure pandemonium in the first 15 seconds and 15 laps or so, I think. At this point, it's going to be down to the combos. I'm just going to say, though, the middle screen here, I can't tell if that's a fog or not at this point. <laughs> Uh, yes, Sven Haas has made his room very, very smoky. And uh, he's still got some... day at this point. Still has some visibility, apparently, to see Alexei Nasov work his way on forward to eighth position. Xander Reed looking quite calm and comfortable at the head of this train as we are officially half complete with this 20, 45-minute uh, race, 22-odd minutes still left to go for these drivers. And at the front, that margin just continuing to grow. And Alex Dunn carrying those skills from uh, this real world into the virtual world. So often we talk about doing it the other way. Uh, but JP, this is a prime example of how drivers use the sim, especially this younger crop of modern young race car drivers use the sim as a way not just to keep their you know skills sharp to learn tracks as they go around the world but let's be honest more importantly compete at the top level it's become almost a very essential part of that because a lot of the drivers that you see coming up to the ranks there's a strong chance you at least race them on a sim or better yet they will eventually have to spend a lot of time in a sim because the trend, like in, for example, taking the next car to stock car side, the trend is less practice at the real world, more in sim time. With the factory sim, or if you don't have access to that, likely with iRacing, because that is something that happens with the mid to back end field if you don't have that connection grouping. Now, for, I was about to say, you also have a lot of your top drivers that we see here today be a lot of those drivers with the real world experience that build some experience at tracks they may never get the chance to get to getting experience with beforehand. Because if you don't know the track, it's hard to get up to speed and show what you can do if you don't know at least the, the a baseline for when you get in the car. And of course, when it comes to, you know, those drivers using the sim to get ready for the real race weekends, especially in the world of e uh, NASCAR. Look at eNASCAR driver Keegan Leahy, who's been critical for 2311 racing in uh, their program and getting up to speed quickly when they roll out at a real race weekend with a setup that, you know, does what they want it to and feels how they want it to. Max Verstappen's often talked about how Rudy Van Buren may be his most important teammate in his the entire Red Bull camp because of the work they do in the simulator. Uh, no simulator, though, can prepare you for the rear end stepping around and not having room to go. And I think there was a bit of contact. Samantha Tan Racing, not sure who the other car was. Uh, very clearly knocking the front nose off. I believe we'll have an error look here with this. But you mentioned it right there. If you go a little bit too fast, it just hooks, hooks, and just have to lock it up. Unfortunately, that last of the car, first of all, I think they disappeared. But second... That front nose, definitely not good. Oh, look at this blocking. It was Altitude Esports that got tangled up, but here we go down into turn one, and Alexei Nesov has found his way to the lead of this group. Xander Reed now runs in eighth position. Haasa, White, ninth and tenth. And this all now 11 full seconds off of your race leader. A big send from Sven Haase to the inside of turn number three. Leaves him the long distance, though, on the climb up through the long left-hander working their way down the hill into the next braking zone. I think Parker White's going to have a bit of a look here. He's looking aggressive, looking feisty, but slides back into line. Yeah, just not a lot of space to be able to get a full slice through, through Tour of Vip at this point, especially with the fact that they're getting to the point where they're blocking three lanes down some of the drafting sections right now. At this point, I'd just say, let it calm down and then maybe think about it, if not, Wait for a mistake here for Sven Hasa, knowing Sven's likely one of those, if he gets a chance, it's going to be the one making a move here. Now he is definitely going to be aggressive, and we've already seen that fight as well, slightly further behind. You can see in the inset picture, by the way, Hasa went for it. Didn't quite work out for him. So 
these drivers realizing 20 minutes to go, they're losing ground to those in front. Time to start making their way forward in the field. And let's focus back in on Haasa and Xander Reed because Alexei Nesov's going to take advantage of this, JP. He won't need a second invitation to run away and stretch his legs. Yeah, this is why I think partly he might have thought, you know what, I'm going to wait to see what happens here. This is where a lot of drivers are going to be able to walk the trap. Up through Galp. Galp their way down the straightaway, even with the elevation changes. And then right before that turn one entry, that's where it's been absolutely chaotic. I'm just going to keep on talking like nothing happened in the middle window. But right now, Par there's just no space. There's just no run that's building enough for Parker to make the move. At the front of the field, gap continues to open. We are seeing that the balance of the car over time is favoring some drivers over others. Back down onto this run into the back straightaway. Five seconds between Alexei Nesov and the battle for fourth, five, uh, uh, fifth and sixth positions. See if they're going to be able to close that back up with Nesov pulling them on forward. Back in line as well. As mentioned, there are still plenty of cars that do continue to find themselves fighting. All behind 15th or so position. You can go down to 27th and find cars in draft and fighting wheel to wheel. And I think in terms of spare parts department, if the Ferrari crew were set up in the pit lane, JP, at the end of this race, they'd make a killing in terms of fixing up these beaten and battered race cars. Yeah, at this point, if iRacing had a virtual mechanic system or service, they'd probably be making billions of dollars a day in broken race cars on the sim if you're combining it. But in all seriousness now, it's if you have to come in for repairs or have a damaged race car, which some have already mentioned through the Twitch chat about the difficulty with their suspensions right now, you're kind of a sitting duck here. You kind of have to just hope for the best and hope for a miracle if you're damaged. If you've got a clean car, keep it that way. Who has a clean car? I, pro I, I promise you in terms of incident points, there is no one that will be at 0x. Even if they've not had car contact, they will have been running off the track, taking advantage of track limits and well, that's what race car drivers tend to do. You give them some tarmac, they'll try and run out there. That's why you need the arbiter of track limits, Paul Smith, to come into play. Now this, I don't even know how to describe it. Three wide, bundling off the corner. Pedro Sanchez Albert in the BS Plus red machine now is going to get serve return to him. They've all just run off the track. Scherer, Symphony of Pistons, United Sim Team, German Sim Racing, and the Apex Racing Team. There are some huge names down here outside of even the top 40 and doing some ridiculous stuff. Yeah, this is... If you're making moves like that, it's not going to be beneficial. I know that it's in the 20s. You're looking at fun, but four wide off the racing surface is kind of asking for massive troubles, to say the very least. In fact, they're all compromising each other, and if anything, sends like that one, not a surprise. Not the ideal. response back in a second, not going to be pretty. Not ideal. It's costing them so much time as well. Your leaders slowly, by the way, catching up to them, but not going to be able to lap them by the time we get to the end of this one. Back up front as Xander Reed crisscrosses Sven Haase, but Haase is going to lunge it back up the inside through the long downhill entry through the final quarter. Parker White will be sitting here and thinking, this is great in some ways. I can pick my way on forward, but how much time are you guys going to lose me as Alexei Nesov scampers clear up the road in front of them? Passes through to eighth as we cross the timing beam to close the 18th lap of the race for these drivers, and White's had enough. Three wide for a moment down into the opening corner as Xander Reed backs out as well. This is crazy stuff, and guess who's joined the fun as we've been watching all of it? Grubier, and what a send back from Parker White, though. Waited for the right move. Smart play by White. Don't take a three wide risk of crash with you going to a two car lane exit with three cars wide. Wait until the best opportunity to send it to turn three. That's been a pretty strong spot turn three all day for passes. Just got to make sure now what to do next. Because here's the thing. Nezov lost, I was looking at the Delta, two seconds to get around these cars. He's already pulled away. 
nearly two to three seconds. That's how much these cars have held each other up. It's also a testament, let's be real, to the speed he has. Didn't get it right in qualifying. I don't think he's now going to get the chance to close back up to race clutch, to, to the lead grid and go car and to Falcon Sim Racing, all very much now just fighting for fourth position because it's very much become stale at the front right now. 1.5 seconds between Dunn and Vecchio, then a further 1.7 or so back to Ricardo Rico in that Drago car. Again, a reminder of how the points are playing out as we work our way into the back half of 2024's VCO Infinity. 16 points would be the delta between the lead red line car Alexei Nesov running down in seventh, and Gianni Vecchio running up in second spot. And then almost 40 points, JP. And to put that in, in context, right, 40 points is the equivalent of the red line drivers finishing down in, what, 40th position. That's pretty significant. They're going to need a hope for a lot of luck, first of all, but second. It's been kind of the trend, was keeping an eye on this throughout the day in the midst of some of the real world commitments. First eight hours in, red line looks solid. Checking in before action about 6 p.m. Eastern time, red line looks solid. It's been the trend. Team Red Line's put in a lot of focus with their drivers, it seems. Able to be positioned, they are. But a lot of these other teams have a chance to maybe make some waves here, like Williams Esports, to be able to gain some points back. I'm really curious, though, who they for example, Williams puts in for the next race. If White's in this race, who do you put in the Phil Byland race? That's a great point, right? Because he would be your logical, you know, Xfinity expert that you would probably want to put into as many of the races as possible. But every driver has got to drive a minimum of two cars. And so maybe they just have to cycle Parker White out for one of those at Xfinity races and give someone else the chance uh, to get, you know, their second car ticked off from the checklist. And team management so important. You had to nominate, basically, which driver would be in each race uh, on Friday before this event. You do get a certain number of jokers, effectively, JP, for when. For when, not if, but when things go slightly wrong. You can adjust your driver lineup on the fly, but only so many times without a penalty. Yeah, hence what I was talking about with the Joker, where essentially one team per rate to swap, that's about it. You don't want to end up doing it willy-nilly. Speaking of willy-nilly, something just happened. Maybe Jones just all of a sudden has lost all that positioning. Coming off his first podium in one of the top special events for his team, he just lost his top five run just like that. Maybe just a small mistake running out wide through the opening corner. Probably not anything too dramatic as we take a look at the replay. And in, just indeed bouncing over the curb through the opening corner. And then the door opened for one. And the second took advantage as well. Mainly, I think, because there might have been a slowdown to try and clear. Because Jesse was not being, let's be honest, particularly aggressive in defending that spot. And, well, he's got some work to do. Race Control has been doing their work as well. Ten second time penalty, not just for the Impulse Racing number 57. The Wave Italy number 16 team as well. Neither car inside of your top 15 as they run right now. And again, those to be applied at the end of the day. Time though, we haven't had too many interviews. In fact, I don't know if we've had any interviews in the opening 12 hours. Let's change that. And let's try and do a few more of them in the back half of this race. Let's bring in the executive chef at uh, Was Cooking Racing Adventures. Uh, Mike Spangler joins us now. Mike, I hope you can hear us. I hope your mic's working as well. And uh, yeah, talk to us about, you know, being back here for a third VCO Infinity and the all-star crew of chefs that you've whipped up for us here this weekend. Hey, good evening. Uh, it's good to be back. Infinity, it's been a while, you know. We went a little bit over a year this time and, you know, this is one of the ones that we look forward to the most. Um, but yeah. Pulled together a couple of, couple of new faces this time around. Uh, you know, obviously we had to fire Josh Chin because he was pretty terrible last <laughs> time. And uh, Team Mutoika has, has become a traitor and he's, he's moved on to the greener pastures with the, with the Finnish fish people. And yeah, we picked up uh, Oscar Bixrud and, and Patty Wolf. Uh, a couple other guys, you know, have been around. So now yeah, we're having fun. 
not our best event, but we're having fun. Uh, and you guys are, you know, race winners in VCO Infinity as well. So it's this is one of those formats that we often, you know, kind of want more of. And you say that it's been a while. It's been almost 18 months, actually, in some ways, that since the last VCO Infinity that we did. How do you like these combos, Mike? Uh, do, do you, did we cook something up that's good or is it a bit of a, a bit of a stinker? I, I think the combos this year are great. I think the, the NASCAR has been a very, very good wild card race. We've seen a lot of different teams up there in the front that normally aren't. Uh, MX-5 is probably our team's favorite car, even though we haven't really performed that well. Uh, because the racing's so close, and it, there's just a lot of changing it up. These, you know, these GT3 races get kind of stale because that's all anybody ever drives, and everyone has a lot of hours, and I think a little bit too much prep time maybe for some of these races. But uh, I think the two new cars this time around were pretty good. I'm, I'm glad that you approved. The one thing that I was kind of wondering, though, is that, you know, eSports racing, we want to do something different. And I want to pitch you an idea, Mike, and as the head chef, executive chef of, of, of Was Cooking Racing Adventures, I think we'd love to have an entry from you guys into this new format of, of competition I'm thinking of. But it involves these MX-5s, and basically I'm thinking, you know, roller derby-style racing. We need to have an MX-5 that needs to be protected. We'll get a couple of Pro 4 or Pro 2 trucks as, you know, the the whatever you call them, defender people. We'll need some offensive guys as well. Are you on board for this wild idea? Can, can we get Was Cooking involved? I mean, if it involves MX-5s and, and, and Pro 2 trucks, then we're in. Especially if we get Josh Chin, it sounds like, in another team, so you can drive through him, right? Yeah, Josh Chin. I mean, what? I can't believe I kept that guy around for so long. You kept him around, and then you got dropped. Oh, yes, I dropped. You got betrayed by Team Utoika as well. But, uh, Mike, thanks for coming to chat with us. We've got six minutes left in this race. Uh, we've got 11 more races still left to go after this. You said it's not been the best day so far. What, what are you expecting from your boys uh, what, for the remaining races that we've got left? I mean, our, our strategy all along the last couple of years is just to try and Qualify top half, score top half points, and you usually do okay. And we just we're just not qualifying well. And hopefully we can kind of turn around here in the second half. And we'll see if you can grab another race victory for the team as well. Go and cook something special up, Mike. And thanks for coming to chat with us. Hey, always a pleasure. Glad to be back. Always great to be able to make plenty of cooking puns as well, as we whip the fans up into a frenzy by having that quick chat. Five minutes left to go. Your leaders cross the line once more to end lap 23. And JP, we should have four laps left to rumble. Yeah, it's been outright domination up front, I will say. So far, Alex Dunn's just looked very calm. And you mentioned some of the real world experience. Dunn's amongst those who we've seen a fair bit on the sim, but also has seen a lot of rapid pace on the real world side pickup. Of course, the British F4 champion just last couple years ago now up into gb3 also throw in doing well in another continent in the same type of car it should be a surprise he's done doing well at this point though vecchio is just i think he's still okay in his mind because points are points if it was 30 second place i'd be panicking yes and again neither red line car is going to have finished outside of the top 10 I'm pretty sure if things hold as they are four minutes left to go not expecting there to be too much of a change let's watch some of the fighting though Movano and WSR Esports butt kicker alongside one another with the ATRS team and Pike from Beach Racing directly behind them as well this through the middle sector you can see the five car train that runs through Switchback attempted there from the Movano entry and then off the corner a bit of contact between Pike from Beach and ATRS as Martin Cadillac tries to make the move has already won a race to this uh, VCO Infinity event and now gets up to 21st will make oh, almost contact with Davidson as well almost three wide off the corner into the final sector. It's getting a little bit too chippy for anybody's liking here a lot of these drivers making it clear I don't want to give up the spot. You're going to have to basically drive around me to the moon if you really want to get this spot with how much they're trying to lock each other off for the racing line into the rubber. And this look from up above, I think, tells us so much around, about what we're seeing as well. Like, look at the train building behind. It's not an MX-5 race, no, but the train's somewhat reminiscent of it in how close they're all staying. You can see 
Uh, Alexander Davidson, bottom right corner, Martin Cadillac, and then Luke Marchand on the left. So great to be able to see all of those drivers onto the brakes. Davidson's going aggressive, but can't get the move done. And instead, as he watches the Mivano car just one run totally wide, could have slowly, surely have a slowdown to serve as a result of that. Off the hairpin, Pike from Beach hold the point, but a very, very poor line is going to cause them a lot of momentum loss. And now I think Davidson has a chance to really throw an aggressive move. I don't know if I like this, though. This isn't the best of times. How about the third car to go even more aggressive? That was Alessandro Romanelli, ATRS Esports. You didn't like the look of it, JP. He said, let me make sure you know why. Yeah, the Apex Tech Machine got a little bit plain with fire-ish, to say the least. Said, you know what, if you guys are focused with Jarrah, I'm going to go. But you have to be careful in those types of moves there. Any bad movement in particular from one of those drivers, we would have seen the narrow crash in that section. We've seen a lot there today. And so with your leader heading down to turn one, penultimate lap of the race underway right now in that fight slightly further behind. Sven Haas and Parker White have not totally drop Xander Reed, but not really in the hunt as much anymore. And so as White gets closer and closer, look at him open up the corner, almost drives off the track. He's so aggressive, just try and find a bit more speed and purchase to joint the car to the right. Doesn't force the issue as we've seen some drivers do through the hairpin. Instead, what he's thinking is, can I get the car turned efficiently? Can I get onto the power nice and smoothly? Can I get past on the entry into the next braking zone? Haas is not going to even have to go defensive, though. Parker White not close enough. Yeah, if anything, I think Parker White's just trying to find different little lines, different angles, trying to use a bit of a more of a diamond line. Didn't really work much. In fact, he lost the back tires yet again. I think for him, if he really wants to get it done, it's going to be on that white flag lap turn three that seems to be where he's most comfortable on a dive going through logos the problem is i think spen's going to be absolutely expecting that with how things are going and especially with where right now white's trying to time up how the distances are down the hillside but as you mentioned one more lap left to go there's your leader alex dunn long right hander takes him towards the start finish line where Barney, the flag man, has the white flag in hand, and he's ready to see the victory if he can hold on. It's been a steady drive from Johnny Vecchio, steady drive from Ricardo Rico, and one, two, and three. It hasn't changed since the start of the race, and JP, one more lap. I think they'll stay as they are. Very strong run today for Dunn up at the very front of the field, but Ricardo Rico and Juan well, Vecchio have both kept things at bay to be able to keep him on his toe, keep him in the pace. Now watch this move though, as we look at some of the others around the racetrack. That move with White could be intriguing everybody else, just trying to settle themselves in for the checker. Parker White still trying to set it up, but he's not going to force the issue just yet. We're on to that final lap. Drivers up and down through the field want to do what they can. And here is Parker White's best chance, you'd think, to try and get to the inside, not close enough. In fact, not even within a car length of the car that he's chasing down. There's Jarno Koch, who's got fourth on lock to himself. And there is your race leader, Alex Dunn, who's got some traffic, but just now three more corners to navigate through. It's been outright domination up towards the front of the field today. He wasn't rapidly different pace, but it's just enough to be able to not only keep in front, but also get that marginal ahead. Keep going bit by bit ahead. Alex Dunn doing a very job. Well done today. And for the Apex Racing Team, a couple of races in that first half dropped them back in contention. But for Alex Dunn, it will be his second win in this 2024 Infinity. He won once in the MX-5s. He'll do it now in a GT3 car. We're yet to see him shine on top in an open wheel machine. But Apex Racing, Alex Dunn, winners in the 13th race in VCO Infinity. Red line still second, valuable points for them in their hunt for the championship. And now a long wait to see the rest of the drivers come towards the line. Parker White not gonna get the chance to fight with Sven Hasse. And look at the fight, 21st on back, still half a lap left to go. We mentioned already the aggressive moves from Davidson. He's been able to break away though. 
Marchand and company. I don't know if this is going to be secure unless he's able to get a good run. Look at that for the final corner. Some of those behind him are too busy fighting each other. They're trying to get up to him. A story of a couple of different races, for example, WSR Esports butt kicker, 11 positions lost. ATRS who finish in front of them, 20 positions gained. There'll be a wait for the final drivers to see the checkered flag. But JP, we've got one more race to come before you and I get a bit of a breather. And I think that next race, Xfinity's at Phillip Island, not going to be much breath for either of us. Yeah, the Xfinity cars at Phillip Island are going to be a little bit dramatic, to say the very least, coming up. I want to keep an eye on some of those drivers in that session. The drivers are not having a fun time getting around the track. <laughs> and speaking of not having a fun time, poor Adrian Bourdon in the Symphony of Pistons machine, slowly bringing that car back around to the start-finish stripe, and he will be the final classified driver and on the leading lap as well. We'll grab a look at the results. We'll be able then to look forward to that race with the Xfinity cars because it should be a fun one and it should be entertaining. Final drivers are all across the line and for the second time in 2024's VCO Infinity, it is the Apex Racing Team that stand on top and with Alex Dunn doing the victory honors once again. We'll look at those results and get ready to move forward. 1.5 seconds, the margin at the line between Apex and Red Line. And then Drago, Ricardo Rico, third, on the final step on the podium for them. Gridden goes uh, first entry, fourth. Their second entry down in eighth. Not a bad uh, race for them, all things considered. Race Clutch, Falcon Sim Racing, and Team Red Line between their two entries. And Williams and Kawanda, the rest of the top 10. 11th for Team PGZ, 12th for Brabham Esports, and then DLR Sim Lab, BS Plus Competition, and the Williams Esports teams through the top 15. Delatraz Automotive, Rocket Simsport, and then Was Cooking Racing Adventures, Pike from Beach, and ATRS Esports, your top 20. It was great to be able to chat to Mike Spangler during that race and, uh, well, get some of his thoughts about VCO Infinity. Looking through the rest of the results, Alexander Davidson for WSR Esports, Buck Kicker 21st. Mavano Corsa 22nd, Impulse, Visceral, and CRZ, the rest of your top 25, and still only around 50 seconds off of the leader. Kawanda and Bobby Zelensky down in 26, slightly frustrating, I'm sure, for him, with Altus Precision Racing Esports, W2 E Pro GP, and the SMP Racing Esports team, the top 30. Project Valorous, Maradness M Squad, Blue Rose, and the Apex Racing teams all in front of Kramer Racing Esports for the top 35 with BS Plus Competition, Absolute Motorsport, German Sim Racing, Scherer, and United Sim Team uh, through the back of the top 40. And as we look at those final names, only two more drivers on the lead lap for West Competition and the Symphony of Pistons. Samantha Town Racing, one lap down, two laps down for Team Fordzilla. And then you get into the graveyard, those that had some troubles. But the great thing about this is they'll get to go once again, refreshed in the next race, because you never have to take a breath here in VCO Infinity. JP, Justin Prince alongside myself, Arjuna, Kanki Party, and Justin, I think we've kind of now been building up, right? The morning's starting to come in Europe, where most of our drivers are from. They've gotten through the night. We've got a couple of different tricky race combinations still left to go. It's a crucial point of this competition. It's now to where if you really want to be able to try and make up some lost time, you need to be able to start performing, well, a race ago. But better yet, this is where the combinations get even more tricky, because we already touched upon a lot with the Xfinity cars at Phillip Island. It's morning time, you mentioned Europe. It's right now, I'm looking at the clock, it's 2 a.m. Eastern time. There are just, out of everybody entered right now, I can tell you this for the next slot, just one driver, Adrian Stravato, who I know is an oval specialist. Every other person is a GT driver in a NASCAR stock car. The combinations are going to get very weird here. And at the end of the day, though, right, as much as we'll talk about this being weird, it's just driving a car, right? Getting the most from it, being progressive on the throttle. And, you know, Shane Van Gisbergen took his V8 supercar skills and instantly tra uh, translated it and parlayed it over into a Megan Cup Series win on the streets of Chicago. So we did see that drivers can figure out. Luke McEwen was feeling quite comfortable with the Xfinity car, bringing that experience from the Porsche Esports Super Cup. So there is going to be some intrigue there. I think the, the curious thing, though, in many ways, is also the fact that not only unfamiliar car, but 
JP, it's not often that, let's be real, we commentate and watch races at Phillip Island. It's a very, very underutilized track. Yeah, it's a racetrack where usually you talk about drafting a major factor in the front straightaway. I don't know if that's going to be this big of a factor for the Xfinity combination. If anything, it's going to be where do you set up the passes in particular? That first sector is going to have a lot of attrition points. We've seen just in the very least, the open wheel side is going to have drones. The middle sector where Honda and all that is going to be at, in, I think that's going to be potentially carnage in the opening lap for this race. You need to basically be on your toes. And remember, with this car, the fall off is pretty drastic. In 15 laps, we're looking potentially at two seconds of fall off. That's usually the trend if you are good. <laughs> you fall off more than two seconds, you've done something wrong. Oh, I feel called out there, JP, because I'm definitely not good in this car. Uh, I want to make sure I give another shout out to Michael Conti and the team at Team Conti for helping to provide these setups for us in this car. The Xfinity car, actually, it's counterintuitive. It's got more setup adjustments than the Cup Series car, especially when it comes to suspension. And this, you know, is one of a track where it's, it's, it's flowing, it's undulating. You've got to get the car to really settle. But it was interesting. Michael told me, JP, that this wasn't actually the hardest track to set the car up for. No, that was Portimao at Algarve, which, you know, logically it makes sense. Very similar in sort of their nature, but maybe that's a little bit more extreme. Well, I think that's because the elevation changes, because one of the main things to think about when setting things up, and I think that's what Conti might have been touching upon there, is you have to be able to keep the car sealed, usually on set the oval side. If you can't keep the car sealed, you lose downforce. With the road side, it's a little bit more finicky on that. At a track like Portimao, it's hard to keep it sealed when you're going up and down every five seconds. At Phillip Island, it's a lot more smoother, a lot more predictable in the suspension travel to be able to build a car for this type of a racetrack. So I'm not surprised that was his answer. A big shout out to all the setup makers as well for you know helping us to make this event as good as it can be. The thick setup adds that extra element as well. It makes the drivers understand what the car is doing, not what they can do to the car qualifying effectively by the way is done and dusted because once again one shot qualifying drivers have either set a valid lap time or invalidated their only attempt and red line one and two it's enzo benito 82 thousandths faster than the man from down under cooper webster who's going to be really wrestling that xfinity car around ricardo castroledo then for commander esports is in that number 92 and this is what we were kind of wondering with bobby zelensky and parker white both racing in the previous race that we saw, JP, I don't think either of them lined up for this 14th race of the day. Not of them are. In fact, that you would think. That's why I was looking through AJ Stravano I've seen on the Oval Sun in the past. Everybody else I classify as a specialist for the GT cars in terms of this field. Red line, absolutely. You talk about Kobe Deeth, he's a crosser for the MX-5 race. Talk about Williams. They put Carl Jansen behind the wheel. He's an RGT specialist, if you throw it to that grouping. Marcus Deek, he was one of the drivers selected as a Joker driver instead for this time slot for race clutch. Pablo Espes, he might be someone decent if he's able to do something from the mid-pack because he's got some experience in this type of racing, but not as much as the MX-5. In other words, there is a lot of toss-up here that I think we're about to see here. And I think it's pretty clear Red Line's put a lot of focus on learning this car since it's not a team specialty. Coanda, they have drivers in-house that help them get up to speed. For a lot of these others, it's where do I find the nearest oval driver to be able to be my coach? Jesse Jones pops into our VCO Twitch chat to say that he's running on around two hours sleep, working all day before the race. Yeah, some of these drivers definitely feeling the wear of time. And now 45 minutes thrown back onto that clock, and this will be a grueling race. There's not many of these Xfinity races still left on our agenda. Each of them to be savored, to be enjoyed. We've got Algarve, we've got Road Atlanta still left to go after this as we work our way through the back half 
of 2024 and VCO Infinity. Running down to the starting grid, red line one and two, Benito in front of Webster, and then Ricardo Castroledo for Coanda alongside Dominic Kaufman. Usually a prototype driver, but clearly no downforce, no problem for the Drago Racing 696. Joshua Anderson is then alongside Carl Janssen uh, on row number three. Norbert Leitner finds himself in seventh. Jack Sedgwick, his company for him in the What's Cooking Racing Adventures machine. I'm sure there's going to be some pressure from team manager Oscar Mangan and then Griffin Gardner, uh, the Alter Sea Sports cars and Eclipse Sim Sports machines representing from the region, ninth and 10th for them. Grid and go and Cody Deeth 11th, Oscar Pye half a second off alongside him. 13th for the Team PGZ entry with Luca Alpert, Gal Valero, Danny Lorenzo and then Grid and go second car and Timu Toiko for Pike from Beach Racing just inside of the top 20, along with David Toth and Pablo Espes for Brabham and Wave Italy. WSI Esports butt kicker and SMP Racing is 21st and 22nd. Team Fordzilla for uh, Abel Torres, 23rd, and then Rincon Racing is just outside of the one second bracket. Dennis Grabowski for Altitude Esports is alongside Jonas Wanner for Falcon Sim Racing with Thibaut Prevo and Elliot White, Williams Esports Academy and Precision Racing Esports. Massimo Locatello, German Sim Racing and JD Rodriguez, XPD Racing, the rest of the top 30. And then Delatraz Automotive, Project Valorous, Apex Racing Academy, Olympus Esports and Miranda's M Squad along with the Dutch League Racing Crews just inside of two seconds to the race. Uh, pole position time, I should say. West Competition Racing and then the Absolute Motorsport team on the 19th row of the grid. What a big set of fields we've been having, of course. CRZ, W2E Pro, and then Samantha Tan Racing and Race Clutch. Some work to do for Marcus Deck from 42nd. Movano Corsa, Screen to Speed, Mini T Racing, Kramer Racing Esports, and then the first times with no times on the board. First cars with no times on the board. Rocket Sim Sport, ATRS, and then Visceral, Blue Rose Team, United Sim Team, and the SOP, Symphony of Pistons 52, ready to go. Well, another big field, JP. Any shocks now that we've looked through the entire field in that qualifying rundown? Out of those that put up the laps, I'm not sure if there's any massive shocks per se. Just amongst those who have at least some oval experience that I might have thrown into the wild cards to try and put in a surprise run compared to the overall standings, they didn't qualify the best because you throw Timo Toika, he's also good on ovals, but not as much road course. You also throw Precision Race Esports, Elliot White, he's been trying to build up a lot of oval experience in that league. Honestly, it's going to get interesting what surprise we're about to get into the opening sectors. And you've got to wonder, will the Redline teammates try and work together? There's only so much you can do, especially with the amount of horsepower that we're ready to unleash. Xfinity at Phillip Island, we're in an alternate universe, that is for sure. And more than 30,000 horsepower gets revved up and sent racing. Redline one and two, and Kawanda defending from Drago. We were three wide through the opening corner with the MX-5s. There will be no such risk with these cars. Drivers know the danger that they will fly through. The Southern Loop, it's so its so treacherous, even in a downforce-laden car. It's going to feel like it goes on forever. You've got to be so progressive, so patient with that right foot. Incredibly, though, all 51 machines, yes, 51, get through the Southern Loop safely, and then a couple get spat off into the grass. This is where it's going to get treacherous. Miller Corner, reasonably named that way in the most recent months here is gonna be extremely tough for passing opportunities, but also the danger. How in the world is everyone still making it? I'm not quite sure how to describe that here. They're three wide at the back of the field, and this is the cleanest start of all of them I've kept an eye on today. There have been moments of cars going off the track, just to be clear, but yes, this has. I think definitely being the cleanest start that we have seen so far today in the start that we thought would be the least clean. Onto the brakes, down the hill, and this is where maybe we'll get the first signs of trouble. No ABS for drivers to use. Cars blinking as well, that can't help them as BS Competition turned on the nose of Impulse Racing. It's gonna be Joshua Anderson spat out wide as Norbert Leitner couldn't really do much with a blinking a big red machine. And now more chaos, watch them three wide through the final corner. Yeah, that was more so an Anderson with the tech issues. It's hard to give a break when you don't know where to hit the brakes when there's no visual. But outside of that, a good launch for just about everybody else here. 
A lot of give and take being showcased through a lot of these drivers just trying to get a feel of how to drive these cars for a lot of people who are not used to the fact that if you go and treat the gas as hard as a lot of the others would in a GT car, you're going to spin it. We're on board with Pablo Espez, of course, now race winner in VCO Infinity, but sits in 13th position right now. Seven spots up from where he started this race. You can see bouncing over the curb, wheel working hard as well. And a big send being thrown by Gal Valero. It's the battle of the blue and white teams. Apex Racing and the BS Competition car, at least on these machines, the livery is a little bit more differentiated than they are on some of the open wheel cars that we've seen in the past. But they are already eight seconds off of your leader. There is the gap, the stretch that we're starting to see is through the long left-hander they work once more and down into Lukey Heights. Yeah, Enzo Benito's looking extremely comfortable here in the clean air. And that's one thing that has to be thought about here with these cars, even on a road course. Clean air is still very important. It's been a big talk with the cup cars in particular this year, Arjuna, where if you're stuck in traffic, it's hard to pass. Not so much with the Xfinity Series cars, but it's still a balancing act because the closer you get, the tighter it can be with this arrow weight for the car and more people in the grass. Now that was Jordan Johnson in the Apex Racing Academy car. That was spinning it around. I'm sure there was a little bit more that precipitated all of that. They're going to be side by side. This is for 26th position. As Elliot White in the Precision Racing Esports car has the grid and go machine that's just slid his way on forward. This is definitely going to be a race where we spend a lot of time figuring out what all has happened as the ordering just chops and changes and continues continues to cycle on around 1.4 seconds the gap between norbert leitner and the top five is look at that line being taken by griffin gardner in the eclipse simsport machine trying to go the long way around on oscar mangan yeah not quite sure if that's going to be able to work today like compared to an open wheel machine you have to be able to get that bottom of the racetrack especially with the hard tight roll of this car you got to get that preferred group. If you're outside the marbles or outside the main rubber, it's not like you get the switch back. That grip is just not going to be here in this race. And we have seen pit stops. Let's just remind everyone of that. They do seem to need a little bit of fuel to get to the end of the race. And so that's also helping them decide how to ration and, and manage the usage of the tire. And they're all allowed to use whatever manufacturer they'd like as well. So these cars on iRacing are physically uh, and performance-wise identical. And so it's up to the teams to decide what car they would like to run. Let's see if we can begin, by the way, looking at some of the incidents from the start of the race, beginning with the exit of the Southern Loop. Yeah, this was going to be a trouble spot, I thought about. Yeah. Just three wide coming out of the corner eggs. It's not going to be a smart move there, let alone a move in any type of car. But there's not a lot of space to run off. Then you talk about a section like this, where you carry too much speed. You're like all these cars. It just takes you off into the grass. You just expect there to be the brakes. There's no brake pressure. Not as much as you think compared to, say, a road car. You're done. And then I think this one's self-explanatory. Yep. No, it's all about the technical issues. And then that is less self-explanatory initially. Team PGZ almost turns themselves on the nose of Wave Italy. It's a little bit more shoving and barging as they fly through that final corner. And again, I don't quite know how they save the car, but credit where credit's due, they make it work. They slide on forward. And then it was all just rumbling on. It's been some great racing. These drivers having to adapt their style of racecraft as well. It was fascinating listening uh, to Shane Van Gisbergen in an interview, JP, where he was kind of saying that he's never been in a racing series before where the bump and run is not only acceptable, but in some ways encouraged, loved, you know, and just uh, encouraged beyond what we'd see in any other form of motorsport. And it's why when you think about it, even with the win, that was a breakthrough at Chicago street circuit. It's not quite as simple as, let's jump into the cup races and go from there. No, it takes a lot of time to catch up to how much experience you need to have to be able to be successful in all types of racing, especially in the oval side. Uh, that was very sloppy on the replay, I'll say that. The 87 just got catapulted on that set. 
It's RaceBot's own Lorenzo Bonda that's gone for the spin, but I don't think he was the first car that needed the trip back to pit lane. It's Samantha Tan racing in their art car, and unfortunately escorted out wide, and that was what necessitated the flatbed to return them. Oh, David Toth then also got just served as they worked their way in through that final sector. All of this at the very back of the field. Crazy stuff. Yeah, just... It's not a surprise to see how some of the drivers are having troubles in the heart of the pack because it's a car that gets very scrappy in that. And it gets to the exact point that was making the wars. He's currently racing all the various types of series for a reason. If he just went straight to cup, first of all, he wouldn't have been approved. You have to be able to have experience at X amount of tracks per size to have that license approval process. He need to get that test run, mind you, for the... Arkham and Art Series race just to be able to then run the Xfinity Series race the same day. Now, second thing second, and this is what a lot of people don't remember is he was one of the top drivers in Monday Night Racing, which was a Sims racing series started in the pandemic featuring rear wheel drivers. And you know who performed the best whenever the combinations were at ovals? Surprisingly, Shane Van Gisbergen by about a lap. I'm serious. He lapped Kyle Busch in a lap on Bristol Dirt it's when they went there. Always interesting where these real drivers end up jumping into the sim and finding their enjoyment at the end of the day, right? Because they do end up spending a lot of time doing it. And in the case of some of those Australian drivers, they have such a big community that sort of you know sprung around them, being in a slightly awkward time zone. You know, they coordinate their race times together. Uh, Lewis and myself, along with Ewan, uh, commentated on Shane Van Gisbergen and, and Shane, uh, Nick Hunter's series, uh, which was Apex Hunters United for quite a while as well. So they've always had something going on. Norbert Leitner, a slight slip up, and instantly Oscar Mangan pounces and takes the Alter Seasports team forward to sixth position. Great little move there. Nice pass by Mangan, obviously getting some coaching for Alter Seasports' oval division. But I was going to also say, a lot of people don't remember, too. You know who one of the top sim racing builders on the platform was for about five, six plus years and still is arguably in that? Bertie Kostecki. You know what Bertie Kostecki is doing? Oh, I don't know. Currently battling for the V8 Supercar Championship right now. So um, the crossover always has been there. It's just the bridge is now more prevalent because of the next gen car, obviously, taking a lot of inspiration from those V8 cars for their construction for the next gens. Yeah, Brody Kostecki, more fighting legal battles more than anything right now, has been an unfortunate turn to his 2024 campaign, but we will hope to see him in a car sooner rather than later. Cody Deeth has just been passed by Luca Output in that Shera Esports machine that's been slowly climbing its way forward in the field. Points have, by the way, been updated, so we'll get you a live point situation when we can in a few moments' time, but should not be a surprise to anybody to continue to realize that red line have the advantage and run and two right now in what is meant to be the unfavored car the one that they've never really raced much in don't have any reason to dial in you know the car week on week on week no but they have found the speed they've just been able to learn the car's intricacies and make the most of the grip that they have underneath them you can see on the top right corner of your screen the life points as they sit right now i mean it's a 60 point gap from the lead red line car to then kawanda down in third effectively now jp more than a full race victory yeah they're just right now fully just about clear it's more so about themselves as long as they don't trip themselves up because benito and webster are solid choices because webster believe also has experience in the touring cars for the red in the red line camp. So there is a bit of crossover there in terms of the racing styles. Benito, well, Benito just likes having fun. <laughs> Benito, and I'm pretty certain Benito's having fun. Benito just likes driving. I mean, that's the thing. No matter what sim you put him in, no matter what car you put him in, he will deliver the results. And that's where, you know, that you have arguments, discussions sometimes about who's the best driver in the world of sim racing. And there'll be many claims for the Josh Rogers, for the Sebastian Joves, and very worthy claims at the end of the day. but. I think Enzo Benito could very well make a, a claim for being a driver that 
Uh, you've seen it in the VCO Esports Racing League, the Re Esports Racing World Cup as well. He's been the most valuable driver, able to perform across of R Factor 2, a set of course of Competizione and I Racing, getting podiums, points, and championships for Redline along the way. It's interesting that Cooper Webster, though, you know, he does race in the uh, Porsche Tag Core Esports Super Cup, won a couple of races this year as well as part of the Oracle Red Bull Racing Team. But in the real world, you know, he's, he's mostly focused now on driving open wheel cars. Going to be racing in Euro Cup 3 this year. He's done some S5000 and whatnot. And I saw some chatter from some of his Redline teammates about the way he drives this car, JP. Uh, and apparently they're very amused by his driving style. Look how much opposite lock that he's using to balance the car on power. Yeah, I'm going to need to see this because usually that... Um... What tires, right? Who needs tires? Yeah, I think uh, he's going to find out in about five minutes that's going to pop the tire if he's going to keep on shoving the wheel hard left like that. There's so much of a talking point when it comes to the stock cars in general. Less steering input is more in terms of saving tire. If you're going 35, 45 degrees into the corners, well, guess what? You are in trouble you're going to lose your right front or all your front tires in the case of a road course and fast benito looks to be a little bit more smooth in that regard also it doesn't help that webster is going hard into the corners and that's going to cook the brakes and again just a reminder though that we should probably see them into pit lane about halfway through to oh, contact between hometown kid cody d gives a bit of a shot to jack sedgwick and now oscar pie does not compound the drama but Deeth out wide, opens a door, and even though the hood's not firmly latched on the Koana Esports car, gets up through the couple of gears that it has, a little bit of a slide off the curb as well. I, I'm, I, I want to ask these drivers, JP, we've been missing winners' interviews. I, I, I really wish they would come and chat with us. I want to ask if they would ever think about doing a series, a competitive sim racing series in these Xfinity cars after their experience here today. I think for some, absolutely. After all, there are series on the platform that emphasize this, but also a lot that comes to mind where there's been combinations like the all the unused Rovals that popped up a couple years ago in multi-class star racing. It's just about the time commitment. But I will say this in terms of the Coanda damage you mentioned on the 91. I don't think there's any concern because if it's just on the nose it's fine if it's on the suspension you're talking about a broken tie rod possibly and the more damage that builds up especially in the sides for whatever reason with the damage model the worse the car's going to handle you can handle a bit of nose damage you can't handle a punch to your right front tire with a sludge hammer and they do have a fast repair they may elect to use it when they come down to pit lane for their fuel as we're about to see 15 minutes burned off the clock 30 minutes left to go in race 14 of 24 here in the third edition of vco infinity you know leary going to be back in the commentary booth in 30 minutes time to take you through the next handful of hours and he'll be joined alongside by uh, justin for the first hour and then zach sweeney for a couple of hours after that and then don't forget, you will, if you're watching on YouTube, need to switch over to part three. If you're watching on Twitch, uninterrupted, don't need to click a thing. We'll be here to the very end with you all the way. Back up front, leads being slowly stretched out. Ricardo Castroledo, he'll feel the pressure from Dominic Kaufman as they dance out of the final corner on the power. And if they are starting to feel the pain in terms of tire fall off, JP, we're seeing that in lap times. 1.6 seconds slower than the fastest lap for your race leader last time by. Yeah, and that's going to get right back to the conversation of you expect pit stops around the halfway mark. That's why. Because the longer you go, the more time you lose. Let's put it this way. An overcut will make you a lot faster towards the middle portions of the race after your pit stop for a bit. But there's a lot of equalization once you get to the two seconds of fall off on the racetrack. So by the back end, you potentially could be stuck where you're riding. Now, 
getting the pit entry is going to be critical for these drivers because here's the thing with Phillip Island. It's a little bit of a trickier pit cycle, to say the least, to enter that pit lane with this car in one lane that usually needs to be near full throttle in any other car. That takes a lot of practice and could be a three to five second difference in this car alone if you take it too soft. Sun or better yet, if you hit the wall. Sun continues to rise for Dominic Hoffman. Last time we were seeing his camera perspectives, much darker for him, to say the very least. He's chasing down Ricardo Castroleda, who's great to see him back in uh, a Coanda Esports car in a major competition, but I've always, I'm, I'm enjoying watching him drive this car, JP, because it's not like watching all the other Esports people where he's looking calm and he's like, Dr. Cool instead. No, he's actually looking quite stressed. And this is a stressful car to be driving when you know that any one mistake could be your last. Honestly, if I'm him, I have Bobby in my ear trying to help him because you see the open wheel rim, he doesn't appear to have been able to switch over to the oval shaped rim or the stock rims per se. It's similar to what you see for Zelensky and set up just about identically because they run near identical looks if you look at them, compare them to the sim rigs. I wouldn't be surprised if he somehow found a way onto Bobby's sim and said, thank you for letting me use this. Be a far trip for him, but wouldn't be a bad idea. Bobby Zelensky, of course, having to do two, uh, drive two different cars. You can't just have a specialist and say you only drive that one car. No, instead, you've got to give them a little bit more responsibility, a minimum of two cars to be driven by every single driver. Wow. Fight building behind as gridandgo.com and Cody D see Pablo Espez and the Apex Racing Team Carl Valero. He's gained two positions so far this race. Hasn't been big movements by any means. That's a valuable spot, a valuable position gained as well. And when you look at the live point situation, Alex Dunn winning that previous race. The Apex Racing Team still nine points back from Coanda Esports as they run in the championship. To say on that point, though, with Zelensky, he has won the ran the world championships like Bush Taker Esports Super Cup, so he can cross over like that. That being said, here we go, pit stops. Pit. Here we go, midway. It's grid and go, Cody Deeth. That's decided. You know what? Let's come in slightly earlier than the actual halfway point of the race. It gives him that undercut. You'll have the fresh tires for a lap or two earlier. You'll then pay the price on the other side of it. Your race leaders not going to come in on the same lap, JP. They will split the call here. One will come in on one lap. The other comes in the lap after the lap after that, whatever it will be. But we are going to end up seeing them a little bit off sequence as well. Only two seconds back to Ricardo Castroledo from your race leader. They're being kept very, very honest by Coanda and Drago. Yeah, I've been mentioning that all throughout the race so far. If, they, if anything, it's going to get interesting in terms of how they coordinate with each other. Do they treat it like they would for a regular road course race? The red line way, almost, you can put it. Coming together as a unit, get into the boxing as a unit, leave as a unit. Or do you try and stagger it to make sure that you don't hold up the back driver's pit entry? That's going to be something that might come to mind from the strategist here. We'll see if they peel in this time or try to extend it. If not... If they don't come in, Coanda might think about the cut. Instead, nobody followed up with them. Nobody is attempting to undercut on them. Still haven't reached the halfway mark, and that's where I think they are going to want to try and get to. It's a somewhat important number, at least based on sort of the trends that we saw when we made Oh, and well, there's another trend we should mention. By the way, your pet exit is right in the middle of the racetrack. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, but it's not such a problem uh, as long as drivers recognize it. There's two pit exits that you can use as well. And we'll keep an eye on how the sequence all plays out. Let's go back, though, and take a look at a small replay. Battle has been uh, fierce and intense. And well, Team PGZ, oh, just contact with Wave Italy. Not much they could really do. Yeah, quite simply. It's been a rough couple rounds for Wave Italy. Yeah, just too hard of the brakes. And Pablo just turns them. Quite simple. Just missed the breaking point. 23 and a bit minutes still left to go. I saw Jordan Johnson left pit lane for the Apex Racing Academy team. Relatively short stop for him as well. 
Enzo Benito, Cooper Webster, will they come in this time? There was, of course, a little bit of that drama when it came to pit entry earlier on today. Teams under the impression that one pit entry was correct and the other was not tried to file protests, but no, race control has basically told the teams, use whatever pit exit you like, just do it in a safe and reasonable fashion. Now, if you pit this time by, you'd come out after the halfway mark. Neither red line car will come in. Kawanda Drago think they should stay out there as well. Cody Deeds been somewhat left by on his own with this call. Last time by, 137.340. Not necessarily representative. JP, I'm going to be very curious what the time's going to be for him. Yeah, if anything, right now, as long as there's no massive holdups here, this is going to be a pretty solid pickup in terms of Delta. Right now, it's 47 seconds behind the race leader for Retford's right now. Deeth currently one of the fastest cars on the racetrack and keeping an eye on the sectors, too. Needs to get to 133.8 to get to his personal best here. Compare that to those still on the old rubber. They're still running 135 flats on the oldest Goodyear Eagles. They're being very steady, though. That's all they're trying to do. Avoid any slip-ups. Adam Brockway is going to bring in the Miranda's M-SWAT car in, so... As another taker, but it's not been a popular call just yet. We're not also seeing too much wheel-to-wheel -wheel fighting. Still waiting to end up seeing whether these drivers are just holding off until they come down pit lane. We do have the time, of course, though, for the grid and go machine now that it's crossed the line. It's a new personal best. It's not a new fastest lap, though. They closed just under 1.5 seconds on your race leader. More importantly, though, against the fights they... Uh, drivers they were actually fighting with it would have been a closer to two second advantage and that's what they'll be thinking about with 21 minutes to go 15 laps about to be complete in an estimated 29 lap race benito and webster along with castroledo and hoffman deciding to stay out there i wonder if they are actually thinking of doing this on a no-stop because we had one team that went very long at the race at uh, monza and at one point, we got word, JP, they were 0.3 of a gallon short from cutting out the pit stop. Well, that has to be a commitment made from the onset. And the main thing is, usually one of the better ways to save with this car is try and short shift a little bit, or rather lawn shift, so to speak. Try and prevent yourself from going to the high RPMs. They're not using the clutch and coast along these drivers, though. That's the main thing as well remember it's 2.7 miles the distance here compare that to say Watkins Glen they have to pit around 30 laps basically if I'm looking at this right it's going to be close it's that's the one I'm trying to say it's going to be close if they're thinking of what they might try in terms of a splash and dash instead that is not normal for that car on a road course but uh, again these are road course drivers that run gts where a splash and dash would be common yeah but it's all about the tires as well right we'll see the trend in lap time for cody deeth who's already down to a 134 uh four last time by and so a big delta i hear the pit clacks and go off but it's not for anyone at the front so still the red line contingent Coanda drago stay out on track and as we look at carl Jans and oscar mangan They've got Griffin Gardner and the Eclipse Simsport machine just behind them as well. Neither of these drivers feeling like it's time to come down onto pit lane. And going back to the hands at work, we were seeing Cooper Webster kind of sawing at the wheel a little bit more. Watch Oscar Mang, and you can see the hands directly in front of us right now. Yes, there's some bouncing around JP as the car naturally just lurches around, but he's trying to be very, very smooth, very calculated in his inputs to the wheel. We touched upon this already. The more smoother it can be, the better. A lot of counter steer to be able to try and make sure it sticks there. But it's to where it's down to the preference. When you have an open wheel rim like that one, the formula rim, I should say, not a surprise to see as much motion because it's very twitchy feel. It's basically need to be very precise. It uses a lot of motion. Take, for example, though, you have one of the oval rims or one of the stock rims. One of the main things on the oval side is you turn more than 10%, it burns up the tires. There's a reason some of the top teams have a specific preference for steering box. On the road side, 
it's not just down to the setup. It's not just down to the steering box. It's to can you do the brakes? Are you good on a road course? That's a lot of smoke for the Williams car off that right front tire. And if you're locking up as well, you're also eating into the tire life. The fact that they haven't come in clearly tells us that they think they can make it on fuel because otherwise with the fall off that we're seeing on tires they would split this race in two there is no ifs or buts about it they would have done exactly as they've done in previous races your leaders not breaking away though from ricardo castroledo being kept very very honest back in the field jonas wanner antoine lacherite 16th position two teams that have had ups and downs over the course of the day as well a teal machine with Wanner pushing it into the opening corner, trailing the Canadian or trailing around the Canadian Antoine Lacherite, who is currently trying to defend his championship in the Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Canada. You can see him on the bottom right, Jonas Wanner in the bottom left. JP, what time is it on the east coast of the US right now again? Just remind me. 2.28 a.m. And so that's what Antoine's probably feeling right now, whereas in Europe it's around 8 a.m. or so. So... A little bit more reasonable for the Falcon Sim Racing driver. Although, let's be real, if some of these drivers haven't got much sleep, I'm sure they're probably feeling a little bit worse for the wear. And I do, I am very much of the opinion, JP, that this race more intense than a regular 24-hour affair. Especially since it's not quite as simple as you've got one car, one track to focus on, just get the setup baseline set that everyone's going to get comfortable on in Get the strategy, get the practice in, go. No, you're talking about essentially 24 different combinations of track, car, conditions, rain, no rain, and making sure you don't do that when it comes to race time. And you have to make sure you do that in two different types of cars. <laughs> Antoine Lacherite makes the small mistake without dropping to the clutches of potentially some of those drivers that were just behind, but I think he might just now have managed the situation and now we'll just have to hope that his tires well, aren't screaming in absolute agony. I've got to say, as much as Benito and Webster looking very comfortable right now, Coanda Esports doing all that they really can at this point, being up there towards the front, staying in contention, although you look at the points, one thing to keep in mind, the Coanda car that's third in the championship, JP, that's actually running in 10th. Castro Lado's car is sixth in points and 123 points behind your uh, championship leader. More than two full race victories. At this point, that's going to be significantly far back. On the bright side, they're right now in line and jumping. BS Competition, one of the newest teams for the NASCAR Coco I Racing Series this year. So there's that bright side. But it's kind of been almost at least from what keep an eye on the past few hours at minimum. One car does well, but it's not the one that needs to do well for the point system, and vice versa, it almost seems. It's almost like a tug of war affair the past couple races, too, for this 92 in the point, compared to the third points car. And so let's take that even further, and let's make a new rule halfway, more than halfway through VCO Infinity, where uh, Team Redline, only one of their cars is allowed to get points at any one race from this point moving forward. In fact, just sweeping generalization. If you've got two teams, only one of your teams is allowed to score points. The highest finishing team, the other team gets nada. Just to be clear, that is actually not happening. Uh, I'm just totally adding some stress into the team managers that are watching the broadcast uh, and now freaking out. They've got a new rule to try and understand. We've got a message from Will Chadwick who tells me you need to save a very marginal amount of fuel every lap. We're talking lifting off into a couple of, couple of corners here and there, and you make this race a no-stop race. And that's what the drivers are all thinking about, yep. clearly, JP. Lap times for grid and go, fallen back off to 135, slower than the race leader, even with fresher tires. I think you pretty much just said exactly what's going to mind. That's almost like a Garrett Mains type of strat. Because here's the thing, Watkins Glen, whenever the official series go there, they seem to have a trend of 30 laps as the race, but the fuel run is, if you push, 28 laps. If you do what you just said and do what he has used the phrasing of, IMSA-style fuel save, you can make the race. 
it's not to IMSA style right now. But if you if that ends up being the case, it's pretty quite simple. You just need to drive the you just need to back up the corners and it's enough if you're full tilt, you're not making saving is because you enter the corner with less speed because you're not so much on throttle. You don't have to be so aggressive on the brakes. You don't have to be so aggressive with the steering. You could just be gentler with the car. Surprisingly, sometimes you can be faster while fuel saving than you would be while you're trying to go pedal to the metal, go, 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 go. And some drivers need to sometimes think about that and recognize that as well. It's it may, probably only a corner here and there that they're actually doing the saving as well. At what point then do we start to see some fighting? Because maybe Cooper Webbs has been saving a little bit more fuel riding behind Enzo Benito. Almost into the final 10 minutes, JP. Yeah, just good give or take five, six laps or so you can have in terms of the margin here. Just at this point, Red Line's just nailing the strategy. Just They don't even need a push. Better yet, even with the save, it's still faster by a couple hundreds a lap, and that's all they need to do with the margins here. It's the better question. Does Webster try and do something on the final lap or in the final laps? Or does Benito just lead the whole race? This tire variation, right? The the fact that these tires fall off in a different way to the GT3 tires, to the Super Formula tires, the IndyCar tires, means that teams are all having to try and figure out these strategies. Slight miscalculation maybe for Grid and Go. Williams Esports and Carly Anson still with Oscar Mangan, Griffin Gardner, Norbert Leitner, Luca Alpert, all just running behind them. Wave Italy Racing and Pike from Beach side by side as Timu Toika is along for the ride with Pablo Espez. Chevy Camaro on the outside for Pikes from Beach. Ford Mustang on the inside. Remember, identical in terms of performance, just slightly different looking. Toika still alongside and now with the slight overlap of his nose. Inside line onto the power slightly earlier and trying to carve his way forward to 14th. Had to be patient to get the move done, but eventually secures it. Good defense by Toika. And remember, Toika these days runs a lot more on the roadside. Cut out by his now former team boss for good reason. But remember on the oval side, he built a lot of experience with Nexus Esports. One of the better programs you can throw on the eNASCAR side. He's gonna be difficult to pass Espes is still trying his best, though, in the midst of that shakeup you see on the pylon. Others are just, well, you the choo-choo train, <laughs> as side by side. In towards Lukey Heights. Ooh, be careful on the outside here, because you can be run out wide. If you're brave, you get the inside down into the braking zone. No ABS to help you, and a big lock up there from Pablo Espes. Watch as Timu Toika, with that experience, backed up the corner that little bit more. And as we reach 10 minutes left to go, your leader's heading back through the southern loop. I'm pretty sure lap time's just over 90 seconds. We should... Seven laps to go, six laps to go, something like that. Give or take, believe so. The estimate is about 29 total laps if we stay green. But lots of lap traffic coming up here. And the more traffic, the more potential incident issues. Red line, mind you, started to pull away with some of the traffic. Look at this run, though. Good chance to be able to get the poke around at this point. Why not? But everybody else saying, why not me? Oscar Mangan around the outside on Carl Janssen. Impulse Racing now having to defend as Eclipse Simsports up the inside in through Siberia. It's banked in on the entry. Throw your speed in through the corner and then be careful getting the power down to not run out wide. And Griffin Gardner cycles up in front of Norbert Leitner. Really well executed and judged move as well. I think the fuel numbers have been put to the back of mind for these teams now. It's a marginal fuel save. Maybe they've saved a little bit extra and can afford to be a bit more aggressive now that they know exactly how much grip the rear tires are going to give them. For Sherry Esports as well, Luca Alpert's riding in this, well, blue and yellow machine on its interior, but this is a team that at least we've been slowly seeing grow outside of their endurance racing bubble, getting more and more confident, more and more speed as well. 
And at the back of what is a five-car train, in these cars in particular, JP, you've got to be very careful about how deep into the corners you go. Yeah, we've touched upon this a ton today. And it's getting to where you mentioned a lot of the connections real world. Williams, of course, the first of those. But teams like Sure amongst those now into the new wave. Those that are, I wouldn't say playing catch up, but I would say starting to fall into the pattern of getting into what we talked about. Get connections to the virtual world to be able to find the latest talent and to be able to help on the development side. Sure is amongst those with real world racing experience of the Rebels uh, on the road course side as a group. It's right now in the midst of this battle here that's continuing to build that speed and that data is helpful. There's a reason that on the oval side, there's a lot of provenance and a lot of people who will cling on to people from the real world because even then, real world to sim, data is critical and getting viewpoints and input from a real world driver helps the sim team and vice versa. Now you mentioned the real world connection for Shara Esports, of course, when Shara Sport and Phoenix Racing linked up in the real world, the team in the virtual world, same collaboration continues. Just with a new livery, new name, and some new drivers too. They signed the South African Chris Shorter from Impulse Racing, who uh, ended up not competing here today, but has very much bolstered the ranks of their lineup and should be a, a welcome addition in the months and years to come as they continue to try and be stronger and stronger. It's Ford on Ford, red line on red line, Benito versus Webster. I mean, they've kept each other within a car length for now, going on 20, 25 minutes. Not a foot's been put wrong. Last thing they'll want to do is a bit more drama and contact between the two of them. But because of how the championship is sitting right now, JP, there you can see the top right corner of your screen, the number 70 car that runs in second, second in points. Uh, or rather, uh, that runs in... I got myself confused there because this is the problem with not having car numbers and two teams that have the same logo but no team names. And I'm trying to figure out which is which. I mean... That's kind of the goal, right? No, Whatever we don't want to be are... confused. Grid and Go have made our life very easy. It's Grid and Go 1, it's Grid and Go 2. I mean, you can have the number Yes car instead. But we, we don't see the numbers on the tower. That's the real issue. Now, Castro Lado's had a small issue. Lost out to Dominic Kaufman. These two have dropped well off the back of your leaders as well. And I think Castro Lado might might really be having to save a lot of fuel given how slow off the corner he was. I wonder if he's not even getting to 100% power now with the five and a half minutes left to go and your race leaders hopefully closing on traffic and going to start putting up a bit of a fight for us towards the front. Carl Janssen's got a deal now with Impulse Racing because look at Oscar Mangan. Half a lap since we last checked in on these drivers and JP 1.3 seconds clear. Yeah, Magnus pretty much making it clear. I'm a lot more comfortable right now. You know what? I think I'm on my number. Let's run. Everyone else, well, first of all, Jensen's having a time. Everybody else is having a harder time even getting to run on Jensen outside of, well, Magnus. There are the drivers in our fight right now. Jensen bottom left, Norbert Leitner in the middle, and then Luca Alpert. It'll go to the long side of the track. Jansen having to really go early onto the brakes just to get it slowed down in time. Doesn't feel like he's got the braking potential compared to some of his competition. Luca Alpert's trying to figure out which direction he wants to go on that all black entry for Impulse Racing to make his move, but smooth at the wheel, not looking too stressed, not looking too worried. Back towards the line next time by it will be three laps left to go three laps to sort it all out and red line still yet to change positions surely no team orders justin surely right yeah surely surely trust us pinky swear no seriously though they have been almost coordinated like well I'm trying to think of a good metaphor that isn't very basic, but I'm failing at that. Let's put it this way. They've gone into very simple orders. Let's just go one, two, and whatever happens, as long as we're one, two, then the plan is executed. Well, as Johnny has said in our Twitch chat, 
They are on Ferrari team order levels. No fight allowed. Now, that is a throwback comment right there uh, to the years before F1 banned team orders because it got uh, to a certain point. Uh, they do realize this is stock car racing and team orders are kind of frowned upon in nascar in fact Ooh. are banned in it. oh my goodness that was too hard of the brakes norbert leitner you can see just how much more confident he is to go the long way around and he'll switch it back to the inside through siberia jansen's gonna get hung out to dry here he's got to be careful for luca alpert and the share machine as well full credit to norbert leitner though gives jansen the room Maybe at his detriment, though, because the Williams car holds on to the spot. And then a tank slapper for Leitner. Four-wheel slide on the rise to Lukey Heights. Yeah, that was a mix of drivers trying to back it up. Drivers missing their braking marks. And, well, just all the thought processes converging at this point. I think right now, if anything, Jansen's saving so hard, he's going to get himself turned at the rate it's going. Leitner nearly ran him over again. It is two laps to go. Let's not forget that. Back up front. Check in with your race leaders just to make sure the team orders are holding strong. Cooper Webster not forcing the issue just yet. Instead, I think Carl Jansen is going to get the same repeat move thrown on him. Norbert Leitner trying to go the long way around in towards the first hairpin at newly renamed Miller Corner. And watch here. He's going to have to set it up, JP. It's the run out of this corner that gives him the chance. Yeah, you're going to even see right there, Jansen's just having to let it roll a lot more center with how tight his margin might be, also how he's feeling in the race car. Norbert Leitner is just a lot more comfortable with just getting a little bit impatient, but so is Elpert. Slightly different lines through the kink, which is a proper corner in these cars as well. You can see the lack of grip and adhesion that they have to the surface underneath them. Bit wide for Leitner out of Siberia. Going to relieve the pressure onto Jansen, albeit momentarily. This all in the fight. Let's not forget for sixth position. It's side by side with Rincon Racing and Elliot White in the Precision Racing Esports car. 21st, 22nd and 23rd on our screen in front of us. Good recovery, though, for Anderson after the technical blip and getting, well, turn of the first lap. As a result, he's still surviving. That's the words of bright side, despite having no more TV panel. But this final lap is going to be uh, an intriguing one for a couple drivers here. Jensen's going to need, well, a lot of luck to knock the bumper put to him with how he's handling the pace. Here they are again. Fight behind the Williams Esports driver at the red line. Candidates have already headed through the southern loop and looking very, very comfortable in this 14th race of 24. There are the three drivers who have really put up a good fight for sixth position. But one more lap to go. Sherry Esports car seems like it might just be that little bit too far behind. And one more chance into Miller Corner where Norbert Leitner has set it up time and time again. First tier out of the southern loop. Was there contact on the exit, though? Because Jansen had the yeah. rear end step out on him. It might now mean that Impulse won't get the chance to make that same move. Jansen, so early, though, onto the anchors, does not have the confidence this car will slow down in time, but able to get the place locked in. And I'm curious if Norbert sends the bumper. He already tried a little boop. These drivers not used to the bump and run. It's an art form. If you were to try it, you go too hard, you wreck them. If you go too soft, well, it's like being pushed by a breeze. <laughs> well, a breeze at the front for Team Redline as they walk towards yet another victory in their quest to make it three VCO Infinity Championships in a row. They have won what is a remarkable eight races so far today. Red line one and two once more. It's Enzo Benito in front of Cooper Webster. A half smile. The job's not done, but the job's getting that much easier. Watch the rest of the cars run towards the line. It's going to be close, you'd assume, between the likes of Carl Jansen, Norbert Leitner, and Luca Alpert. Same sort of story for Oscar Pai, who's got in front of the damage Eclipse Simsport machine, although it swaps round back in the run towards the line. Crazy stuff, and maybe running out of fuel. I think he is out of gas. Look at the pace. Just ran out of steam. But 
at this point, it's pretty clear. If you save the gas, you're going to get a call. Grid and go with Corey, Cody Deep got to 26 for the final lap. A crazy stat, by the way, just to mention. Uh, the two races, uh, that's the longest amount of time that we've had between red line wins so far in the 2024 VCO Infinity. They won the first three races on the bounce. Races four and five went elsewhere before they reasserted their authority with a win in race six. Three more wins in a row before two races went in, else, uh, in other directions and now back on top and provisionally these points are not final jp but you can see them in the top right corner of your screen uh, just to emphasize as well 721 points compared to the 664 that the first non-red line team has that means red line can afford to miss a race and still have the lead well that's not going to happen they're going to be racing to race and score points but so far the well Red line strat is working very well. <laughs> it's yet another victory for Team Redline, asserting their dominance through the opening stages of the 2024 VCO Infinity. And now, past the halfway mark, that dominance continuing to stretch itself out. A look at the results with Benito a quarter of a second in front of Webster. Those team orders very much playing out in the way that was expected with Dominic Kaufman for Drago Racing, pulling away from Ricardo Castroledo for Coanda in the closing stages. Oscar Mangan for Altus Esports climbs up a couple of spots to get himself into the top five, while Williams and Impulse, sixth and seventh for them. Shera Esports, six positions gained to get up to eighth in front of Eclipse, the Apex Racing Team, and Coanda Esports, who, with their lack of fuel, end up dropping down to 11th, but still in front of the second of the BS, uh, rather, the lead of the BS Plus competition machines after uh, Joshua Anderson dropped down through the order. Was Cooking Racing Adventures, 13th, Pike from Beach, uh, 14th, and I'm sure Mike Spangler will love that. The traitor finishing behind the stalwart Jack Sedgwick, Williams Esports Academy, Wave Italy Racing Team, Team PGZ, SP, Altitude, and Brabham. Your top 20, and we'll cycle through the rest of the names. It's another stretch of wins, it would seem, for Team Redline. But, you know, Justin, there's only two more races in this Xfinity car left. We are heading back towards more predictable cars, more known cars. If Redline are going to perform this well in cars that are unpredictable, they'll feel confident about the things they already know. Yeah, at this point, I think Redline's proven in all the car types so far, at least. They've had the consistency. We've seen them in the major events do it that all throughout the past well. How many years now? About seven, eight, nine years. Is that a good reference point? But if they're this good in a stock car, if you get themselves gathered up as a grouping like that today, it's going to be very difficult to beat them in the other two stock car races with how in sync both of them were in terms of the Ferrari star style strategies while covered in Max Verstappen logos. <laughs> It was a good strategy in terms of, I think, just realizing they were going to pull out that advantage. And now, as mentioned, SF Lights at Monza up next. Indy Cars at Road Atlanta. MX-5s at Monza. And then we head back to the Xfinity car for what will be the penultimate time. So plenty of action to come here on Race Spot TV. So don't go anywhere because, as mentioned, the Temple of Speed always brings its fair share of chaos, fair share of drama. And that's what lies in front of us here. Still plenty of racing left to go. We'll be right back here on the VCO Twitch channel with the rest of VCO Infinity. The challenge is time flies. Session on point tactics so fine. Every race's goal is to cross that line. 24 combos, the challenge is real. In sim racing battles, only one will seal. Team red lines, the mark, the crown is still. In this relentless pursuit on the virtual wheel. The night wears on. Race against the clock. 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise. It's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop, feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick, each team's dream so vivid and thick.
lights up. Game on, the virtual grid set. PCO infinity, winning champions of that. 24 races, round the clock thrills. 55 teams battle with skills to kill. Striving for glory, chasing the lead. Every team's aiming to take this speed. Five cars, five tracks, pure adrenaline scenes. Racing through combos in the sim machine. Race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Race against the clock, 24 hours, the action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Through digital bands, under virtual skies, you slap the challenges, time flies. Decision on point tactics, so fine. Every race's goal is to cross that line. 24 combos, the challenge is real. In sim racing battles, only one will seal. Team red lines, the lock, the crown is steel. In this relentless pursuit on the virtual wheel. The night wears on. Race against the clock, 24 hours. The action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team's dream so vivid and thick. Race against the clock, 24 hours. The action doesn't stop. Feel the pulse rise, it's all so quick. Each team screams so vivid and thick. The night wears on, the stakes get higher. Each team's resolve, fueled by fire. In this virtual cockpit, skills are king. The ultimate goal, the victory to bring. The saga's live, 24 hours of fire. Where only the best survive, join the race. Lights up, game on, the virtual grid set, PCO infinity, winning champions of that, 24 races, round the clock thrills, 55 teams battle with skills to kill, striving for glory. Welcome back to VCO Infinity. It's time for race 15. It's the Super Formula Lights at Monza. Myself, Ian O'Leary, returning to the commentary box alongside Justin Prince for the next race. I think the story of uh, overnight over here in Europe, anyway, Justin, has been just how dominant Team Redline have been and where we go with this race from here. Well, it's about catching them from this point on. I mean, it's quite simple, yes just hoping some time, some way, there's a slip up to be able to take advantage of the point standings right now. But for Team Redline as a whole, races like the last one with the Xfinity Series card, Phil Bywin kind of emphasized the strat. Just get points, doesn't matter how, just get solid points, that's the goal. Everyone else that's had speed, they haven't matched the consistency car to car, race to race, even number to number so far. And that's why I think Redline's been doing so well is they've maintained consistency, regardless of the number on the car and regardless of the car type throughout these past, well, all rounds so far. Yeah, we've had uh, 14 races so far. Still 10 hours of VTO Infinity to go. It feels like a very, very long way to go over here in Europe since it started so late in the day. But um, it's, uh, it's it's still only 24 hours, so uh, don't worry about that. Super Formula Lights at Monza coming up next. Now, we did see VTO Infinity's first ever wet race earlier on in the Super Formula Lights category. That was at the Algarve, but we've moved over to Italy now for Monza. The story here is all always about surviving that first chicane crucially to start off your race and then seeing where you can go from there yeah that's going to be extremely important because one that's where the speed trap is but two butter yet just the amount of potential carnage if anybody tries to go well five car lanes deep into the inside line slam into everybody's side pod you're not going to survive the corner but better yet if you do survive that corner that run all the way down the front straightaway is going to be important all throughout this race when it comes to this car class just with how much speed is expected here today in monza yeah and the slipstream staying within that is going to be very very cr it crucial indeed team redline are still dominating as i re previously referenced 15 points is their current margin at Coanda Esports. That's difficult maths for me to do early in the morning. 57 is what I make that. 
from uh, third to first. Apex Racing Team further five points back. Drago Racing have really impressed me here. They're comfortably fifth. The other Coanda team struggling a little bit, but in a bit of a fight for sixth place with BS Competition. Four points behind Williams Esports Academy, who are 16 behind, and they're uh, doing better than their main team. The other BS Competition car is ninth ahead of Ultra Seed Sports, who are 10th, and the gap's at that point in the order pretty small all things considered and that, that remains even outside of the top 10 but th that says all you need to know really this is the starting grid then for race 15 of the day with crystal and taking another pole position and uh, another chance to win another race in the Super Formula Lights here today. Alex Dunn will try and take it off him as he tried to at the Algarve. Colof Paniosa and Phil Dinez will be on row two. Jaden Ladick for Drago Racing is inside the top five again ahead of Precision Racing Esports who will be delighted with sixth. WSR Esports Put Kicker and Coanda Esports are next with Josh Ladd in the Williams Esports car looking to replicate the podium from Road Atlanta. He's alongside Eclipse Simsports inside the top 10. It's Oscar Bixrud and Elliot Veyron sharing row 6 followed by Raphael Renhofer for Share Esport and the Wave Italy Racing Team who took their first win of 2024 VCO Infinity a few races ago in the MX5s. It's Samkoita and Rasmus uh, Tulminen who is uh, next. Uh, then up on the next row, uh, Yoltain and Jesse Tekela uh, running out the top 20. Erwin Lucas Lickowitz alongside Nick Schultz. Uh, Schulte Visserman, Team PGZ and Falcon Sim Racing Team are on row 11 ahead of Dallas Shot Automotive and Brabham Esports. That's row 12. XPD Racing are with uh, Maniti Racing with eight Williams Esports Academy. Quite a long way back by their standards. Visceral Esports with them on, on the 14th row. CLZ Simsport and SMP Racing Esports around at the top 30 with Kramer Racing and DLR next. Apex Racing Academy way back in 33rd alongside Samantha Tan Racing Esports. It's Olympus Esports and Team Fordzilla on the row behind them with Pike from Beach Racing who have won a race today uh, in 37th ahead of the United Dim Team. Grid and Go and Race Clutch round out the top 40 with Liam Runninger and Niccolo Venditti in the 21st row. Altitude Esports and Rinkham Racing are next to the Rockets in foot and Obsidian Racing. Then we've got ATRS and Mivano followed by uh, West Competition Racing and SOP Esports Racing to round out the top 50. And then Morad SM Squad and Screen to Speed Dream Team accelerated by Marla on the back row. 52 on the grid, not all of them having set times, but they're all in the race at least. Just quickly here, Justin, what are we expecting in towards the first chicane here? Well, I think I've already emphasized the potential of carnage, so let's go with double carnage. But second thing, second, expect drivers to try and utilize the speed quickly. Lots of emphasis, so you can already tell just to get the heat in the tires for that first corner. Pace truck about to pull in, and VCI Infinity is about to let fly for the 15th race of its third event. It's a weaving Chris Lullum who brings us to the green and now finally he'll go ahead of Alex Dunn. Carlos Paniosa tucks in as well as Phil Dinez but it's free wide for sixth position and four maybe as Coanda and uh, uh, BS Competition and all of these teams look for positions in towards the first turn. Paniosa on the outside of turning towards turn one and two but they find themselves uh, sorting themselves out in the back of the pack I'm afraid the same cannot be said. There's rear wings missing already. There's car spun around. It's what we expected in the first chicane. I was almost expecting that towards the front with the 4-1 initially there. But it's the back half where it really intensifies the floor of the back you go. The more intense the checkups after all. They're already sipping fastly through this racetrack, mind you. Already just quickly oh. going to pair of Baca, more chaos. It's the other BS competition car, the red car that's uh, come unstuck this time around and they're just having to uh, get themselves on the straight and narrow again and they do that. Coanda still side by side here with Williams Esports, Josh Ladd trying to work his way through in that car. Already up to 10th place, great start from him. There's a couple more cars in the gravel, what a chaotic start. Falcon Sim Racing Team involved in this one. Yeah, just about everybody you can think of having at least one of their team cars involved in these incidents. Now they make their way through a Scary in particular. This setup's going to be very important. Make sure you don't clip the grass as half the field mows the grass. That could very likely cause a lot of potential checkups and better yet, a lot of slip ups before you get to Parabolica for the side by side. Here we go, side by side. Speaking of which, uh, that is What's Cooking Racing Adventures getting down the inside of Coanda oh. Esports and Nanchan Guven. 
This is not good news for the Apex Racing, uh, excuse me, the Williams Esports Academy. Another car noses into the wall at the final corner. The uh, Curva Parabolica, as it previously was. And now it looks like we could be even three wide in towards turn one again, as Precision Racing Esports decide against that, in fact. Given on the inside of Oscar Victor, then for the Was Cooking Racing Adventures. On the inside line at turn seven, and they'll come off the corner absolutely locked together as well. But what a load of incidents we've seen in the opening lap of this race. Uh, an unspeakable amount of cars already coming down pit lane. I can count nine already. Yeah, that number's going to go pretty high up here with how they're racing their way through Del Raggio here. What's cooking? Trying to find a way to cook everyone's front wings off with how they're giving it space here. That's the Coanda Esports working their way through and following through is the uh, Precision Racing Esports as it side by side through the two Lesmos. Look at this in towards turn one, by the way. This is what I was talking about. <laughs> More than 10 eventually, and they're going side by side out of the pit exit and they crash again. Hey, I mean, you just used the fast repair. Why? Well, that was not, I'm afraid, well thought out from those exiting the pit lane. Uh, speaking of not very well thought out, it's side by side through Ascari, although they seem to be able to get away with it. Not sure what the wing angle that these guys have been given in their fixed setup is, by the way, but it seems quite high for a Monza setup, and maybe if they had their own choice, they wouldn't have it quite so high, but they do seem very planted through Ascari. Although then again, as I was talking about earlier on in other Super Formula Lights races, these cars do stick to the road quite well and they do tend to uh, tip towards understeer rather than oversteer. Look at this though, it's side by side. Shara getting freight trained though, so are uh, uh, Precision Racing Esports, although they're trying to make moves of their own. Was Cooking are going to be finding themselves on the outside here, getting overtaken by absolutely everybody. Down in towards turn one, it's a good move from Bixrup, but I'm afraid it's not turned out very well. They're all over the curbs, they're all into one another. It's a big mess at the Retofilio again. I think Pixford is cooking up a lengthy discussion with some people. Everyone on screen is part of the discussion. Just, I don't know about the smart move when it's two cars that can fit into the corner. It was three wide, pretty clear at least two of them trying to squeeze each other off there. And uh, Precision Racing Esports can barely control that vehicle at the moment. Shara Esports are missing their front end, are they there? Uh, or is that not even there? I don't think it is, actually, uh, now that I uh, think about it. But we'll find out as more drivers have to inevitably make their way down into pit lane. For the moment, uh, we've uh, only got around 35-ish who haven't been in. That's up towards 20 who have been into the pit lane as the uh, World Cooking Racing Adventures lose some time. Now, this is what went on to turn one. I mean, how do we even begin to unpick some of this? There's at least five people who made mistakes there, and Gwen and Go got some of the worst of it with one of their entries. And it, uh, just, I don't know what to say other than, has anyone heard of the concept of if you want to finish a race, your car has to be there for the finish? Everyone decided let's not finish, it looks like. Let's go up front because that's a little calmer. Hold on one second. They're trying to near make contact with pit drivers out of the pit lane. Yeah, that's a n nice driving from uh, whoever that is coming out of pit lane there to stay out of the way, mostly of the leaders. As Oscar Victor loses a few more places down in towards turn one here. He's getting a, a dive by Maniti, who is still side by side with Grid and Go. Visceral Esports also got through there. Looks like Maniti have found their way uh, through. There's a queue behind as well as Project Valorous in 70th to try and get themselves through. XPD Racing, SMP Racing all there as well. Queuing up to try and get through, and Oscar Bixer, who's clearly struggling. There goes Valorous. Uh, is Bixer down on straight line speed, or is he just letting them through? I'm not entirely sure, but he's now dropped the was cooking car right the way down to 19th position. I'm afraid they may have cooked themselves in this race early on. We're only, would you believe it, six and a half minutes into the race. A quite remarkable race, but maybe not in the way that we'd hoped. Yeah, that car looks like it's driving wounded with how it's slowing up down the straightaways. If you're down straight line seat beat at Monza of all places, it's outright disastrous, to say the very least. Why doesn't he come in, is my question. Well, it's quite simple as 
Do you want to lose the track position? Have to play catch up the rest of the way? That's Kiri's question. But Kale Pyde, yeah, just tried to run the high side, ran over the back of the driver in front's wheels and launched him into the barriers. So that was lap one as well. Uh, unfortunately for Eclipse and they qualified inside the top 10 had good hopes for them actually to get a good result in this race but clearly that's not happened Elliot Veyron has gone through into seventh place as Josh Ladd is continuing his recovery from a slightly below par by his standards qualifying he, he'll want to get up to the leaders nearly the top six involved in a leading train actually but more sort of conf uh, more uh, uh, more close, I, I'm trying to find a better word than close, uh, were oh. the top three, and they seem to be getting away. There's Oscar Victor serving his fast repair. Now, finally, he gets a clean car again, and he will be on his way again with 37 and a bit minutes remaining. But it's Chris Lullum leading the way, looking to take his third Super Formula Lights win of this edition of BCI Infinity, in which he took his first ever race win uh, during it. Alex Dunn, the same. But uh, he's looking to do it for the Apex Racing Team. Conor Finiosa for the Ultra Sea Sports Team also. As they see a group of three further behind. Phil Dinez, Alexander Davidson and Jaden Ledick all trying to give chase to them as well. But it's uh, Lulham who leads at the moment and is just leading the others around really. I feel like it's going to be one of those races where we're waiting for a little bit later on until we really start seeing fighting. It doesn't seem like there's much point in doing any fighting at this stage. Yeah. Pretty clear, you've seen there just from the clutch. Dunn's just saying, I don't want to leave yet. I'm just going to save fuel. Wait for the big picture because keep as many options open. It's not worthwhile to be in the clean air and knowing you can't break away. It looks like Dunn's just saying, I'm just going to ride. Lift that. Let's say here. Gets a good entry regardless. Saves some fuel. Doesn't lose any ground with it. And I don't know about your thoughts on bumping in open wheel cars, but it's not particularly one of my favorite things to watch because it makes you very, very nervous, especially around the Curva Grande. This is a corner, don't forget. I don't think he's quite doing it through here, but certainly no. down the straights, he is giving Lulham a bit of a bump. Yeah, that's a little surprising. I don't know if he needs to bump, per se. I'm always nervous on that, even with the cars that... For example, the Lara IRL1 for some time was able to use bump drafts on the ovals before that became more popular and became part of that world schedule, world championship scheduling. It's a little bit argy bargy ish in theory when it comes to some of these cars where uh, in real life you would never do that. No, exactly. It was uh, same feelings for me when the lmp 2 started doing it. I don't remember when. But there was a point when everyone realised, oh, we can actually bump draft these cars. It's pretty scary as far as uh, I'm concerned. But anyway, uh, the battle for seventh place continues to exchange positions, but this is a proper fight from 11th on back because uh, none of these guys are exchanging places for slipstreaming purposes and so on. They are properly fighting. And it's Visceral Elite Sports who prevail for now. Albin Spence, who has done a couple of the Sip Formula Lights races so far today. He's ahead of Yarl Tyen, who has done as well. Raced at the Algarve, qualified on pole, in fact, but struggled a little bit in the wet weather conditions because it started raining in the meantime from the uh, dry qualifying to the wet race. That's something you've got to contend with in the Super Formula Lights, although it doesn't look like we're going to see any rain here at Monza. The conditions couldn't be more perfect, in fact. Nice, bright, sunny, just a little bit partly cloudy skies. That's unless there's somehow a monsoon that pops out of nowhere. You never know. But I will say, this is at least, to me at least, very optimal conditions compared to if you were running a run, rain race at Monza. And, oh, wow. That was a little bit too quick on the apex for the car behind. Yeah, that's uh, Rasmus Tuminen, who just completely ran over Alberto uh, Garcia Blasco there, I'm afraid, and the XPD Racing car goes back to 20th place. Not a lot they could have done about that as we're side by side here. This is Sarah down the inside of everybody, working their way through in another group, and they do find themselves uh, working their way through nicely, thankfully. This is all for 26th position, which Rafael Brenhofer now gets into. Another battle here for 34th on backwards. There's so many groups like this up and down the field. This is almost a common point, though, regardless of car class and regardless of race type, I've noticed, though. 
And tracks like Monza, even though it's known as the Temple of Speed, you have the small packets of drivers with comparable speed that seem to just cluster together. Why are they going three wide into the Lesmos? I'm not quite sure, but some people are saying, well, well, it was cooking saying, I'm faster than you. Honk, honk, let me go. Honk, honk, let me pass. And they still can't quite do it here. Outside line into Ascari. Now, finally, is going to be the moment. But Falcon are going to get down there inside again as well and through. So as soon as you take one step forward, it's another step back, I'm afraid, for them. As Falcon get themselves ahead. That's Luca Vunks at the wheel of that one. And now the race clutch car. Yeah, Lieutenant going to try and find his way through to the inside here in the number 14 car. The a usual red for race clutch, a team very well versed in the open wheel world. And they'll be down the inside and depending on who gets the slipstream given to them here by Luca Vunks, they will prevail and it will be Vunks giving race clutch the slipstream. And so they should find themselves getting through, although they're actually going to split it evenly down the straight. It doesn't seem to matter. Race clutch will be through into turn one. You know, the interesting thing, since the fast repair, Oscar's actually set the fast slap of the race, trying to make up all this track position. But there is the main thought that also comes to mind. You've already you had to come in for repairs. You've lost all the track position. In theory, it's not even as simple as big picture there. It's get a picture frame for the mindset. You don't want to be like this battle for 33rd. That could be disastrous if there's not give and take through Del Arancia. And it looks like there's none. Yeah, certainly didn't. ATRS, it was down the inside. Jacob Reed had to give a bit of space there on the inside. And he tucks in here to 34. These guys are nearly a minute back on the leading battle, by the way, which we'll get to later because there is plenty of racing to be had a bit further back. And it's, it's a different mindset, isn't it, really, when you've had problems and you've been in for a faster pair, you've been set back a long way. It's so different to being out front and being like Chris Lillam, Alex Dunner, Carlos Vanillosa, who are legitimately in this fight for a race win here today. Yeah. Oh, and that's going to be trouble. Too much curbing that time. What on earth triggered all that? It's Ray Bitley Racing Team, one of the drivers and teams who are involved. Who else is stuck through Ascari? I think they've all been able to clear themselves at least. But uh, that wasn't a good moment at all as Jaden Lanik now gets to the front of this second group. Can these guys from fourth place on backwards maybe catch the trio of leaders? It's going to require a lot of working together in particular. If anything, looking at the Delta, they just need more realistically. They're at the edge of the draft band. To be quite safe, I'd want an extra half a second on the Delta right now. And that just requires quite simply just work together until the draft section, then slingshot down the front straight away, and then clear each other by the corner so you don't cost each other time stepping on each other. I think that there's, there's a true chance to do that if they do something. Here's the problem. All three of them, they are not as strong as your top three in the third sector coming up to the start to the run for Parabolica. They are struggling in the technical section compared to your front runners. Well, let's compare lap times here between the two groups. Chris Lillam uh, leading the line in front. Did a 42.6 on that time. It was a 42.7 for Ladik and Denez, who are in fourth and fifth. And then you've got that uh, third group, if you like, between Josh Ladd and Elliot Veyron. They also did a 30, uh, 42.6. But at some point, you've got to think that the margins are so small that... Even any amount of seconds at this stage in the race, albeit with half an hour to go, is still plenty of time. There isn't that much scope for you to actually be able to catch somebody if you're only gaining by a few hundredths a lap, because realistically, these races aren't very long and the gaps are so small. Yeah, a few hundredths. I'm basically saying I want to gain a few tenths to be more safe, to have a true shot. A few hundredths. You're basically banking on the leaders never, ever getting the pace back up with the lighter fuel. And the thing is, Phil Dinez, I want to be surprised if eventually he has his team say, okay, if you feel comfortable, make the move. 
Or you use this lap car that just showed up out of the blue as a bit of a draft leap because this could be a bridge. Or the lap car can block both lanes. Yeah, that's an uh, option, if you like. Uh, Slipstream being used, though, if uh, possible. And I think Ladic just weaving out the way there to uh, explain that fact. But there we go. Through the final corner now. And he'll continue to lead the line for them. More pit stops for those a bit further back. But I think this is going to be a story of the race from this point on. Uh, as, meanwhile, I get back to that because we've got... Chris Lillum and Alex Dunn making a run for it. Carlos Fenoyosa, for whatever reason, not able to stick with the two in front of him. And it's now maybe just a leading duo fighting for the win. And Chris Lillum has been one of the stronger drivers in the past couple of years for his respective side of the red line camp. Alex Dunn, though, we've touched upon this already. He's got open wheel experience for the rear world. I'm still surprised he makes the bump draft work. But this is a car, or a car type at least, you think he has experience in. After all, he's won and had good speed at tracks like Macau in the past year. And he's won in VCO Infinity earlier today as well, like in two different cars now, on two different occasions. He's won in GT3 and the MX-5s, looking to add a third different car to his list. Uh, I'll check if that's a record or not. It may be, actually. We'll uh, uh, find that one out for you, but we're uh, ever-increasing our number of different winners if you, or multiple time winners if you like in VCO Infinity as we go now uh, as Alex Dunn was able to become a two time winner we've now got 16 double winners or more Josh Rogers still holding the record despite the fact he's only done one of uh, winning five editions in or five races in one edition uh, quite a remarkable all-time record that still stands even through its third iteration. This is a look at the standings and all of a sudden the team redline cars are beginning to put on a bit of a fight between themselves. There's a bit of closing from Apex as well here as they get to 55 points back from the championship lead as things stand but all of a sudden it's still redline domination but it's a question of who will take it between them and it's a more difficult question to answer than it was maybe two hours ago. That's because Sam Carter's still back in the ninth position, but again, mindset is simple. As long as red line scores points, the team is happy. It's almost like I'm almost taken to this to where I know this is going to sound bad, but it's the way you approach I rating and how some may approach the stock market. If the arrow points up, it's a good thing. In this case, if the points continue to point upward for you on the board, it's a good thing. And for both of them, it's a good thing. Because they still have a big cushion over everybody else, despite the leader of those two cards in the point standings still being back in ninth. Here we go. A bit of waving around here as they get past another lapped car. That's going to be one of the stories, as I mentioned earlier, of the race. Phil Dinez is back through on Jaden Ladick for fourth position. I just wonder whether they're going to put a halt to the hostilities there while they try and catch Carlos Feniosa. And I reckon they will be able to. Very difficult for Feniosa to defend himself when he's driving on his own in third place. Yeah, I think this is to where... If anything, Fenelos is now the draft bridge to lose or essentially be a risk for the top three. Alex Dunn just played this perfectly. He, Chris Lama has to already know at this point that Dunn's using him as this fuel saving device, if anything else. But in the next couple laps, that grouping up towards Fenelos is about to get very rapid. When they're seven tenths back already, it's going to get very wild. And they still have another of the lappers, too, to battle around from that four-fall backpack. That's going to be two drivers to basically close the bridges here. If anything, that's the one reason Fenelosa hasn't dropped off entirely. There goes Davidson down the inside of Jaden Ladick into the Della Roggia. So change for fifth place as well. Can they stay with Denez? You would have thought so. And can Josh Loudon... Elliot Veyron get there as well. They've been putting in some good speed in 7th and 8th position. Would like a few more positions and a few more points as well. I think they 
will be in with these guys now. Six tenths of a second the margin. There's Leydig. He's just going to get into the back of Alexander Davison or get very close to him anyway as they try and catch Field and Ayres. This is the problem though when you're fighting like this. You can find yourself losing time when you really could ill afford it. When you really need the slipstream. Now they will get past lapped traffic. Will all of this group get past in one go? The answer to that is no. It's going to slot itself right into the middle of this group. And that could get a little bit dicey here. It's not just as simple as blue flags, blue flags here, but it's going to get very frustrating depending on how this goes. If anything, though, Davidson and Leydick are costing themselves a ton of time. If anything, Josh Ladd is saying, keep it going, guys. I want to come up with you. And he is going to with the help of Elliot Veyron. They're going to be in there. And here he goes down the inside into turn one. And Josh Ladd immediately gets up into sixth position ahead of Alexander Davidson, who loses probably more positions than he was expecting to there into turn one. Yeah, that was a strong move by Ladd. Made it stick, and better yet, Davidson had the awareness of what was coming from behind with Ladd having that momentum in the first place and had the give and take. In fact, he already knows it's not his fight. Veyron also getting by. He knows Veyron needs points for Kawanda. Absolutely, they're on the comeback trail. Here is the look from Elliot Veyron now in seventh position. Now, what are the gaps up further behind? I'm afraid there's a bit of a split in the field here now. Jaden Leydick can't quite get on terms with Bill Dines, who's very much found Carlos Venioso, and they're pushing each other on. Here goes Alexander Davidson again. It was a slight trip into the gravel for Veyron on the exit of Lesmo 2, and Davidson was right there to pick up the pieces again. Yeah, and you can see he's almost up on the wheel. Well, if anything, the Simric wants to shake itself apart with the wheel. But Veyron, another one of those drivers with lots of open wheel experience, just using the slipstream to his advantage. But the problem is that battle back from Davidson cost him a lot of time, and now he's going to need to hope Ladd gets stuck in a battle with the Drago machine to be able to drag them back in, and he's going to have to play defense again. Well, are they going to be playing defense and offense here, or is it going to be... A little bit of a different story. I think it's going to be a bit of an agreement this time around. Josh Ladd finds his way into the top five. And that may not be the worst thing Jaden Ladick has ever done because he can hitch onto the back of some slipstream and maybe get up towards a battle for a podium place because that's what Carlos Faniosa and Phil Dines are currently experiencing. Ladick and Ladd would very much like to be there as well. If they work together, they will be there. What does Ladick do into the Della Roger? He does the smart thing of staying behind. Yeah, Del Rancho, I don't think, has been the brightest spot to make the move because it's one second lost by the time you're out of the Lesmos with how things have shaped up here today with this car. But already past that halfway point, it's go time for a couple of the drivers. It's strategy time still for most of those who are in good points pain positions. Down towards Ascari for... These guys, this is a, a little bit of a change of pace further back. SOP Sports Racing. I'm sure they've made up a heap of positions in this race. They're up to 15th ahead of the BS competition car that was in a little bit of trouble on that one, but they didn't spin around or anything. So I guess compared to others' troubles, theirs were not so bad. They're 16th around half a minute back from the leaders, but it just shows you how much is going on up and down the field here with just less than 20 minutes to go in race 15 of BCO Infinity 2024. Chris Lullum leads Alex Dunn. It's still going to be between these two, but they still need to work together for a bit longer to ensure that it will be one of those two to win today's race, or this race anyway. Well, what's helping them is... You see that swap there? BS Competition did make the move to be able to get inside the top three. And well, Denez got a great run to gain some time. The problem is right now, it's still two seconds behind the leader. At this point, Denez needs them to fight up front to have a true shot. And that's not going to happen unless there's a reason for Dunn to make the move. 
think he's going to have to, even if there is a, a desire to go ahead, he might have to wait because Phil Dinez is leading the charge behind now. BS Competition are on their way. Carlos Feniosa couldn't do anything to hold him back. Now, is he maybe going to be able to bring a whole top eight into this equation? Well, that would be a bizarre moment and a slightly uh, unusual situation, I suppose. And maybe uh, Veyron and Davidson are a bit too far away at this point for that. But... Nevertheless, they'll be looking over their shoulder there, I reckon, the front two. I don't know per se, but it really depends on what happens here between Fidelosa and Denez. And in particular, how much they squeeble squabble back and forth. We already know that the squabbling between fifth and sixth spot is costing them oodles of time to the point where they've just lost that respective draft. I think Alex Dunn already knows though, if you get into a crossover battle, you add more potential of more cars. It's similar to the strategy that you would see from the team perspective, even though they are not teammates. If you want to make less variables for you for the end, just work together and cooperate until you turn it into a two car race instead of a 20 car race. Well, that may have uh, sealed the fate of a two-car race there. Carlos Feniosa getting ahead of Phil Dinez, and so this may well be a fight for the last spot on the podium, whereas the two ahead will fight for the first two spots on uh, that podium at the end of the day. Meanwhile, by the way, for Team Redline, Sam Koita is at ninth place ahead of Ayad Changuven, not really trying to catch these guys, and... I wouldn't imagine he's going to be able to either. Seems that SMP are off the road. Uh, are they? No, that just having a brief internet blip. Uh, oh, no, they are dropping down the order, actually. But I think it's just a couple of positions lost in general battling. SOP now move up into 14th ahead of the other BS competition car. And this is the uh, the blue BS competition car you're seeing up towards the front, driven by Phil Dines. The red car is driven by Yo Tyne in 15th for the moment through Ascari they go and there are the leaders now more lap traffic in between them how is this one going to be played out by the four oh. battling for third place that's a good question right now the traffic's been somewhat cordial it depends on the mode but those packs have indeed converged you are mentioning drivers falling to the pylon uh, that's part of the reason why I think yeah that was SMP 12 was right the first time <laughs> Uh, doubting myself. Fatsev Gatsev going for a spin at the first chicane. And he's dropped off our pylon on the left-hand side. Dropped out the top 16. Oh. Yeah, these drivers are getting a little bit too squabble-squabble to be able to close up any gap. If I think right now they might almost get the sense with the way they're driving here that the battle is more for third than it is to get up to first right now amongst these drivers. It's not going to be easy past Inez because he's looked very comfortable in the draft and in front of the draft. Yeah, I don't know. I think they've given up in some ways. Uh, for this one, as there's drama up ahead, Alex Dunn has got it wrong, and I'm oh, no. afraid Apex Racing Team are going to miss out here. Oh, and he's spun around trying to re-emerge as well onto the racetrack. The Apex Racing Team will not be winning at Monza, and I'm afraid it is a... Lack of front wing that's going to befall Alex Dunn here. Apex Racing Team's recovery is short-lived. I'm going to need to see what happened here because if it's what I think it was heading into Del Rancia, yeah, oh. just ended up getting too close, missed the breaking point. Remember the game he was playing? And that's got to be significant damage. He does not have front suspension grip. That is going to be a fast repair for Dunn. It is. That's day done, you could argue. Race done? Sorry. Uh, meanwhile, battle for second place it is now is really on. Josh Ladd back into the podium places. It could be the second Super Formula Lights race in a row that he takes a podium after he did at Road Atlanta last time around. Carlos Feniosa, the one trying to take that off him, although Phil Dinez is giving him the slipstream. So Williams will be through. What about Jaden Ladick? He might well be as well as the, it's going to be too wide. Three wide, maybe <laughs> more in towards the first chicane. Josh Ladd to the inside, and Williams Eastbourne. Oh no! Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, all four of them go for an incident. The others arrive on the scene. All of a sudden, Alexander Davidson's on the podium. 
Oh my goodness, all that you can say is Ladd missed the corner. I think Ladd cooked the corner, and because of that, that caused the issue for the quick left hand back through that said section. Unbelievable. Very predictable, but unbelievable. Well, Jaden Ladick is all of a sudden in second position. And now we really don't know who's going to be on the podium. What a mess down in towards turn one. We'll get a look at what happened and try and figure out why this all happened. Just lads down the inside. He was late on the brakes. He spins on him on his own there by the looks of that. Yeah, but the problem is where he spun was right next to every one of his competitors. And he just been four different drivers races here i think a lot of them now might have to take the repairs too fenelosa looks like he's struggling even to make tape with the lap cars uh, yes he is really struggling actually is fenelosa although i don't see any visual damage there clearly is some because he is struggling in eighth place now will he soldier on though we're at that stage now with 12 and a half minutes to go that if you do get damaged then you might well try and continue this will be a good view from Jaden Ladick because he sort of saw it all before in front of him he's to the outside of Fenioza here but it is Ladu spins on his own Denez gets spun around uh. as a result Fenioza goes straight into them I think Ladick hit them as well and he's able to continue on quite calmly actually into second place Fenioza's into pit lane yeah it looks like Quite simply, Lad missed that, as I said, too strong to the corner. It's almost like a beat difference. You know what I mean? Like heartbeat or kind of a one, two, three count. That looked like a miss on the one count for the break mark. For Davidson, remember, he's been aggressive in terms of battles. Eventually, it's going to take. It's like, you know what? Huh. Oh, thank you very much for all those positions. This is what happens when I have give and take sometimes. Yeah, I'm not sure which Coranda car that was ahead of him. I think it was Elliot Veyron, but they did not pick the right way to go there. It was a 50-50 choice, I'm afraid. It uh, went wrong as far as Coranda are concerned. There's Josh Ladd back out there again, having stopped as well. Faniosa is back to 11th. Uh, Josh Ladd down to 15th. What it has allowed us to do, though, is see some new teams inside the top 10. Visceral Esports and Albin Spets is 8th, ahead of Maniti Racing and Project Valorous. I think it's absolutely fantastic for those three teams to be in the top 10 because uh, they haven't been very much so far today. There's the choice from Elliot Veyron, not the right one, I would say, in hindsight. I mean, he was already committed to the right side of the racetrack in the first place, and if, at that point, for the Frenchman and former F4 runner-up, you had to go somewhere. If you just keep your foot in it, like at the stock car, you're not going to make it. You're absolutely not going to make it in these cars. No, you've got to be uh, careful uh, of that. Now, none of those uh, teams I just mentioned, by the way, apart from Visceral, actually, have had one top 10 uh, so far today. Maniti uh, and Valorous have not had a top 10 yet here in VCO Infinity 2024. So it'd be great to see them get finish there by the end of the next 10 minutes. But there will be some hard charging teams from behind looking to try and take that off them. Josh Ladd will be one of them. Yo, Tyen is not particularly hard charging in the respect that he's had problems in this race. However, he will be looking to make some overtakes, although they are quite a long way from the top 10 here, around 10 seconds behind. Just ahead of them, it's XBD Racing. As we go back up front, because Drago Racing are, well, under fire from WSR Esports, but they hold on just about to second place. And now this is where it gets back to one moment. Davidson's got good composure, has the give and take that you would expect in this type of situation. Then it's almost like he's like, I checked the box. Now it's time to go back to racing hard. Then I'll go back to the check box if I failed the task successfully. It's almost like a balancing act with himself with all this. Oh, by the way, uh, remember the R Team Redline machine. Uh, guess what? It's in fifth. Yeah, a good recovery for them, actually. They're only now 11 points behind or ahead, excuse me, of the other teammates. And the next placed, next best place car, 59 points back, Coranda Esports, who are sixth and seventh at the moment, and third and sixth in the standings. Uh, down in towards turn one. 
these two will go again. Less than nine minutes remaining. How are they going to play this one between themselves? Because again, there's the situation of wanting to keep BS competition and Redline uh, anchor under at bay as they try and chase in. And they will very much like to keep this a battle just between themselves. There are the other drivers, including the two Koanda cars, trying to help one another catch those up ahead. Not long to go now in this race, though, for them to really make a difference. It's been excessively quiet, though, for Guvan. It's to the point where you almost forgot Guvan was in the race. That's how much we haven't seen him today. But with all that's happened here, it's like, thank you very much. I'll take the points. We needed a plus 50. That gets them a solid cushion, in fact, over ART. Yeah, it's not bad. 19 points would be that gap with uh, 22 over the Drago Racing team, who've really impressed me today, I've got to say. Not that we uh, didn't think they were a good team before, but it wasn't a fantastic start for them. Now, though, they're on a great run of form. They've uh, finished in the top 10 every race since race 9, and that is... Uh, a race, uh, uh, sorry, a streak of seven it would be if they continue this one. I've got maths right there. I think so. And so it's uh, it's a good run to the top five for them. Here they go out the final corner. Jaden Nadick will be benefiting from the slipstream offered up by one of the lap cars just up in front of him. And that might well just keep Alexander Davidson at bay for another lap. They'll lift off though. And Nadick will have to duck around the car pretty quickly. Now Davidson will close in, but with seven minutes to go, he elects again to wait for a better chance later on. Like I said, he shows good composure, good give and take in situations like that, but then the intensity level just ramps up a touch bit and then it's like boom, boom, boom. Now here's the thing. If he does it the wrong time, any sort of move here, Phil Tenez and Sam Goddard's going to immediately swallow them up because they're quickly closing up to this. In fact, they're just about in drafting range already. Looks like it. Uh, by the way, I think we've got five laps to go, including the one that we're on at the moment. We'll get confirmation a little bit later, but Chris Lullum looks like he's on his way to a third race win of uh, his career in VCO Infinity and also this edition itself. All coming in this car. Are we going to see somebody sweep the races in a car? here today. It is still on for Chris Lullum. They've all come in the Super Formula Lights. He's got a race at Daytona to come as part of race 20. And then the penultimate race is going to be at Phillip Island. Nobody has ever won all of the races in one car, in one edition of VCO Infinity, including Josh Rogers' great run at the very first edition. He won four out of five LMP2 races that edition. Nobody has won 100%. Out of the final corner go Drago Racing and WSRE Sports Book Kicker. Again, it's a similar story for Jaden Ladick. There's another car in front of him for him to uh, get a bit of slipstream off, and this has got to be helping him stay in second place. Yeah, I, that's going to be extremely helpful, if anything, as well, to build a buffer on behind, especially since Goddard just jumped up the fourth spot. Now, when this car figures out what to do here, that's a bigger prerogative, for example. Pretty clear, lap traffic doesn't want to move off the racing line yet. Well, this is making things slightly tricky. Down the inside for Davidson. He's not going to get a nice line into the Della Roggia by any means. So he'll nip through. Does this offer Ladic that little bit of a margin, those few car lengths he needs, to try and drive this advantage home and take second place, maybe without a battle and without too much trouble? I think it's going to be traffic, give it traffic, take it away, because right now that United Sim Team machine's parking in front of some of these cars here with how these checkups are looking. It's not good for the group uh, behind either. Team Redline ahead of BS Competition. And that looks like a position secured for the moment. That would lose them three points in their championship lead of 15. They would still hold 12 over their teammates who are about to go for a double race win, it seems, here. Two in a row. Excuse me, they lost the last one. Uh, no, no, I was correct the first time. Uh, they have 
go, would indeed go for two in a row, which they did manage as well uh, for races 10 and 11. Out towards the line again for Jaden Ledick. He's got nearly a second. Davidson is very nearly uh, out of slipstream range, and Ledick trying to accelerate that process by weaving down the front straight. And I think he's just about done it right now. I just feel like Ladek is l a little bit stronger right now at this point of the race now in the clean space and in the technical areas. Davidson, I think, has lost the draft. He's just about lost it. I think so. And that could be it as far as uh, WSR are concerned. It could be a podium that they're resigned to uh, in this uh, 15th race of the day. Drago Racing have been second and as high as this in the past. It was race two where they last managed to uh, uh, get up the order so high. On that occasion, they were uh, second to Josh Thompson in the MX-5s at Phillip Island. What a race that was, by the way, if you were with us earlier on. A great way to start VCO Infinity as the second race ended in last lap drama. And the team Redline awarded the win after a penalty given to Kowanda Esports at the line, or, or post-race, I should say, even. So uh, that was a great way to start the day, but it's now become the Team Redline show as far as the standings are concerned. The battle for fourth place still on here, weaving around for Ladick, who looks to be OK. Maybe Coyton has even got a chance to get near to Davidson and challenge for a podium. I think he's already very much composed and thinking... I'm going to pass him here on the last lap, am I? Because he didn't follow the weave on Davidson. He already knew that can actually cost you some time. Just the expertise really coming to play, just letting the straight lines come into play and prevail. It's going to require a rapid run, but it is possible in the final couple minutes here to be able to make this pass and pretty quickly. Yeah, one... Uh, or just 145 and change to go now as we be on the final lap next time around not quite just yet but next time round the white flag will be shown to race leader Chris Lullum can Phil Dinez help out Chris Lullum and his team and get past Sam Kreuter here into well, maybe not this chicane but maybe a little bit later on is Davison under a bit of threat here? We've maybe got a bit of drama to come in the final part of race 15. It's been drama filled. Unfortunately, most of that drama has been down to crashes. Hopefully a few less of those as we continue with VCO Infinity and the nine races remaining after this one. Two tenths picked up so far. The first two sections for Cotter. And that's only going to get even quicker for the drafting sections coming up here once they get out of Ascari to set up the run to Parabolica. I think Goddard's nearly got it here. He just needs to get with another couple car lanes to try and do something without it being a lunge. Might have to be. It's last lap time, and so those kind of moves generally become a little bit more acceptable. Don't think Davidson's quite close enough now for those two behind, so it may well just be a battle for fourth and fifth between Team Redline and BS Competition, but... You never know on this last lap. With mere seconds remaining, Chris Lullum uh, trips the beam. He will go over for one more lap around here at Monza. What can Phil Dines do for fourth place? Here he comes into turn one. He's going to push Sam Crater by the looks of things. This is interesting. Clearly waiting for later on on this last lap. Is here that are thinking big picture on the whole championship, not wanting to disrupt things? If anything, I think you know what the big picture is realistically. He could have a two for one special if, because they got Davidson right on the platter. They have. Davidson made a bit of a mistake out in the first he came, by the way. And so now he's really in trouble. He's got to hang on to this podium for WSR as they go through the Della Roggia. Now, the, uh, the two Lesmos. Now, these next two breaking zones after this are quite short. So where is this move going to come? Has to be down the final straightaway, down the front straightaway here. If not, the run up towards Parabolica but on a lunge. They do have traffic ahead. That's going to play a massive factor here into Ascari. Here we go. 
WSR looking for their first podium of the day into Ascari. It's worked out rather nicely for them. In fact, they've only been inside the top 10 once in this edition of VCO Infinity. WSR Esports Pop Kicker would very much like their first time in the top three. They weave left and right, defending, and Kreuter goes on the grass to try and overtake. That's not going to work out at all. And Phil Dines is going to go through on the inside. Meanwhile, their teammates, Chris Lollum, is going to take the win at Monza. It's a red line domination again. Another win for them. Are they going to be 4 4 5th, though, in the second car? It looks like it will be 4th. Sam Kreuter risking it all there for a podium place. I'm not sure Sam was expecting the squeeze back to the right, but at that point, was he... I, I think he needed to switch to the left quite simply in the heat of the moment. You just take what you think might be best and hope they give space. He did a great job to avoid contact, though, and all that. He certainly did. Well, Chris Lullum becomes the uh, driver with the most open wheel wins in VCO Infinity history outside of the IndyCar. But even if, uh, to be fair, if you count the IndyCars, then he's got the most wins there too. That's his third of this edition of VCO Infinity. And he takes it by seven seconds over Jaden Ladick. But I agree. And, and uh, we, uh, as far as Sam Quote goes, and it, just putting our sensible hats on here, if we can, if we can try, it doesn't seem very sensible for me for a championship leader to be trying to overtake anybody on the grass. I don't, you know, even if it's for a podium or for last place, I mean, it doesn't seem like the best idea to me. Still keep an eye on the battles on the screen, but the main thing that comes to mind, and that is he thought he could easily get the point. And every point could very well matter in the end. If it really... Well, first off, great drag race. Second thing's off, though, for the championship conversation, human. That might be something they might point towards if it comes down to the point tally. But right now, Redline still looks to be in the driver's seat. They certainly do. It's a sixth win for this part of the Red Line crew and a 20-second overall VCO Infinity win for Team Red Line. It is Chris Lullum who takes his third and he does it by 7.1 seconds ahead of Jaden Ladig. Drago Racing consolidating their top five place overall. First podium for WSR Esports Book Kicker who hang on ahead of the leaders, the Team Red Line. Uh, 70 car, it's BS Competition rounding up the top five with then the two Coanda cars. Visceral Esports, Maniti Racing and Project Valorous, uh, the latter of those two getting their first top 10 of the day. Carlos Fanayosa recovers to 11th uh, ahead of Josh Ladd. They both had problems and a pit stop throughout that one, but the best placed of those who stopped anyway. XVD Racing finished 13th ahead of SOP Esports Racing and SMP Racing Esports. Round at the top 15. Alex Dunn recovers to 16th after losing his front wing and most mobility in his front right tyre at the second chicane. German Sim Racing, STR, BS Competition and Eclipse round out the top 20. Race Clutch was cooking racing events in Olympus were the last drivers and teams within one minute. And it was Gio Cortese holding off Jacob Reed there for the last spots inside the top 25. Team Fordzilla were next ahead of Blue Rose team. Pipe from Beach Racing, who have got one race win today. Martin Syrotech and Absolute Motorsport Asilif. And Brummy Sports round out the top 30. 31st is the Apex Racing Academy car ahead of Mavano, who were only uh, a few tenths back. So we're altitude in 33rd. Then it's Rincon Racing, West Competition Racing and DLR to round up those on the lead lap. Kramer Racing Esports, the first car one lap down. And if United Sim Team, more in the SEM squad and Precision Racing Esports. You have to qualifying well, finish down in 40th. 41st was Team PDZ, but then we get to those few more down. Grid and Go and Williams Esports Academy were both two down. Then those who didn't really uh, get to see the checkered flag. ATRS uh, Esports 5 down, another 4 to screen to speed. Then Shara 13 down on the day. Falcon Sim Racing and Wave Italy Racing Team retired in the same crash. Uh, Liam Runninger and Antal Sabo rounded out the top 50. Then it was CLZ Simsport and the other Grid and Go car that never really got past the opening lap. Well, uh, an interesting race at Monza, I think it's fair to say, just an incident filled, but uh, drama at the end to go with it as well in terms of uh, on-track battling. Overall, a decent race. A very strong race from Team Redline as a whole at the front of the field, I will say. But Alex Dunn, you got to feel for him because he was 
trying to get it to where it was a two horse race and there was the one risk of doing what he was doing getting that close to the rear wing of the red line machine in front you can miss your breaking point in that and that was one of the main dignifiers of why we've seen such dominating win in the very end for chris loam better yet though some wild moments and some wild hands by some drivers in the midst of some carnage filled moments throughout that one uh, still plenty of wild moments to come. Stay with us here uh, on the uh, VCO Esports channels. We'll be here with you for the remaining nine hours of VCO Infinity. Race 16 is coming up in a few moments' time. Justin Prince will be uh, leaving me, and it will be Zach Sweeney joining me for the next couple of hours. Stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments' time with Race 16. Welcome back to VCO Infinity and welcome back to Road Atlanta as well as we go IndyCar racing for the first time in a little while to take you to the two thirds mark in the 2024 edition of this great event. It's myself, Yuna Leary, Zach Sweeney joining me for the next couple of races and it's fair to say, Zach, since you've been away and uh, since you were last in the booth, it's been a real change in terms of what we're seeing in the title fight. Team Redline all of a sudden pulling clear dominantly in VCO Infinity. Yeah, I mean, we had that momentary sort of 
temporary hope that we had for sort of a couple of races. I think it was around about, uh, what, what was it? I think it was race four, uh, where Parker White took the first victory away from Redline at that uh, Xfinity race at Monza. After that, we had a couple of different people winning. Min Lewis ended our stint last night being like, Let's hope we're going to wake up tomorrow to a really, really close championship fight. But Redline are leading by 15 points, which is a pretty big gap to uh, obviously close. The only thing is, uh, as well as the, the the next closest card to Redline is Redline, then behind that is an even bigger gap to the rest of the field. So it seems that Infinity is once again being Redlined. Yeah, it could be about those two going into the final race, in all honesty. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a difficult situation to see is get a similar finale to what we did in 2022 where Redline and Urano were just separated by three points at the end after a great final race at Spa in the LMP2 so that's going to be a bit more difficult to achieve I think on this occasion however it's still going to be uh, well worth staying with us and I hope that you will through the remainder of today's racing next coming up though it's the Indy cars all over again we'll only see these uh, cars four times throughout the VCO Infinity for 2024 not taking these to Monza, but we are taking them, Zach, to Road Atlanta, which is an interesting choice. A really short lap and a quick lap indeed as well in terms of average speed for these teams and drivers to contend with. There are your current point standings. 12 points that Team Redline currently hold over their teammates. Coanda at the moment, 59 away from top spot, even being in just third place. There was hope there briefly that Apex Racing Team were getting back into it with, when they were running in the top two, but Alex Dunn's crash has sent them back further once again. Yeah, uh, of course, the duality of, of Alex Dunn was the winner, of course, the MX-5 race in Portimao to sort of reignite that championship charge for Apex, and then unfortunately was the one to bring them back down a little bit but still up there in p4 uh, of course the prize money on offer uh would still see them take sort of 150 dollars after this event which to be fair is not exactly what they would have wanted but it's still something to come off of after all that hard work of course redline are looking to secure the big bucks at the top let's have a look at the starting grid and and say that Redline have done well again in qualifying. Ryan Bonneveld is on pole, though, head of Diogo Pinto and then Gustavo Ariel. Jose Soria for United Sim Team is within a tenth of pole as well. Then it's the Apex Racing Academy and Drago Racing on row three. Uh, seventh position is going to be the Apex Racing Team and Luca Kita. Matti Kaja Soja for the Blue Rose Team uh, is eight for head of Coanda Esports and Mavano Corsa rounding out the top ten. Grid and Go and Maniti round out row six. The uh, second of the Coanda cars is 13th. That's Michael Romanidis alongside Magnus Nielsen. It will be Crittengo.com Esports, the second car in uh, 15th place as well. Uh, then it's Race Clutch. The next row will be Pike from Beach Racing and uh, Altus Esports. Running at the top 20 will be Rincon Racing and Sherry Esport with Eclipse Sim Sports qualifying 23rd on this occasion. Precision Racing Esports 22nd. It's uh, Pedro Sanchez Albert down in 23rd ahead of Impulse Racing and DLR Sim Lab who are 25th along with the Svalkan Sim Racing team. Williams Esports Academy are having a difficult couple of races there. Down in 27th here with Parnell Racing on that rope. Waverly Racing Team and Team PDZ round out the top 30. Carl Janssen all the way down in 31st alongside Alec Bergstrom. This is now a second back. At, uh, James Armstrong for Brabham Esports 33rd at XPD Racing, Tested Automotive and Olympus Esports are next with Project Valorous and Kremer on the next row. Pro uh, Rocket Simsport and then Screen to Speed are on the uh, rest of the top 40, followed by Visceral Esports in 41st. Altitude next. West Competition Racing and German Sim Racing are on row 22 ahead of Team Fordzilla and STR Esports. SOP Esports and SMP Racing are back here on row 24. So many acronyms back here. SRZ, uh, CRZ even, uh, Simsport on 49th for their obsidian and what's quick and racing adventures who are quite far down as far as Fraser Williamson is concerned and then the rest of them it's time to go racing at World Atlanta the Indy cars return to VCO Infinity for race 16 and already there's a car in the wall in the background Sen can't be set for Ryan Bardeval though who gets off to a good start and Pierce competition have converted a pole position into an early race lead
Yeah, oh goodness me, who's this off the road? The 57, sort of at the back end of the field. Of course, they are going to be very quickly at the back end, but back to the front. And Ryan Barnevel doing exactly what he needs to do. There you can see the 57 trying to get this way back going again. I think they have with no further drama. Side by side in the background as well. That's the Blue Rose team versus Apex going into uh, this very, very important double right-hander. But the most important thing is at the front, everyone sort of kept their own positions. Track position vital here at Red Lanta and BS Plus competition doing their best foot forward. Down the back straight for the first time. The first side by side comes outside of the top 10. Only just though, it's between Grin and Go and Mavano Corsa on the way at down the hill. And here goes Koanda as well, actually, inside the top 10. I might have cut your soda, it might have been actually. Grin and Go still battling side by side though. Absolutely, well, it would be door to door, but it's uh, instead wheel to wheel. Maxim Naz and Lasse Urainen are going for it here through the final corner. Now, where does the ATRS car go? As uh, Magnus Nielsen looks for a way through, can't find one. Maxim Naz will go to the outside through turn one. He will take 13th place on this uh, start of the second lap. Yeah, nicely done. Uh, as a couple of cars, of course, off the road, Peter. just trying to rejoin. Goodness me, that is, yeah, wow. A broken rear wing as well for the Apex Racing car, and that is absolutely suboptimal for them. Just goes to show how difficult Road Atlanta is. It is indeed. It's not the teammates, is it, who have collided? Luca Kita, certainly the one with no rear wing. It wasn't Leo Garibaldi who's gone into the back of him, was it? I'm not entirely sure. We'll find out in a few moments' time when we go back and look at some replays. There's another rear wing gone here. Is this for Altus, who it is, in the orange and blue and white with a very low, low drag setup, but I'm afraid that's not going to be particularly ideal. In the corners, they weave left and right, try to get past him. Not ideal on the run down towards the chicane again. This is the problem in these opening laps. Picking your way through the carnage is key. And it's uh, not been achieved by some, I'm afraid to say. Indeed, at the final corner, coming to the green, we saw somebody in the wall. As I say, we'll get a look back at that in a few moments' time. But so much going on early on in this 16th race. And that's the thing, is just trying to pick your way through the carnage as best as you can. And goodness me, there is more drama coming up towards the S's. Of course, that blind apex through the left. Team PGZ have had some issues as well. Seems pretty sort of, yeah, that everyone wants to go for that low track setup in the early stages. Yeah, Samuel Ward at the wheel of that one. He was just inside the top 30. Now he is very much outside of it. This is down at turn seven as the red line cars and those further behind try and get themselves towards the front and get on turns with Ryan Barneveld. At the moment, only the top five are able to do so. Uh, no, you're not seeing the uh, exact live order, but I can tell you it, it is Ryan Barneveld leading ahead of Diogo Pinto, Gustavo Aero, Jose Soria and Vlad Kimichev. And those are remaining to be the top five. They are also within one second of one another and they're sort of forming a bit of a group. Xander Reed is up to sixth place for Kowanda. He is holding back a bit of a group though in his battles. He's ahead of Matikaya Soja now, along with uh, Michael Romanidis, his Kowanda teammate, who is also in eighth position uh, for the moment. But uh, it's single file, and that's to be expected, I guess, here at Road Atlanta. Overtaking opportunities are few and far between, but then again, even if only one a lap, they come up fairly frequently as far as time is concerned. Yeah, uh, speaking of time, 41 minutes left to go in this race. So still very, very early doors. Uh, we've seen, of course, we well, we expect the Indy cars to be coming in to the pit lane, whether that's for tyres, for fuel, that may be a bit of both. All depends on the strate uh, strategical decisions of the drivers uh, as to what they want to do. And I think at Road Atlanta, more so than maybe anywhere, I mean, Phillip Island as well had quite a big sort of uh, strategical uh, precedent, uh, but also here as well when it comes to track position. Overtaking, as you say, is going to be very difficult. So make that time up in the pit lane. So he is. This is uh, the run to the front straight for Brian Bardeveld, who still leads ahead of Diogo Pinto and Gustavo Ariel, Jose Soria and Vlad Kimichev at the front of the field. Brian Bardeveld has never won a VCO Infinity race, and that is off the road. Is that Kylie Soda in the uh, Blue Rose team car? Looks blue. <laughs> It's the only reason I can't... No, it's not that car, is it? Uh, that's gone off the road, I'm afraid to say. Uh, we'll find out who that was uh, in due course. Uh, of course, STR Esports looks like to me. Uh, but, so, Alvarez at the wheel of that one. But no such problems for those at the front. Ryan Barnabelt still leads and maybe only taking Diogo Pinto with him actually now. Ariel not quite with it in terms of speed, maybe, of those front two. 
Yeah, it, it seems like Diego Pinto, of course, is just putting the pressure on. And while not sort of physically doing it, not overtaking, not going for a move, they're able to just use their collective pace to pull away from the field, which, of course, is going to be very, very important to isolate themselves and make this a 1v1. Makes everything easier for these two in their particular fight for the lead of the race. Bit further back, though, we've got a fight for 12th. I think Nielsen versus Eero and Tiller going through the final corner, getting very close. The fight from Beach Racing, I think, just able to edge themselves ahead now, side by side. 2-wide, two, two deep towards turn one. And through will go Falcon uh, as well. Griffin Gardner up to the uh, task. And so was Jesse Jones for Falcon up to 15th place. Uh, Andrea Barrilero losing places, I'm afraid to say, but has just stopped the rot there, if you like, it with uh, just under 39 minutes to go. He's stopped there in uh, 16th place and held back race clutch from following on through as well. More defence on the way down towards turn six, although they'll all tuck into line again by the time they get into the turning point. It really puts these Indy cars into perspective coming to a place like Road Atlanta. Such a short circuit, so uh, tight and old school and uh, all of those great things. It really gives you a perspective of how quick they are. That was quickly into the wall, I'm afraid, for Andre Wolf. And the green flag was waving. Bit of a false start, as they're concerned. Share it in the wall. This is over the top of the hill for Bowser's Pallet, who did very well to stop himself from going into the field. It was indeed the Apex teammates who came into contact. Well, that's going to be a story for those two. Yeah, it is. That is not great. And that was a very sizable, sudden stop uh, there for the Academy car. Really, really unfortunate for them. Uh, of course, we've seen how well both teams have done uh, on a number of occasions. Then this, go. I think, is exactly what happens. So it's a look at the inside from Leo Garipoli on the Drago car. Now, does he realise he's got front wing damage? Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't matter. But the teammates make contact. Luca Kita loses his front wing. Leo Garipoli loses his front wing. Wow, oh, that is such an easily avoidable mistake to, to have happened. Of course, if the Academy car just backed off or maybe the, 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 the big team just gave them a bit more space, either way, incredibly uh, misfortunate for the pair of them. And yeah, well, I mean, maybe he didn't know he had damage. Maybe he was going into that corner uh, thinking he had full downforce. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's your teammate. Why would you? Uh, again, more contact. That's what happened to the SDR car and well, Typical Red Lanta stuff, really, just not giving enough space on the inside. Albert Alvarez at the wheel of that one. Now over the line again for the uh, battle just outside the top 10. This is from uh, 12th place on backwards, really. Pike from Beach Racing holding that uh, position for now with uh, Ira Antler. And then you've got uh, pretty much the rest of the group right behind. It's Still a front five for the lead. Ryan Barneveld under a decent amount of pressure here, but he's not caving under it for now. And he's uh, staying ahead pretty well compared to the red line cars who are just behind. But is Diogo Pinto about to make his move? He looks now to the inside on the way towards the chicane as Team Redline search for another win. They've won two in a row uh, as far as things go in 2024. And they're looking for three in a row for the second time in the 2024 edition of this event. It is at the third time indeed they would have won three in a row if they can do it here. Diogo Pinto gets to the lead and that wasn't too difficult in the end. No, no, not at all. Nice, easy move through. Let's see if Barnevel can sort of stay on pace with him then uh, and sort of just use his slipstream, maybe save a bit of fuel uh, and just stay in contention. It does seem that Pinto is the quicker of the two cars. Of course, Barnevel was the one that got that pole position. But Pinto may be settling into this race a little bit better. You can see through the first sector, able to pull a good couple of car lengths uh, and is looking very, very strong indeed. Uh, so let's see, of course, what Pinto can do. Looking for his second IndyCar winner and Redline sick because PS Plus competition are yet to win uh, an IndyCar race. They'd like to, of course, make their first, but Redline are just going to Redline. Yeah, they are. Uh, uh, Diego Pinto would very much like to take his second IndyCar win as well and third overall. As, uh, excuse me, fourth overall. He won a couple of TCR races back when we had that class for the first two VCO Infinities. I'm somewhat disappointed TCR hasn't returned again for this time around, but we've got the MX-5s instead, so it's kind of the trade-off we've gone for, I think, in uh, this edition of the event. And looks like Diogo Pinto is beginning to stretch his legs. He spoke about whether Ryan Bardabell would be able to stay with him or not. Well, on first viewing, it's not looking entirely encouraging for BS Competition. 
No, unfortunately not. I mean, what that gap is now, seven tenths of a second between the pair of them at the 34 and a half minute mark. Not great. Uh, and of course, they're, they're actually falling back into the, 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 the sort of the clutches of Gustavo uh, Ariel, uh, Jose Soraya as well. Vlad Kimichev, I think, in the mix also. That's that sort of a trio that you've got there. Kawanda a little bit backwards, but maybe in contention if things start to go wrong. Unfortunately for Barneveld, the further away Pinto gets, the closer Ariel is going to get. So, of course, I don't think his red line troubles are, are, are quite over. No, exactly. Here comes Ariel down the inside. He's going to break late and go for this. Team Redline looking for places, and that was close. Ariel didn't quite commit fully, and now he will on the exit of the corner, but that could have gone so easily wrong between the two of them. Now he's down the inside and through. Jose Soria going to be helped through as well as Ariel stays to the inside, half in defence, half to assist Soria, and Ryan Barneveld will have to settle for third place here at least, but at least he has hung on to a podium place provisionally. Two seconds, though, the gap to Diogo Pinto as this battle continues and rages now. Let's see what Ariel can do, of course, to maybe either maintain or close that gap to his teammate. Of course, the trouble is he doesn't want to bring the rest uh, of this pack with him. Of course, Ariel, the one that won the first two uh, IndyCar races, both at Daytona and at Phillip Island, would be liking to go for the third, I'm sure. Maybe the opportunity is there for strategy, but uh, nicely done to find his way past. There you can see riding on board with Ryan Barnevelt, who's got a very, very good look at the rear end of Gustavo Ariel. Is he going to go for the counter-attack, though, is the question. He's definitely and he got a good look going into the chicane. It is a battle for second place. Is this just allowing Pinto to get away? Well, yes, I think is the answer. And Barnevel can't find his way through into second for now. Up over the top of the hill and uh, back down again through the final corner. Red line very much looking to defend this one too. To uh, take another one if they can. We've already had uh, some so far today. Now looking for... Uh, another nearly quarter of an hour into the 16th race of the day. Pinto uh, leading by nearly three seconds. Then it's Ariel. And then Ryan Barnabo looking to take that position off him. Jose Soria for United Sim Team 4. For the Grand Committee, who's fifth for Drago Racing. Xander Reed is bringing another group with him, by the way, for Coanda Esports, including his teammate Michael Romanidis. But also in there is Matikaya Soria and Maxime Naz for Blue Rose Team and Ma uh, Maniti Racing. Then we've got Grid and Go Esports in there as well. In 10th position, this could come one big, long group for second position if they're not careful. Exactly that. They have got to be so careful. You can see Ariel weaving around a little bit, not excessively, just trying to sort of negate that slipstream advantage that Ryan Barneveld is going to be feeling. There you can see the United Sim team of Jose Soria looking to the inside of the chicane at turns 10 uh, and uh, 10A, 10B, technically 10, 7, 11, really, uh, as they make their way down the hill towards the final couple of corners. I think Ariel has sort of firm, like firmly put his foot down and has sort of cemented himself in the second place. Let's see, of course, if Barneveld is going to be able to launch an Attack. Don't forget they have got 10 push to passes to use over the duration of the 45 minutes. Maybe that's going to be something that Barneveld thinks to, uh, to to use. But at this stage, it wouldn't necessarily do him any good. Yeah, well, I'm struggling to see really what he can do from this point on. If we're uh, if we're looking at this race now in terms of a race win, anyway, because. Is anybody going to be able to catch Pinto, even if they didn't have any pressure from behind in second position? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Very difficult for, uh, or to imagine at the moment, as weaving around at the moment, Gustavo Area wants to get away. Jose Soria is going to make his life a bit easier as he tries to get through for the United Sim team. Down in towards turn 10A, he's got his nose ahead and he'll have the braking zone and the line at turn in as well so Ryan Bonneville from first to fourth now in the first quarter of now this race yeah, not great at all for him, of course. Starting on pole position, the expectation almost is that you go and win. And sometimes you're not actually happy with anything else. Uh, maybe that's the, the mindset that Barneveld has adopted. Of course, he's racing at this level. So, of course, he's a, he's a driver that is going to want to win above all else. And tumbling down to fourth place, not really having the race pace to match uh, those around him is going to be uh, a little bit awkward. Maybe, though, he's in a bit more of a conservation mode relative to the top three. Maybe he's going to be able to recover on strategy. I think that's a bit of a, a clutch of short straws. The gap at the front, though, maintains at three seconds. Jose Soraya, though, I think could be a good shout for, at the very least, a P2. That United Sim team looking very strong. Looking OK. It's a good start to uh, Infinity, actually, for the United Sim team. Off of the first uh, race, they were sixth place in uh, that opener in the IndyCar. But since then, they've very much struggled. They're 
best finishing position that was outside of the top 20 after that one. So Jose Sawyer looking to improve that as Peter Zuba gets past Griffin Gardner in towards this final chicane here. And that's actually all done before the chicane by the looks of things. So much so that Lasse Iranen wants to follow through as well and does so, battling all up and down this field, especially on that back straight down in towards the chicane. Yeah, it really is that action zone, of course. The very, very long flat up run from turn seven all the way to the braking zone downhill as well. So it sort of spices things up. Uh, you're going with gravity. So you've got to be a little bit more cautious on the brakes, but it does open the door for you to maybe have a bit of a look to the inside. So yeah, looking very, very spicy indeed for the battles that we're sort of getting ourselves used to. Ryan Barneveld, uh, Vlad Kimachev has now been reeled back into contention. Fell off the back of this train ever so slightly, but the Jago racing car now, I think, picking his way back through Xander Reed there as well for Coanda was a good what two and a bit seconds off the front five for the best part of the first quarter of an hour of this race and it's now actually uh, gotten off the back of Kimichev and with how powerful the slipstream can be it's just going with him all the pace that Vlad Kimichev is using to catch up on Dubarnavel Xander Reed is getting well a, a double dosage of that he is but he needs to get a little bit closer before he's getting the full uh, benefit the full works and looks like Vlad Kimichev might well just be struggling to hold pace with the front three as well. It, you say the slipstream is powerful, and it, it is true, but it's not in the same way that slipstream is powerful in the Mazda MX-5, for example, where you can really keep a group together really close and uh, go to the line with that almost, as we've seen already at uh, Phillip Island, for example, uh, even the Algarve, even though uh, Alex Dunn did get away for the win in the end, it was close for almost everybody behind it doesn't keep groups together necessarily it just aids overtaking a little bit it's a different style of racing to some of the other cars we've got in vco infinity this year well i suppose for the mx5s the slipstream adds uh, more speed relative to their top speed of course the mx5 is a lot less powerful understandably than these indy cars so the slipstream is a huge huge help when the engine's a bit lower powered uh, to make the engine do less work so it can have at uh, that higher speed. With the Indy cars, it's more just uh, an assistance rather than sort of uh, a big, big help like you see with the MX-5s. Uh, but yeah, as we say, it's more overtaking tool as opposed to the glue that keeps all of these fields together. Uh, we are approaching half distance in this race, and at the moment, it seems that Redline are fairly untouchable. Maybe for another one, too. What would this be, the third of the, of the yeah, event? Not, I've, not, I've not been keeping track of one, too, so uh, you can work that out between yourselves. <laughs> They did Daytona, at the least that, well, probably looking, I think they got one and two at Phillip High, I'm not sure, I, I, but it's it's another one too if they're able to keep this way. Yeah, that certainly happened uh, before. It will be their fourth if they manage it. Uh, hopefully that's easily readable because of the uh, <laughs> point screen. 11 points the margin at the moment, as it would be, as looks like the 69 team would take their third win in a row and that will be a record for them and maybe a fourth win in a row for Redline overall. Uh, excuse me, a third, I'm getting ahead of myself. A third win for Redline overall as well. They've done three in a row on two previous occasions, and they've had a, an extra one added in there, so this will be their 10th win of, of the day uh, if they were to be able to continue on from here. And just to put it into perspective, how dominant they've been in VTO Infinity in the years that we've been doing it here, as we well, I'll get back to that, side by side briefly between United Sim Team and BS competition. Uh, nope, they'll stay single file. Just quickly, Team Redline have got 22 wins. We've seen 17 teams take wins. That's how astonishing it's been. The nearest to them, Coanda, with eight wins. That puts it into context just how good Redline have been at this discipline. Nearly triple. Uh, well, if they win the next two, it will be triple. And they'll effectively have won their own Infinity event. Uh, in terms of pure wins, so taking at the you know at the very least a, a third of uh, all Infinity races, if they're able to get to 24, which with still you know eight races to go, would put it past them to, to get uh, may above that, maybe even beyond. But we have seen a lot of first-time winners over the course of this race. So it's not been all sort of doom and gloom with Redline running away, albeit. A number of those first-time winners were redline drivers at the start of the, uh, of the event, but that's fine. Uh, Minisi Racing moved their way past Kawanda up in to sixth place. So Maxim Naz looking to maybe get himself onto the back of this fight for the top five. I have to say, Miniti, really, really strong here at Red Lantern, actually. Yeah, it's maybe kick-started their day, actually, getting that top ten at Monza, and here they are again. Meanwhile, Jose Sawyer to the outside of Gustavo Ariel, and that was aggressive from Ariel, but fair. He gave the room on the outside line there, but no more than he needed to. Jose Sawyer wasn't able to get through as a result, but here he comes again down the hill. There's going to be no space down here. 
No, absolutely not. You'd be uh, crazy to go for a move, particularly at this stage in the race through the S's. It's all about maximizing your run. This will be interesting into the double right-hander at six and seven, maximizing your run on the exit. Michael Romanidis versus Matty uh, Cardassero as well in that fight for eighth place, but getting very, very close here. Look to the inside from Jose Soria, Ryan Barneveld as well with a supreme run towards the chicane. Where did he go though here, Ryan Barneveld? He'll go to the inside pretty wide down the back straight at Road Atlanta as Black Kimitev doesn't know where to go. Jose Soria in the middle, Gustavo Aero with the inside, but Ryan Barneveld on the outside line. It's Ariel who breaks the latest and hangs on, and in fact they all retain the same places they went into the game with. Yeah, remarkably, somehow they managed to do that. But great defense from Ariel. Now, of course, Sarai, the fight's not done yet. He's going to be looking to go to the outside of turn one. Not quite uh, on this occasion. Trying to try and go for the up and under. But even then, the run runs out before you get to the next corner. So Ariel, able to uh, hold firm, was back in the single file as they run their way through the S's. Maxime Naz has very much joined up the groups now, and he's here with Xander Reed, Michael Romanidis, Mankar Soria, and Tommy Catilla for Grid and Go as well. It's a big group now in this fight for second place, all behind Diogo Pinto, of course, as we approach the halfway mark of this race. A red line 1 2, uh, but they look like they could be denied their fourth of the day so far because it, Jose Soria is looking good here. Weaving around again from Gustavo Aero. Going to have to be careful uh, with that, especially if he wants the inside line at the chicane. And Soria, it wants it too. He'll look to the inside, but can't quite do it. Gustavo Aero defends firmly, and he will retain second place again here, as he has done for quite some time now in this race. Yeah, we're just under 23 minutes left to go in this race. We are approaching, of course, that half distance and the pit stop. So maybe this is a charge from Soraya to get that track position before the pit stop phase. Looking to the outside once again, but another lap and another failed attempt. I think it's more just trying to put the pressure on Ariel and not let him be too comfortable. And Sander Reid into the pit lane for Coanda. Doesn't want any part of this anymore. And so pit stops happening already. I'll let you know what the pit stop time is down there for Sander Reid when he does stop. Uh, he's now pulled into his box along with Dominic Olivier, at Chief of uh, Precision Racing Esports, although he's a lot further back in the field. It looks uh, like it's a regular length stop of 11.4 for Xander Reed, who uh, dropped back. Michael Romanidis only did a 9.7 second stop, and he's already been in, so uh, missed that a couple of laps ago, but he is already in and trying to do the undercut on these guys and trying to benefit from all this fighting going on for second place. Yeah, it really can help, uh, of course, with, with how much these guys are slowing themselves down. If you are able to get that undercut, get that track position, you are going to be looking very, very strong. The problem with that is, of course, if you change tyres, as into the pit lane comes second place, of course, Gustavo Ariel, Soraya uh, in as well. I think Pinto's continued on, but the vast majority of this field, Kimichev, Naz, uh, Kardasoa, uh, Katala, Antilla, all in, Jesse Jones as well for Falcon. So it seems that this lap is the one that everyone wants to be on, responding maybe to Koanda. Yeah, it's going to have to be, I suppose. They did notably stop fighting as well, which has uh, really helped in terms of uh, keeping the speed up, which is uh, really necessary in this stage of the race. Now, that's one of the lap cars going out, but who will be first out as far as the leaders are concerned? There goes the red line car first, and they will retain second place, followed by United Sim Team. Uh, Maniti got ahead of Drago Racing there. Where are the Coanda guys over the line? It will be a, a gain there for Michael Romanidis, who's pitched up at 9.7 seconds with a good one. That is all over the road for, uh, is it Redline who have gone off? It was Ariel, and now Romanidis is off the road. Here goes Soria up on the curbs and through, and there's Bodywork got off to the side as well from Coanda. Goodness me, it's all kicked off as they leave the pit line. I think that overlap with those that have and haven't pitted. Of course, Coanda now stuck behind the Maniti racing car. So nicely done, it must be said, for Max and Naz. But absolute drama as, yeah, their front right bit of the front wing is completely gone side by side. The other Coanda car versus Drago racing. Uh, of course, just in behind Xander Ree versus Vlad Kimachev. They all want to be the one to take advantage of the craziness. Uh, and now into the pit lane. It's a race against time as Pinto's into the box. Oh, big side-to-side -side contact for Xander Reed uh, and Vlad Kimachev in the Drago racing car has really lost out in the pit stop phase. He goes for the up and under and will be on the inside at the final turn. And he will get through as well, making sure he slams the door in the face of Reed, who will only go back to the outside all over again here. And Kimachev's lost his front wing as well here. Half of it anyway. Now, has that happened in the last couple of moments? Well, we were watching him all beforehand, but there's a couple of drivers now at the front missing front wings. This is Gustavo Ariel, who just got it wrong up on the grass. 
But then Romanidis tried to come through on him, and then it all happened behind. Quick hands, it must be said, from Ariel there. That was a very, very good catch. Could have been a lot, lot worse. You run the risk of overcorrecting and snapping into the barrier, but he was actually able to keep it under control. This is what happened. Of course, Michael Romanidis, I think, just reacting to that, cutting over the grass, rejoining. Didn't really have much choice to rejoin anywhere else, but at the end of the day, it was his mistake, uh, of course, on the back of Soraya, and then uh, losing his front wing as a result. An unfortunate mistake as Blue Race team goes side by side with Jago Racing. Uh, it could be three wide even here. There's a couple of the damaged cars struggle side by side as Kai Soja to the outside of Xander Reed and both struggle off the corner here and that Kimitev is going to have almost nowhere to go but going into the final corner now through they go and Kai Soja will be through into turn one you would have thought with the inside line around the outside for Reed and he can't work that one through so that's sixth place for the Blue Rose team but further up ahead the battle has changed. Ryan Bonneveld is up to second place at least. No one looks like they're going to be able to get near Diogo Pinto in this 16th race of the day, but they may be able to uh, battle for second place. In fact, maybe not anymore because Gustavo Area has been held up a little bit. Now he'll try and hang on to third ahead of Maxime Naz of Maniti Racing. Yeah, a little bit scrappy, I think, uh, uh, coming out of the pit lane for Gustavo Ariel. Maybe a little bit sort of knocked in his confidence after that mistake through the S's. What it's going to do is allow Maxime Nas to close that gap. Michael Romanidis as well at the rear end of this train. Pulls out to the left, of course, the green of Miniti. will be the inside line for the chicane. What can Ariel do in defence? Does he want to? No, that was a firm back out of that one. Not entirely sure as to why he's not being sort of aggressive. I'm, to be fair, I'm not entirely sure as to why he's so slow out of the pit lane. I'm not really sure either. But Maxime Naz won't care. He's up on the podium places now uh, for the first time as far as his uh, team are concerned. The Coanda cars now reverse places. So Xander Reed back ahead of Michael Romanidis, who seems to be really struggling with half a front wing, and you can uh, understand why. The same is probably true for Black Kimichev, who's now down to 10th place, now losing positions in the field. And so it's uh, all changed back there. In that group, uh, in the midfield, it's been such fantastic racing. No longer is the battle for second place, unfortunately, but uh, they are still battles inside the top ten, and it's still great to watch. It really is, uh, and sort of what we've become accustomed to over the course of uh, VCO Infinity. Uh, uh, of course, we'd just like to know that both Williams cars, of course, both the Academy and the, the, the big team, the number five, uh, are out of this race, which is, of course, unfortunate for them. Both cars starting on the back foot uh, coming into this one with, with poor qualifying and unfortunately not able to recover uh, over the course of the 45 minutes. Unfortunate to see, of course, but Williams had an up and down race. Of course, they were the first to take the win away from Redline and now, of course, are on the back foot side by side here, though Grid and Go number two make it a 7 8 for the team. Oh dear, Gr Drago Racing going wide there. Black Kimito will be under pressure from Miro Antler if he's not careful. But yeah, Grid and Go having a decent race now with two of their cars inside the top 10. Tony Cantler and Lasse Urainen currently 7th and 8th. Jesse Jones looking for a uh, position on Michael Romanidis here and this is going to be the story of uh, the rest of the race here the final 15 minutes for Kimitev and Romanidis is just going to be how many positions can I prevent myself from losing pretty much that's that, that's all they can do they don't want to come into the pit lane the trade-off uh, is going to be significantly more of course they do get a fast repair uh, but they don't want to take the penalty of coming into the pit box in order to, to, to sort of get their damage fixed with 15 minutes left to go in the race it's not worth it they're better off just hunkering down and doing their best uh, of course to stay safe on the racetrack but also just to maintain position uh, as best as they can side by side I think momentarily or at least thinking about it just in behind Michael Romanidis though just about within inside the top 10 and the important thing is, I think, he's ahead of Vlad Kimichev, uh, which gives him, a, at the very least, a one-car buffer for any quicker cars trying to find their way past. Uh, here we go. Romanidis, middle of the road, but Kimichev looking for a way through. Now, what do they do with each other here? The two damaged cars. Well, they're getting in the way of Antler now, and here goes Peter Zou, but up the inside for Race Clutch. Can't do it, but uh, how are they going to resolve this? Uh, Ira Antler does get through into 11th place. Vlad Kimichev down to 12, then it's Petr Zuba, Magnus Nielsen and some lap traffic I reckon involved here as well because that's not Griffin Gardner of course up with these guys quite yet. So the length of Road Atlanta also playing a role in this one in that there's a lot of traffic about, a lot of cars in a short space of time here. Yeah, uh, out on track at the moment we've still got I believe 
42 at the very 42 there are 48 still going or no 45 still going 42 i think out on circuit so it is very very busy indeed here's another look uh, of course antilla versus michael romanidis going in to the chicane peter zuber and black kimichev as well so both of our damage contingents uh, tumbling down at least a position on this lap 14 and a half minutes left to go of course meaning that well there is still a decent chunk of laps left to go in this race and still plenty of positions uh, for these guys to lose there is michael romanidis in the 11th position just behind uh, Eric Antler and he, this is a great example isn't it and a great illustration of just how much downforce having half your front wing off costs you I mean it seems obvious to say he'll be chewing through his front tyres as well at the present moment but look at that the first sector so dependent on that downforce that aero that uh, you need at high speed and Michael Romanidis has very little of it now uh, yes, uh, uh, of course, the IndyCar's very, very high downforce machine. Not quite to the same extent as, uh, of course, of like Formula Run or anything like that, but they still have a, a huge aerodynamic precedence that they need, and doing that is just going to burn through the front tyres, but it's more focus on the mechanical grip. Race Clutch now going to fancy their chances, finding their way past Kawanda and into P11. Shouldn't be too difficult as well in the background. It might be one of the Eclipse guys trying to move their way past Mavano of course, in the fight for 15th place, but, yeah, it's a huge, huge loss. All he can do is sit there, hope and pray that no one can find a gap because it's not exactly like he can put up too big of a, of a defence. Oh dear, someone's in the wall back there. Was that a lap car on the front straight? Someone running down the pit wall uh, just behind this battle for what is now... Uh, where are we? 12th place for Michael Romanidis. Then Vlad Kimichev in 30th with the ATRS car just behind. Then the car just behind them, a lap car. I think that's the Apex Racing Team, actually, who are just trailing them and we're on the pit lane for quite a while were Apex Luca Kita looking for positions and he might get another couple if he continues on in this race but it's looking pretty disastrous now for them as far as uh, championship aspirations go they're going to lose their fourth place in the standings as things stand to Drago Racing despite the damage that they've got so far in this race here we go into the final chicane for Kimichev as he tries to get through on Romanidis are these two damaged cars going to battle side by side into the chicane not quite Romanidis will hang on to 12. They definitely thought about it as this is what's happened uh, coming off I think this is why we saw that car in the barrier of course it was both of them spearing off in the end Kovanov goes to the right I believe the United Center going to the left as well so yeah a big incident arguably incredibly avoidable but well that's what you get for crashing on the pitch straight. They don't anticipate you to crash Ooh. on a straight line, so they don't exactly have uh, very nice cushions. That is an unhealthy car that uh, spins into the grass, and that will be a pit stop required for them, and I don't think they've actually re-emerged from that. That's one of those positions that Luca Kita might be able to salvage if he continues for the next 11 and a half minutes. Well, it looks like Diogo Pinto is going to take another race win here as Team Redline search for their third in a row. This has happened on two occasions before in 2024 as we look at Jose Soria. Now, this was a fantastic running car earlier on. Things have gone from bad to worse back here, and that's a front left tyre completely toast. Yeah, of course, with the, with the front suspension the way it is, as soon as it snaps, it is gone. Side by side here as well. You've got Nielsen on the inside of Kimichev oh. looking. Goodness me, for Reminidis as well. Getting a little bit greedy and it might well cost him here because Kimichev gets the up and under despite the fact he's got half a front wing to the inside of the final corner. He gives it a go. He finds his way back through. Of course, naturally running wide. Thomas Cope as well, trying to pick his way through. Not sure uh, he really meant to do that, to be honest. Magnus Nielsen, and in the end, backs out and doesn't take any places at the final chicane. This is the battle with Thomas Cope getting through on Andrea Barrelero further behind. They're trying to catch up to those damaged cars and if they sort themselves out, these three, they might be able to get there, but they won't if they keep fighting like that. Yeah, uh, precisely. Uh, and the more aggressive they are, uh, of course, the more time they're going to lose. Only ten and a half minutes left to go. So time firmly of the essence, as it always is in Infinity. You've got to be on it lap after lap after lap. You cannot afford to get complacent. And in doing so, yeah, they've cost themselves, what, three and a half seconds at least from Romanidis to Peter Zuber. Of course, the race clutch car in 11th and kind of still a part of that uh, decision for the top 10. They could well be there, uh, but unfortunately, the, the, the damaged cars of Drago and Kawanda putting up a, a harder fight, to be fair, than I expected. They're actually oh. doing a decent job at defending. That again, back for 15th place. Thomas Cope has gone from first to last in the group. Griffin Gardner now leading. Well, Thomas Cope's back to second in the group. It's all going on. 
as Luka Keita is getting involved now with these guys. I don't think uh, Magnus Nielsen would be particularly pleased about this. I think Keita wants to get out from being behind these damaged cars, but it's always a difficult prospect overtaking people your laps down from. I understand that Keita may be quicker than those ahead, but it's always a risk to take when you're so many laps down. Luka Keita still running down in 46th place, now nine laps off the lead. Yeah, that is uh, a, a good few laps, and I don't think that's quite down to uh, Diego Pinto and his staggering pace. Unfortunate race, of course, for Apex uh, with their uh, crash, of course, with the assist team. The academy came a little bit earlier on, uh, and in doing so, have crossed themselves. But out on track, trying to maximise their points, because, yeah, you still get points uh, for basically where you DNF from. You just get bumped down to the bottom of, uh, of the finishes as such. So you still do get the points, but if you're out on track, anyone else that DNFs, you overtake them uh, and get some extra points. So I think that's what Keita is sort of vying for, is to stay out, see if anyone else DNFs, so they can try and just about uh, scrape a couple extra points. Diego Pinto though, seems untouchable at the top, uh, with Ryan Barnabal there in second place. Miniti Racing on the podium as well, doing a sensational race, it must be said, with eight and a half minutes to go. Yeah, it would be there first. Uh, yeah, I've got no problem with Luca Keita driving around to try and get those points, as you say, but uh, what's more of a problem is in getting involved in this battle and potentially preventing ATRS from having a couple of goes at Coanda and Draga racing now. And if those, if that group led by Eclipse further behind catches up, then what's he going to do with them? You know, is he going to stay in the way of this battle now? Because he's had a lap or so behind Drago and Coanda and he's struggling to work his way through now. Yeah, he is. Um, I mean, if you've got the pace as a lap car, you can, you know, firmly, absolutely uh, unlap yourself and carry on with things. And it seems that Kita has got that. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's just tough. I, I mean, if I was sort of Kimichev or, or Romanidis, surely it makes sense to allow him through just to give yourself a bit more breathing space and, uh, and not be hammered uh, in terms of the pressure. Bit of a look there from Eclipse to the inside of ATRS as well, the fight for 14. Uh, but maybe uh, these two want the that car is uh, again that wall that buffer back to the rest of the pack so they're less likely to be overtaken themselves either way when it comes to traffic it is always a bit frustrating eclipse to the inside of t1 yeah and they will be 14th atrs and magnus Nielsen pushed back a position and then thomas cope will try and follow suit but can't quite do that on the run up the hill there down towards the S as they go, and they remain single file. It seems that uh, Drago and Coranda have almost figured out how to defend with their lack of front downfalls because they've stopped bleeding positions, as was almost a, an occurrence every lap at one stage. Yeah, they're settled into it, maybe just getting used to how they have to drive the car, maybe a bit earlier on the turn and just to get it to bite a bit sooner or, or whatever it is, maximising their exits. They're not doing a bad job at all, considering uh, they are losing half of their front down force. So sensational stuff uh, from the two damage contingents. Of course, hopefully this, this defence could have come a little bit sooner for them, but either way, they're looking fine. Olympus uh, versus ATRS as well. Thomas Cope picks his way back into the top 15, albeit with very argy bargy stuff. Nirvana, of course, so I think getting involved momentarily, trying to pick their way through into 16th and into the pit lane it was that the apex car coming back yeah in? it was yeah look Keita just getting out the way then in that case as he's made up all he can i think from this race everybody ahead of him is still running and so he's going to struggle to make up any more places with the minutes we have remaining in the field because even if someone goes off ahead of him he won't have enough laps to catch up to them he may well call it a day for this race then and get himself ready for his next one which will be coming up later on i imagine we'll have another one later on maybe he'll be doing the next indycar race at uh, the uh, latter point in this oh in fact this is the last indycar race is it we're at no. four no we, yeah no we this we is the four. four we had to turn yeah. philip islands yeah port Mau, and then uh, of course we atlanta of course you don't third one sorry no, forgot, no, about, no. Uh, forgot about daytona in town it's very long time again now yeah, and uh, this is the uh, this is the fourth one excuse me so no more indycar racing after this one but still plenty more coming your way eight la eight more races uh, after this in vco infinity as lasse urine and gets through into the top five for grid and go uh, a real good mix of teams let's see up towards the front some teams you maybe wouldn't expect to see that in indycar racing but then again how many of these teams do we see indycar racing very often it's certainly not the top level of indycar racing we see on IndyCar Open Series night on Racebot TV, for example, on a Monday night, we do the top splits uh, of IndyCar racing for the first race of every iRacing week. And uh, these are not the teams typically represented. It's a bit of a learning curve for all of them. 
I think that's the entire point, uh, I suppose, of Infinity. Not to the to that full extent. Uh, otherwise, they just throw them into every random car there is and say, have at it. Uh, but it definitely is that adjustment and maximizing your adaptability, getting drivers that aren't overly used to it. As a look to the inside there from Carlos Zoro on Eurison going into the chicane. Of course, the Gridenco car able to hang on. Then comes the Kawanda of Xander Reed getting a nice up and under. Not quite going to go through hard into the final corner, thankfully. Uh, of course, the Vulcan car, Jesse Jones as well, picking their way through with four and a half minutes to go. Not long now until this race is complete for Lasse Urainen and he'll be hoping that this uh, end of the race comes sooner than it is at the moment. He's got four queuing up behind him. One of them is his teammates, but there's not a lot that Tommy Cattler can actually do here to get involved with the three in front of him and try and help his teammate Lasse Urainen very much on his own in this battle for fifth position, trying to hang on ahead of Coanda who would very much like to uh, make up those points as well as everybody else who is uh, stuck behind currently. The uh, advantage being, I suppose, for, for those guys is that there is not so long to go and so those that may catch on from behind will not have very long if they even get there at all. Plankton Beach Racing leading the charge there as they work their way down the back straight now towards the braking zone. It's defence again for Urinen as around the outside goes Xander Reed and that will give him the inside for 10B. He shoves Urinen wide and that's going to leave them side by side here and maybe Jesse Jones looking for a position here too for Falcon. Nicely done, of course, from Xander Reed. Let's see what Falcon can do, though, to the inside of turn one. Beautifully done. Textbook, easy as you'd like. So an unfortunate uh, run there from Urinen uh, to fall back two places in the span of two corners. However, still in with a shout. Of course, we've got, I believe, two to go at the line. It'll be very, very close. Of course, we'll have to wait and see. Riding on board, of course, with uh, Jesse Jones looking uh, forwards. Uh, or no, in fact, actually, with uh, with the Gridden Go car looking forwards at both the Falcon car and the Kawana machine just ahead. Uh, but nicely done, of course, from Jones, just to pick their way past, waited for uh, Kawanda, of course, Anna Reed to find his way past, and then took the opportunity when uh, the Green Go car was vulnerable. Here we go, Lasse Uranen looking to respond now with the cars in front of him rather than him being the one on the defensive. Jesse Jones right in front in the Falcon car. Then Sander Reed in the Kawanda car. Are they going to figure it out three wide here? Not quite. It's, oh, outside for Uranen. A double overtake. Fantastic from Lasse Uranen. And Sander Reed is the one who goes two positions further back. And that is the top and tail, of course, of this race. It's constantly changing back, of course, into that fifth place now. Let's see what Jesse Jones can do. Goanda uh, assuming uh, that seventh place. So dropping back a little bit, just trying to settle their way back in, regain that momentum and get back at them. But sensational stuff. It just goes to show that you should not give up at all. They drop back two places and they're back to the lead of this train. Through the first sector they go, Xander Reed looking to act in his response as a bit of the dirt kicked up on the exit of turn five. Lasse Urinen leads the group. Then it's Jesse Jones for Falcon. Xander Reed for Coanda. Tommy Cattler for Good and Go. Matty Kaya Soda for Blue Rose Team. Pike from Beach Racing are here now too with Ero Antela and Race Clutch with Petter Zuba also here. This has been going on further back. Andrea Barrelero from Ivana, I'm afraid, has been uh, involved in a terrible accident through turn one as a car is sent barrel rolling through the air. Meanwhile, into the final corners they go. I reckon we could have two to go here, actually. It's going to be very close, but yeah, I think it's two to go for everybody and a couple more chances for those guys to get up into a top five position. Exactly that. Couple more laps, couple more opportunities potentially for them to find their way through this entire train that we've got actually uh, incredibly close. I think we momentarily saw Antilla go for the move on Kaida Zoa just in the background there. You can see the slightly darkened uh, colour, the Indy car at the, at the back end of this train, second last in it. Peter Zuba for race clutch, looking for a top 10. I don't think race clutch have had many of them over the course of this event. So looking, of course, for their first. The opportunity could well be there, particularly uh, with one more lap to go after this one. But it seems that uh, Urinen is actually settling in quite well to that fifth place. Uh, and of course, Sander Reed wants in that fifth place, drop back to seventh, losing a bit of momentum. Yeah, not an ideal time to be losing momentum either as they look for position, look for any opportunity down the inside. And it's Grid and Go who found one. Tommy Cattler down the inside of Sander Reed into the final chicane here. Reed uh, 
around the outside through the first part, inside of the second, and they'll remain locked together. This is going to allow the front two to battle for fifth place, but the rest of them for seventh. Here goes Mati Karasoya here for that position as they get the white flag. One lap to go. Zander Reed is up to seventh. Yeah, nicely, start, uh, nicely done. Carlos Sova finding his way past Tommy Cattler. They're going to run side by side towards the S's. The first grid and go car, though, uh, backs out of that one uh, smartly so, I think. Then, of course, comes Antillo side by side through the final part of the S's. That puts them on the back foot. That allows Peter Zuba to close the gap. And as that knock on effect, uh, of course, chain, uh, cause and effect that happens. You go wide, you slow down, and then, of course, everyone else bunches up behind you. Jesse Jones, though, is through into fifth. Oh, here goes th that response, though. Down the inside for Lasse Urinen as they try and fight for fifth position at the end. Meanwhile, Diogo Pinto is going to win in an IndyCar again for the second time here in VCO Infinity. He becomes only the second driver to win four races in VCO Infinity history, along with Patrick Holtzman. Only Josh Rogers has more. What's the battle for fifth place going to say, though, as Jesse Jones tries to hang on ahead of Lasse Urinen, and he has done through into the top five for Falcon Sim Racing Team. And by the way, what a story for Maniti Racing, their first podium of the day here in race 16. Yeah, remarkable uh, stuff from Aniti. They drove that race so, so well. We've got fights going on, of course, all the way back down. Uh, Oscar Mangan for Altus Eastrup trying to pick his way through uh, into P23. It's all uh, nip and tuck at the back end of the field. And of course, well, actually, the mid pack of the field this is for 23rd with how abundant the field is side by side uh, between a couple of cars going into the final couple of corners to round off the slap. But what a race it's been. What a race once again for Redline. Side by side over the line here for uh, Alters and Visceral, I think this is. That was uh, very close between them indeed. A few more uh, body parts missing back here as uh, they go over the line. Half a front wing for somebody. Uh, as O Apex did get themselves back at. Oh no, that's the Academy car, excuse me, from a distance. <laughs> they look identical. There you go. Uh, that's the end of race 16, though, here in VCO Infinity for 2024. And it's Team Redline who win again. They're 23rd in VCO Infinity history. They're sixth in an Indy car in this uh, series of events. And Diogo Pinto's fourth in its history. He wins by 6.4 seconds ahead of Ryan Barnevold, who was on pole at the end, but did recover well because he went through a difficult period in that race. Benici Racing's first podium is a third place finish. Eddie Gustavo Aero and the other team Redline car who see their lead slashed now to single figures. It is Jesse Jones who got up into fifth place there. Had to last year, Ryan and Xander Reed held on to seventh ahead of Matty Kaya Tommy Catala and Iro Antela rounding out the top 10. In 11th position, it is Race Clutch and Peter Zuba. Thomas Cope got up to 12th for Olympus. In at the 13th position, it was Coander Esports' second car. Michael Romanidis hanging on well with half a front wing. Mal Deninka for Parnell Racing got up to 14th ahead of Dominic Olivier for Precision. ATRS also overtook Black Kimichev, who started to bleed positions at the end there. He would finish 12th. Waymitley Racing Team finished uh, 18th ahead. Did I say 12th? 17th, I mean. Uh, 18th for Wave Italy Racing Team had a Wasking Racing Adventures and Project Valorous to round up the top 20. It was Mavano Corsa next in a real big group coming over the line. WSR Esports, Book Kicker, Ultra C Esports, Visceral, we saw have that photo finished over the line as well as West Competition Racing and Altitude Esports. Those were the last drivers inside the uh, minute mark. Uh, CRZ Simsport were 27th ahead of Apex Racing Academy, BS Competition and Sheriff's Esport who uh, were the last drivers on the lead lap. Then those that were one down, Telestrat Automotive leading the line with uh, SOP Esports Racing in 32nd. Uh, Obsidian Racing, uh, the two-time BTO Infinity race winners, finished 33rd ahead of Rincon Racing. It's going to speed uh, with Bite by by uh, Pitskavissa finished 35th. Rocket Simsport were 36th, but the United Sim Team and Jose Sorio would be disappointed with 17th after running in the top five for so long in that race. German Sim Racing and Morinus were the last drivers one lap down. Impulse Racing, the first of those two down. In 41st, uh, it was Eclipse Mot at Simsports, two down, with Kramer Racing Esports at three down. DLR five down ahead of 
Apex Racing Team, the last team to finish the race. Nine laps down in the end. Then those who didn't see the checkered flag, XPD uh, Racing and SMP Racing Esports, who were both 16 down. STR Esports finished 47th ahead of James Armstrong and Bradham Esports. Williams Esports Academy were 49th ahead of Fordzilla in 20, uh, 25 laps down in 50th place. Then it was Absolute Motorsport Asselif, W2E Pro GP, uh, Lorenzo Bonder again, not finishing. Uh, Semi Ward and Carl Janssen to round out those who were uh, in the race here for number 16. So that's it as far as IndyCar racing is concerned here, Zach. A runaway victory for Diogo Pinto, but it's time for a bit of a change of pace, if you like. MX5's at Monza coming up next. Yeah, going to be very interesting. Of course, we touched on the MX-5s over the course of Road Atlanta with how crucial that slipstream is at keeping that pack together. We're going to see that, well, in bucket loads when we head to Monza with them. Of course, the Temple of Speed should be a very, very strong race. Looking forward to it. Of course, the MX-5 races that we have had so far. Of course, the first one at Phillip Island, uh, the one I did last night, of course, at Portimao. Both very, very strong races, as is expected with the MX-5. It's a great little car. Such a fantastic car, so make sure you stay with us. We'll be switching over YouTube stream. If you're watching us over there, then uh, just keep your wits about you. If, you, if it, YouTube doesn't chuck you over as it should do, then uh, just make sure you get onto part three of our stream here on the VCO Esports YouTube channel. If you are elsewhere watching us here this morning, then uh, just sit tight and wait for us to come back in a few moments time. We'll be back with race 17. It's MX5s at Monza coming up after this.